or at least get the There's people that have lit on it. Have you got another copper? I probably got it in there. There's so much. Here, here's a lot. We're getting copies for everybody, but this is the most. I kind of forget that. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, 
this with you the other day because I think you will be the first one to find out But then when I saw it, then, then when I saw it, she was doing an article in the Wall Street Journal calling for a temporary permanent payroll tax for anybody that, anybody that employs a U.S. worker who's been unemployed for more than 60 days. Have you heard about that? Well, well, I mean, I don't know how willing we are to consider changing that bill a little bit, but rather than, rather than having the money, we don't want to get any of the other things we like, so even the small business owners, what I'm trying to say is that we see that money go, go directly to small businesses, and sometimes we don't have to have that because, because if you couldn't do any bureaucracy, even the small, even the best bureaucracy, so much of it's just going to be spent by that bureaucracy. But if you could get a little way to, let's say you give a cut to any, uh, any business or any small business that, that shows it's an employed, uh, an, an American worker, then I think, then I think, uh, then I think, I don't know, I think it'd be better. more of it would actually go to the small businesses if you did it that way. The way you're doing now, some of them will go to small business. But not being a, you know, 
conservative, uh, uh, I, I believe that the bureaucracy just so much, they gobble up so much of it. Well, I mean, if you could, it, okay. Committee will come to order. Committee will come to order. Good morning. On September the 16th, 2008, the Wall Street giant AIG faced immediate bankruptcy. AIG was saved from collapse when the American people came to the rescue with, a, with an $85 billion bailout. Less than two months later, the American taxpayer was again forced to pay the bill when the Federal Reserve directed AIG to hand out billions of dollars to counterparties that included the biggest names on Wall Street. In effect, the taxpayers were propping up the hollow shells of AIG by stuffing it with money. And the rest of Wall Street came by and looted the corpse. The circumstances surrounding the payments to the counterparties has created an air of suspicion and distrust among the American people, starting with the New York Fed's initial refusal to name the counterparties. The New York Fed argued that disclosing these counterparties would somehow injure AIG. In fact, when the information was finally released under pressure from Congress, nothing happened. It had absolutely no effect on AIG's business or financial condition, but it did have an effect on the credibility of the Federal Reserve, and it called into question the Fed's penchant for secrecy. We need to change the culture on Wall Street and the culture among the regulators from the secrecy of transparency, recognizing that only true, confidential, competitive, or consumer information should be protected. As we sit here a year and a half later, after AIG handed out billions in taxpayers' dollars because of this secrecy, we still don't know why or how the decision to rescue AIG was made, or who made the decision to offer AIG's trading partners 100 cents on the dollar in the so-called counterparty payments. Every day in the business world, when a company is having financial problems, its creditors have to take less money than they are owed. Otherwise, they risk not getting any money at all. They, they call this a haircut. In the case of AIG, nobody got a haircut. Instead, they were given a piggy bank full of taxpayers' dollars and said, help yourself. Let me just say plainly that I think just about every American would say the government should have forced AIG's counterparties to take 
less money. Evidently, major decisions were made by a combination of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and the Bush Treasury Department. Today, we will hear from witnesses who were involved in making these decisions, and we hope they can shed light on a murky set of facts. Under subpoena, the committee obtained more than 250,000 pages of documents from the New York Fed detailing its handling of the AIG counterparties. Particularly disturbing is the fact that these emails indicate that AIG proposed to disclose to the SEC and the public the names of the counterparties and the payments, but it was the New York Feds that directed AIG to withhold this information. As one New York Fed staffer put it, any public disclosure by AIG is still subject to Fed approval. At least two things are clear here. The entire financial regulatory system was broken, and there sh shouldn't be any more bailouts. The lack of transparency we have seen in the double bailout of AIG leads to distrust, which leads to anger. The question that looms over all of this, how do we prevent a repeat of the financial crisis in the future? Unless the Congress adopt genuine financial services reform, it will be only a matter of time before we see another AIG another Bear Stearns, another Lehman Brothers, and the next big bank will be too big to fail. And the taxpayers will wind up footing the bill again and again and again. I ask my Republican colleagues on this committee to join with me in fixing the system. Blame is about yesterday. Fixing the system is about today and the future. In the AIG case, we can talk all we want to about complicated business deals, but this all boils down to a simple concept. When average people were losing their homes and jobs, the same big banks that caused the problems got every dollar back courtesy of the American taxpayer. And the Federal Reserve tried to keep important information a secret. Secrecy leads to distrust, and the American people now distrust what happened in these bailouts. Congress has the right to know how and why that happened, and the American people have the right to know how and why that happened. I hope that today we can get answers to these and other important questions. I now yield to our ranking member, the gentleman from California, Congressman Darrell Issa, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you have our promise that this has been and will continue to be a bipartisan oversight of these and all the issues related to the Fed's current and future authority. Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask unanimous consent pursuant to our rules that uh, Spencer Bacchus, the ranking member on Financial Services Committee, Kevin Brady of Texas, the ranking House Republican on the Joint Economic Committee, Roy Blunt, the former Majority Whip, Ron Paul, whose credentials on this are well understood, and Cliff Stearns of Florida be allowed to sit on the dais and should there be time allowed to ask, and que ask questions pursuant to the rules. Without objection. I additionally, I would ask at this time to submit for the record Schedule A, which is, in fact, the shortfall agreements between Maiden III and AIG Financial Products, since they will be referred to in questioning, and we want to make sure they are officially in the record. Reserving the right to object. Okay. Uh, additionally, Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that the eight letters previously sent to Secretary Geithner and as of today not responded to also be placed in the record at this time, although they will not be reviewed further during this hearing. Reserve the right to object. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for all of this and more. W working together with you on the subpoena documents has caused both the majority and minority to glean considerable new information. In recent weeks, this committee receiving these documents 
have caused us to better understand the New York Fed pressured AIG to abort negotiations designed to obtain a haircut, as it was called, from its counterparties and keep the details of the counterparties payments from appearing on forms, uh, the firm's forms at the SEC. Today, one of the questions we will ask is, should the American people be kept from knowing until 2018 the details of who were the ultimate beneficiaries of this bailout? As I have said before, I consider this a, back, a backdoor bailout. The people giving us testimony today will tell us that they felt that this was essential and necessary. Mr. Chairman, as you can recall, AIG's founder, Hank Greenberg, has previously testified along with AIG CEO Edward Liddy. And in that testimony, Hank Greenberg made it very clear that he believed that one, hedging should have occurred sooner, and two, bankruptcy would have been a cleaner way to resolve a company in which he is the largest stockholder. I'm proud to say after that hearing, AIG has re-engaged their founder to help them maximize the value of a company that is currently 80 percent owned by the American people. Not to say that there's a lot of good news at AIG. Mr. Chairman, it's clear that the money paid and it being kept secret may ultimately cause the American people never to repa be repaid these dollars. Uh, I'll try to, can you hear me okay now? You can't. Okay. Uh, now, okay, I will, I will focus on this microphone this time. Usually the problem is I'm too well heard. Uh, right, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> Generally. <laughs> Today we will have an opportunity to ask questions, and the American people will have the right, and I believe will receive, straightforward answers. So far, Mr. Chairman, this is what we know. We know that some of today's witnesses played a central role in the decision to bail out AIG rather than allow the normal bankruptcy procedures to run their course. We know that one of today's witnesses made the decision to pay AIG counterparties at 100 cents on the dollar. We know that one of today's witnesses was the primary architect of the AIG trust agreement whereby the taxpayer's investment in AIG is managed not in the interest of the U.S. taxpayers, but of the United States Treasury Department. That was from previous testimony, and we rely on that to say perhaps that is not the right answer. We know that the New York Fed sought to cover the counterparty payments made possible by the taxpayer's money. We now better understand that the New York Fed transferred their earlier responsibility to the American people after TARP was passed. We know that the New York Fed succeeding in getting the SEC, succeeded in getting the SEC to continue the cover-up until 2018, 10 years from the date the bailout began. And we know that the full amount paid to AIG's counterparties will likely never be repaid to the American people. Some facts, Mr. Chairman, remain unknown or uncertain. Secretary Geithner has claimed publicly that he, has rec he recused himself from the day-to-day -day management of New York Fed when the cover-up occurred. In fact, he has asserted complete ignorance of the Fed's efforts to cover up the bailout details. Many people, including members of this committee, have a hard time believing that Secretary Geithner entered into an absolute cone of silence for those of us old enough to remember what that was, on the day of his, nomina his nomination was announced. Where was Secretary Geithner for the months and months that backdoor bailouts were being questioned in the media? Did he ever wonder why his decision to pay AIG's counterparty was kept secret for so long? These are the questions the American people deserve. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent the remainder of my opening statement be placed in the record at this time. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, the gentleman from California. Uh, this time, uh, we would like to turn to our first witness, the Treasury, Treasury um, Secretary Geithner. Uh, it is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. So, Mr. Secretary, if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, let the record reflect that he answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Chairman Towns, yeah. Yeah. Ranking Member Issa, 
members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I welcome the committee's attention to this issue. And we will continue to work closely with this committee, with all other oversight bodies. Mr. Secretary, pull the mic just a little closer. We're having a little trouble so I'm, I'm almost eating it. I know. How's that, how's that, that sound? It shows you our sound system is not too good around here. We keep budget I don't cutting. think I can make it any closer. I want to make sure that the American people have a comprehensive view of the actions we took to end this financial crisis. Deciding to support AIG was one of the most difficult choices I've ever been involved in in over 20 years of public service. The steps that were taken were motivated solely by what we believe to be in the public interest. We did not act because AIG asked for help. We did not act to protect individual institutions. We acted because the consequences of AIG failing would have been catastrophic for our economy and for American families and businesses. More than a year removed from that terrible week of September 2008, I believe that the government strategy, and it was the government strategy, was the best of the available options and will ultimately cost the taxpayer far less than many feared and far less than many alternatives many people suggest today would have been better. And importantly, if you join with the President in adopting his proposed financial responsibility fee, American taxpayers will not have to pay one cent for the actions we took in AIG or the actions we took with the authority Congress gave the administration to stabilize this financial crisis. AIG's problems became acute just a few days before Lehman declared bankruptcy. At that time, our financial system and our economy stood at the brink of, of collapse. The banks and financial institutions that Americans rely on to protect their savings, to help finance their ch children's education, to help pay their bills, were at risks in which few Americans had ever experienced. The banks and the financial markets that businesses rely on to meet payroll, to build inventory, to fund new investments, to create new jobs, were threatened like at no time since the Great Depression. Across the country, across the United States of America, people were rapidly losing confidence in our financial system and in the government's ability to safeguard their economic security. In the midst of this storm, AIG posed a much greater threat than Lehman. AIG was much larger. It was spread across the globe. And its failure would have been far worse hitting Americans in ways Lehman could not. AIG was one of the largest life and health insurance companies in the country, one of the largest property and casualty insurers, providing insurance to 180,000 small businesses and other corporate entities, which together employed about 100 million people. AIG had sold products to protect local and city governments, pension funds, and thousands of public and private companies through guaranteed investment contracts and protection for 401ks. And as problematic, AIG had engaged in a broad range of financial activities that, stelt, that strayed well beyond traditional insurance businesses. Using a credit rating based on the strength and profitability of its insurance companies, it had become one of the largest providers of complicated financial products in the world. It made hundreds of billions of dollars of financial commitments without the resources to back up those commitments. AIG should have never been allowed to take those risks. But it was. It's insurance regulators in 20 different states. The regulators in other countries responsible for overseeing their international activities. And its holding company supervisor, the Office of Thrift Supervision, did not act to constrain the risks AIG was taking. Important to recall that the Federal Reserve was given no responsibility and no authority to contain risks that AIG was taking. No one acted to constrain risk taking by AIG. And none of those regulators in the moment of crisis had any ability to respond to its failure. The government of the United States did not have the ability to seize AIG and wind it down in an orderly way as the FDIC can and does for banks. Neither the bankruptcy code nor insolvency procedures for insurance companies 
could have handled the job. And there was no way to draw a line around AIG and prevent its failure from wreaking havoc across the system. The Federal Reserve was at the center of response to the crisis because it was the only fire station operating. The Federal Reserve faced a terrible choice to support AIG, putting billions of dollars of taxpayer resources at risk, or to let AIG fail and accept potentially catastrophic damage to the economy. We were not willing to accept such a, a catastrophe. So just four days after the AIG was drawn into that crisis, the AIG crisis, we extended AIG a line of credit secured by its insurance businesses. In return, the taxpayer took about an 80% stake in the company and began the process of restructuring management and the board and the firm itself. That initial action helped stem the bleeding for a time. But given the massive losses AIG faced, and given the force of the stor storm moving across the global financial system, it was not enough. And we had to work very quickly, almost from the beginning, to design and implement a broader, more permanent restructuring. AIG needed capital, not just a line of credit. And AIG's vulnerability to future losses to the bleeding of cash had to be reduced. On November 10th, the Federal Reserve and the Department of the Treasury jointly announced a series of steps designed to stabilize the company. The Treasury invested $440 billion of preferred capital under the authority Congress provided the executive branch under the TARP. And the Federal Reserve helped establish and fund two entities called Maiden Lane 2 and 3 to purchase a range of assets from the company that were threatening AIG's financial solvency. Maiden Lane 3 in particular has been the, appropriate, the, the subject appropriately of a range of questions about how we treated firms that had bought these insurance contracts from AIG. And in this effort, and I want to make this very clear, in this effort, our objective was, as always, to get, what the, what was the, to get the, best, the best deal for the American taxpayer. And we faced a number of options. If we had let AIG default on the contracts, AIG would have gone into bankruptcy, triggering all the disastrous economic consequences we had feared since it's September that led the government to act initially. If we had continued to lend AIG money to meet these obligations, its growing debt would have led to a credit ratings downgrade, bringing down the firm itself and putting more taxpayer dollars at risk. If we had tried to force counterparties to accept less than they were legally entitled to, market participants would have lost confidence in AIG, leading to the company's collapse. The counterparties could have refused. They could have kept the billions in collateral they had already taken. They could have kept the billions in securities they already had and they could have sued AIG for breach of contract. We did not have the luxury of time. We could not engage in protracted negotiations. AIG's financial position was deteriorating rapidly day by day. The prospect of failure was imminent. So we restructured those contracts to stop the bleeding and potentially recover some value for the taxpayer in the future. Now, although the government still faces the risk of substantial losses in its overall exposure to AIG, we expect that this particular transaction, the, the one, the very one that is the heart of so much controversy, will be paid off in full with interest, generating some profit for the American taxpayer. Now, on November 24th, after President Obama announced his intention to nominate me for Secretary of the Treasury, and after broad consultation with the Chairman of the Federal Reserve and others, I decided to stay on as President of New York Fed on an interim basis, but I withdrew from monetary policy decisions, policies involving individual financial institutions, and day-to-day -day management of the New York Fed. I had no role before or after November 24th in making decisions regarding what to disclose about the specific financial terms of Maiden Lane 2 and 3 and payments to AIG counterparties. Mr. Chairman, the broad strategy that the government adopted to contain this financial crisis has been remarkably effective at stemming the crisis, breaking the momentum of the crisis, and repairing the damage. And this has been achieved at much lower cost in taxpayer resources than many people anticipated. Confidence in the basic stability of the American financial system is much stronger today. Borrowing costs for American businesses and consumers, for households, for municipal and state governments have fallen dramatically. The economy is now growing. The support we provided to AIG 
in the context of the broad strategy to put out this financial fire was essential to achieving this early beginning of healing and recovery. Banks have already repaid two-thirds of the TARP investments that my predecessor appropriately made. The only support this administration has provided to banks since I took office, to banks, was $7 billion to regional small community banks. More than 75% of the emergency government guarantees that I inherited when I took into office have now been shut down and closed at a profit to taxpayers. Over the last year, the expected cost of stabilizing the financial system has fallen by over $400 billion. That is real resources that we can use to meet the many other challenges we face as a country. And if Congress joins with us in adopting the President's proposal for a financial responsibility fee, the American taxpayer will recoup every penny of potential losses under the TARP. Now, this economy is still in crisis, but because of the government's actions, the American financial system is now in a position where it can provide the credit necessary for economic growth. And that is essential to lay the foundation for job growth and long-term economic prosperity. Now let me close by saying this. If you are outraged by AIG, and you should be, if you are outraged by what happened with AIG, then you should be deeply committed to financial reform. The United States of America should never have let institutions like AIG take on a level of risk that could threaten the stability of the financial system. And the government of the United States should never have been in the position going into a crisis of this severity without the basic tools able to contain the damage and protect the taxpayer. So I hope you will join us in working to put in place a strong package of financial reforms that will protect consumers, protect investors, protect the taxpayer, and protect our economy from excessive risk-taking by financial institutions. And Mr. Chairman, one final thought. The public servants involved in making these decisions acted solely in the public interest, acted solely in the interest of the American taxpayer. They are dedicated Americans who bring to government service enormous experience and the highest integrity. I would never, and they would never, be part of any decision, any public decision intended for private benefit and not the public interest. The decisions we made together regarding AIG were enormously consequential. They were terribly difficult. They were the subject of extraordinary controversy within each of the institutions responsible. And for that reason, they were subject to enormous care and deliberation. But I believe a fair reading of history, a careful fair reading of history, of all the judgments we, we made, will demonstrate that the actions we took, and I was there, were essential to preventing broader catastrophe, and the solutions we took reduced the ultimate cost of the American taxpayer, and the American economy is much stronger today as a result. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Uh, let me begin by um, asking a couple of questions. Um, were you involved in any discussions with AIG or your staff involved where you discuss what AIG should or should not disclose to the public? Uh, Mr. Chairman, as I said, I had no role in making those decisions. But as the record shows, and the record before the committee shows, a large number, number of people at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the Federal Reserve Board in Washington played a very active role in thinking through those difficult choices. But. I'm not sure I got an, got an answer there. I, I, well, may I say it again? I, played no, I personally played no role before the 24th or after in making those decisions. But you asked whether any, any employees of the New York Fed did. Of course they did. Okay. When you were the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, when did you recuse yourself from matters involving specific companies and why did you recuse yourself? On November 24th, the President announced his intention to nominate me as Secretary of the Treasury. That forced me to make a set of decisions about what was appropriate for me to do, given the unique circumstances of that time. And after consulting with the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, with the Chairman of my board, with my general counsel, and with a range of other officials, collectively we decided 
that it was in the best interest of the Fed and the incoming administration for me to remove myself from day-to-day -day involvement in the Fed's policy issues, to leave that responsibility to my colleagues at the New York Fed, led by the executive, the first vice president of the New York Fed, but not to step down as president. And we made that decision because we wanted to make sure we were protecting the independence of the Fed and because I was going to be spending by necessity a huge part of my time in helping shape the president's economic agenda. And I was not going to be able to give the care and effort needed to carry on running the Fed on a day-to-day -day basis. Our judgment was that was the best decision at the time. I'm confident of that in retrospect. It was unique. It was unique, but I don't think it was a better alternative available. Mm -hmm. Secretary Geithner, um, uh, I don't think AIG's counterparties should have been paid 100 cents on the dollar. Of course, and in this email we have here, uh, uh, it's on the screen as well, uh, you had some interest in how much the counterparties were owed. Please tell the committee what impact the counterparties exposure had on your decision to pay 100 cents on the dollar? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that played no role in our decision. As I said in my opening statement, as I testified before, we had to make a difficult choice about what was going to prevent the failure of the firm at least cost to the taxpayer. If we had broken those contracts, if AIG had not paid them in full, if we had threatened default, if we had imposed haircuts, if we had selectively imposed haircuts, that would have brought about a downgraded its rating, the firm would not have been able to operate, and it would have collapsed. It was because of those choices we took the path we did to restructure the contracts and leave the taxpayer with some of the potential upside in those securities. Now, judging what is systemic, and why and a failure of AIG might matter for the system as a whole is a very difficult judgment to make. There's no black and white choice in that context. But our judgment was, as I said in my testimony, that AIG's collapse would have dramatically magnified all the effects you saw in the immediate aftermath of Lehman's failure. And in some ways, they would have been more consequential because they would have spread to a set of insurance businesses, and that would have been much worse for the country. So we were guided by a simple but terrible choice. How best to prevent default at least, at least cost to the taxpayer? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. I now yield to the gentleman from uh, California, Ranking Member Congressman Issa. Thank you, five Mr. Minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm going to pick up uh, pretty much where you left off. Uh, Secretary Geithner, I think, <coughs> pardon me? I think you've, uh, you've answered uh, you know, that you played no role in the decision to not disclose the full payment, the 100 percent payment to the counterparties, that you were not part of what some of us have called a cover-up. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. Let me follow up then. If, if after November 24th you were not involved in, in any activity, then one more, just to be clear, did you ever become involved with the Federal Reserve's disclosure decision with respect to AIG counterparty claims after your nomination to, as Treasury Secretary? In other words, have you ever participated or questioned or stayed involved with that? No, I did not. Well, I'd, I'd ask, from what we were given by the Fed, could we put up slide one? This email from you says uh, to William uh, Dudley, your replacement, on March of 2009, and it, where's the line to read here? Just, uh, okay, now it's easier to read on the screen. Where are you on the AIG counterparty disclosure issue? Long after you left, you made this email. What was it about, and what was the answer? Well, Congressman, as you know, this question of disclosure was the subject of huge amount of controversy. And most people... You think? Yeah. Uh, uh, that's what my son says, and I agree with you. And I think most people feel as you do. They said, 
why shouldn't it be disclosed? Why shouldn't it be disclosed? And as you know, in March, which I think, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, it was March the 15th. time of this email, uh, it had been subject of testimony by the Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve was facing a huge amount of pressure and attention over whether to disclose. Uh, so I assume I was doing what you might expect in that context and asking them, where were they? We're gonna, were they going to change their position? Okay. Well, then following up on your continued involvement and looking at them, where are you on this? Do you believe that there should be full disclosure, as the President has said, that these kinds of instruments should be public, that the, essentially they be, should, like any other instrument, the details of which should be available broadly? Uh, Congressman, I, am, I believe deeply that trust and confidence in the financial system requires disclosure and transparency. I believe that trust and confidence in the government requires that our actions be subject to full exposure and review by careful independent analysis. And I have been very, very supportive since I came into office and before to making sure we were bringing an unprecedented level of disclosure to the transparency around the actions of the government. I'll just give you a few examples. When I came into office, we put the financial terms of all of the transactions we undertook under the TARP in the public domain for everyone to see. One of the reasons our financial strategy has been successful in bringing a measure of stability back to our system is we compelled the largest institutions in the yeah. country to subject their balance sheets to well, a well, level well, of well, disclosure. Secret well, well, Secretary, and I appreciate what you've been doing right. as Treasury Secretary, uh, but I have in front of me from the Fed uh, marked confidential the details of who benefited, who got uh, these benefits, and Currently, it's locked up till 2018 by an order that wasn't negotiated in final until May of this year, or May of last year, long after you were obviously able to be involved, that, that locks up the public knowing. And these, these are assets the American people have paid for in full, right? Do you believe that we should know about these? Uh, Congressman, that's an issue that I think you need to direct to the New York Fed and to the SEC. Okay. Well, as you, we you asked me a question that I didn't quite okay. get a chance to answer before, which is, you said, what was my view, in effect, yes. of what the Fed ultimately did? It's a, very important to recognize that the Fed did, in March of 2009, fully release information on the counterparties <laughs> and the details of that transaction. And based on what I know, I thought the decision was appropriate then. Now, I know a lot of people have said, okay. should that have come sooner? I think reasonable people could come to that judgment. But I did not stand in okay. their shoes at the now, time. Now, as, as a member and the head of the New York Fed, and also, I guess, broadly a member of the board generally, uh, until you were sworn General's in. Chairman's time's expired. I'll just finish up this one question, Mr. Chairman, very quickly. You were aware that, or that Chairman Bernanke, in fact, uh, had in front of him from the staff a report that said AIG should be allowed to go bankrupt, which was then held back on September 16th, based on his, December, his decision on September 15th, not to disclose this for a broad vote of the board, weren't you? I don't, I don't I'm not aware of the email you refer to, but I, I'm, I'm aware of the following, and I want to The, the witness this. may answer the question, and then we're going to move on to the next questioner. Uh, thank you. Every decision we made in the days before September 16th and afterwards were enormously controversial decisions. No, no, Mr. Chair, Mr. The gentleman's time's expired. Chair recognizes Mr. Kanjorski. I would ask unanimous consent to just get an answer to the question. It'll well, be very quick. You know, each member has five minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll, without objection, the witness can answer the question. Right. We're going to move the, on. The, to the only Mr. question Kanjorski. we want is, were you aware of that? And if you weren't, do you think you should have been aware of that for a vote on September 16th? That's all. Well, I, I was aware that there was enormous concern, both in the New York Fed and at the Federal Reserve Board, about the choices we were confronted. As I said, there is nothing more controversial and difficult than I think anyone we face in this context. And I think it should be reassuring and no surprise that those actions, and the record will show, that those actions were the subject of enormous debate. And Thank they you, were the subject of debate before the 16th and afterwards. And every time we faced the possibility of having to do more, we all stepped back and said, do we really need to do that? Does that make sense? And that, okay. that is a good thing for the country. You had people willing to debate that and argue it forcefully. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Kanjorski. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, there's a famous expression. I think it comes from one of the, the 
fine poets of our era. <clears throat> we, ha we have come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. And I hope you appreciate the role of Caesar that you're playing today. But uh, it made me think about the fact that last Sunday uh, I watched a ball game and uh, in the closing moments of the ball game, the, the quarterback made a tremendous decision to pass the football and got intercepted. And as a result, the opposing team took the ball down the field and kicked a field goal and won the game. And I convened several meetings in New York after that game and met extensively on Monday and Tuesday. And we have concluded that he just did the absolute worst thing that he could have done every one of us at those meetings would have made the correct decision after the fact. I think the point I'm trying to make is I do share some of the sympathies with you because I, I was on the committee and the task force that was working with the secretary and with the chairman of the Federal Reserve when the crisis occurred. And I, and I caution some of the members, I think even of this committee, were AWOL for the votes that we needed to authorize the saving of the American economy. As I've heard your testimony, you've come to the conclusion that if the rescue package had not been passed by the Congress of the United States authorizing the Secretary and the President to take extraordinary action and commit hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayers' money, we wouldn't be sitting in this room today. We probably wouldn't be operating <coughs> under the Constitution that was saved as a result of that precipitous action taken in a very short period of time. Is that relatively correct? I completely agree. And those members of Congress on both sides of the aisle that voted to authorize that action did the right and the necessary and the courageous thing. And they made it possible for my predecessor and the Federal Reserve to start to stabilize this thing. And it would not have been possible without that, author without that authority and without that legislation. I appreciate that. I, I sometimes, as a matter of fact, I took that argument to the White House at that time. If you remember, the President was not as outspoken. And I always was convinced that in a democracy such as ours, transparency, both in bad news and dangerous news, must be shared with people. And part of the problem at that time, we didn't share that news. And uh, even to today, most people in this audience and most people throughout America have no idea how close we came to total annihilation and disaster. Is that correct? Uh, that is my view. Um, I think for the first time since the Great Depression, you were seeing a full-scale run on the financial system. People were taking their savings out of banks. They wondered whether a dollar was a dollar whether a dollar in a money market fund would be worth a dollar. They worried about whether a dollar lent to a AAA company would be worth a dollar. It was a basic calamitous breakdown in the fabric of our system. And no recovery would have been possible without starting to stabilize the system and stem the bleeding. And that was something that could not happen without the authority that, as I said, many people in this room, many people on both sides of the aisle voted to approve. Am I correct that there were discussions held at the highest echelons of the United States government and the Congress at that very time as to whether or not law and order could be secured in the United States if we did not take precipitous action to assure the people that the economic markets of the United States and the world would be held secure? Well, I was not in the executive branch at that time, so I can't speak to that, but it would not surprise me if that was the case. Again, this was the gravest crisis we had seen since the Great Depression. It was not going to solve itself. Many people advocated we should let it burn itself out. But that would have been catastrophic for the economy. We're still living with the consequences of the damage and the wreckage. The scale of the challenges we face today as an economy are rooted in that crisis, and they illustrate the force of the pressure and the momentum that was already, uh, we were already living with in August of that summer. All decisions made in those fateful two weeks weren't the correct decisions, were they? Oh, uh, Congressman, I, I think every day about things we could have done, done differently and done early. And I think a great strength of this country is that people in the Congress, in independent oversight bodies, in the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, we're all going to take a cold, hard look at everything that was done. 
uh, and that'll time, give us a better basis. Time has expired. You may continue with your answer and continue. And that'll give us a better basis for fixing this mess and preventing it from happening again. And we will cooperate fully in all that effort. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Your uh, counsel, one of your counsels, James Bergen, uh, said on March the 12th, I don't know if there's any way to manage it so the Congress won't ask for it, or if they do, won't release it. Uh, <coughs> does he work for you? Or did he work for you? Uh, yes, he did. Does uh, your legal counsel uh, have the uh, authority to uh, uh, make comments and decisions uh, without your knowledge? Of course, but but regarding something of this import. Well, as president and CEO of well, the New York Fed, of course, <laughs> I was ultimately this doesn't responsible. Require a long dissertation. No, it's not. It's not a long all, answer. All I want to know is, do they have the authority to make these kinds of comments and decisions without you knowing of, about? Of it? course. On uh, what's the date on this? On November the 11th, when you were still at the Fed, an internal memo said, as a matter of course, we do not want to disclose that the concession is at par unless absolutely necessary. Are you familiar with that memo? Not with that email. As I said, I was not involved in decisions about what to disclose about the individual transactions or the names of counterparties. But I have enormous trust and confidence in the integrity of judgment of people who were. And then uh, on March the 15th, after that, uh, we had up on the board there a few minutes ago uh, the email to Mr. Dudley. It says, where are you on the counterparty disclosure issue? And Dudley responded, my understanding is that the it is in train and could come out as early as today. Are you familiar with that? I, I don't recall his response, and I didn't recall my email until you put it in front of him, but now I see it. You don't remember that? No, I don't, but I do He's remember at the time there was still enormous building pressure on the Fed to disclose, and they did disclose. Did you still maintain that you weren't involved in any of this? Yes, absolutely. Were you aware that uh, all of these... Uh, Organizations around the world, Society General, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Deutsche Bank, UBS, we're all getting 100 cents on the dollar? Absolutely. You are aware of all that? Why wasn't this disclosed back in November when you were the head of the Fed? Well, again, that is a question you need to direct to the people who were responsible for that judgment. Well, you were the head of the Fed. I was the head of, head, I was the, head of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York until I was confirmed by the Senate well, for why, this job. Why, why, why wouldn't this have been disclosed by you back then? Well, I mean, you, you're, you're I don't, saying I don't, that, what was this, a group that I made don't know the how to say it any differently, but when the President announced his intention to nominate me, I withdrew appropriately from a whole range of policy decisions of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, in part to protect the Fed, in part so I could do my job of helping the president prepare for how to fix the mess we inherited. Now, because of that, I was not involved in those decisions. But I want to say the people who made those decisions did the, so. Th this happened on November the 11th before you withdrew. What, what happened this, on November 11th? This, this, this knowledge. Oh, uh, Mr. Chairman, as I said in my testimony, I but was. Why, did, why, didn't, why, didn't, why wasn't it disclosed back then? Well, the, we didn't face that choice then. I was directly involved in the judgments that we collectively made. You didn't face the choice back then? You no, we didn't. Know? No, but we, what we, the choice that I was deeply involved in, fully support, believe was the right choice, was the decision to restructure these contracts in a way that was better for the taxpayer and prevented the fall of the company. I was fully supportive uh, of that, fully it, aware it, of that. It stretches credulity for us to believe that you had no role in this and didn't know anything about it when your attorneys and people that work for you were sending emails all around the place, and, and you were the head of the Fed, and you didn't know anything about it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And I think a lot of my colleagues feel the same way. Congressman, I was, I was president of New York Fed throughout that time. I was, we were involved, as you know, 
in an extraordinary complicated range but of things. But this is major stuff. The, the decisions around AIG were major and hugely consequential. And they were done with enormous care and judgment. But, but the choices around disclosure, which understandably are the focus of so much attention, well, are not judgments okay, I could speak to. Let me just finish by asking this. Do you think that there ought to be an annual audit of the Fed? I am very supportive. The gentleman's time expired, but Mr. Th Secretary, you may answer the question. Right. I am very supportive, as part of financial reform, of trying to make sure that the Fed is subject to an adequate level of transparency and disclosure and oversight. And the Chairman of the Federal Reserve has worked with many members in Congress in helping shape reforms that would achieve that outcome. I'll in take doing that, that though, yes. I'll take that in as doing yes. that, though, I want to be it's very important we protect the independence of the Fed on monetary policy issues. It would be a deep mistake for the country, a grave mistake for the country, to threaten that independence. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Cummings. You may proceed. Secretary Geithner, um, I don't know whether you realize this, but it was the Democrats that asked for this hearing. I specifically asked for this hearing. Did you know that? I and, believe I did know that. And, and let me tell you that when I asked for the hearing, I must tell you that I was uh, extremely concerned and um, I, w I was questioning whether uh, you had acted appropriately. And I think anyone who re read headlines uh, back then when this hearing was requested would have come to at least the question mark. Um, and you stood here a few moments ago and you swore that you would tell the truth. Is that correct? I did. And I, is that correct? I and did. I assume that the statement, your written statement, um, is a statement which you would also swear to? Absolutely. And I can tell you that as I read your written statement, I'm trying to figure out as far as the, the initial getting involved with AIG and what you all did, I don't, know, I don't know what anybody else would have done. I don't think we had a choice. Or did you have a choice? So let me say that I think we did the right thing there. Now this is the way it gets sticky. We also have a situation, Secretary Geithner, where the American people are concerned that a lot is being done for Wall Street but not enough being done for Main Street. And one of the interesting things is that you talked about how if you had not taken the, the action from the beginning, how it might have affected Main Street, the constituent members. Can you tell us if you hadn't taken the action, how might it would affect students in my... Thousands of more factories would have closed their doors. Millions more Americans would have lost their jobs. The value of America's houses and savings would have fallen even further than they did at that time. People would have rushed to take their money out of banks. It would have brought about utter collapse. I don't know a better way to say it than that. And if people wonder whether that was true, I think all they have to do is look back at what actually happened in the fall of 2008. And you saw the value of American savings fall by almost 40 percent, trillions of dollars in lost wealth, millions of Americans lost their homes, thousands and thousands of businesses had to close. That's what happens when you let a financial crisis get out of control. Governments should never let that happen. But if they don't act, and this is and a very important thing to people understand, people think it's unfair for the government to act to rescue a financial system. But you cannot help an economy recover. You can't create jobs, you create, can't preserve the value of people's savings without a functioning financial system. Another moment when we requested the hearing that I was concerned about was this counterparties. As you probably know, I, along with 26 other members of Congress, we requested that uh, Siktar uh, Borowski uh, look into that whole issue. And there have been comments at the capital levels that the counterparties were tenuous and, and had they not been paid in full, they risked collapse. Was this a real possibility? Uh, in my judgment, that was not the most important risk posed by AIG. AIG's failure would have posed some direct losses on those major banks. But those losses themselves were not the issue. They would not have been significant. The threat to the system, and this was a threat to all institutions operating, was the threat of collapse of the system as a whole. And if AIG had failed, 
you would have seen a crisis spread to insurance companies around the world, and you would have seen investors, depositors, creditors pull back from every financial institution in the world, and that would have brought a much more precipitous collapse in all financial values. My time is running out, just real quick. When the, when the public has so much invested in a company, isn't it better to err on the side of transparency, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, as opposed to uh, keeping things uh, secret? Of course, of course. So, and, and so what would push the, push the decision to not be as transparent? I mean, what would cause that? There are very few cases where it is necessary for there to be either a lag in disclosure or some gap. I'm not sure how to, how to, the best way to explain this, but like in national security, like in law enforcement, General, like time's in, expired, but you can conclude Like in the protection answer. of confidential supervisory information, but also to protect the taxpayer, there are some areas in which you need to be careful about how you manage that. That's a discussion, though, you should have with my colleagues at the Fed. They're in a better position to answer it. But we would not want to disclose information that would be bad for the taxpayer, make it harder for the taxpayer to recoup our investments. But in general, Congressman, I completely agree that transparency and disclosure are essential. The American people deserve it. And we have been very effective in bringing an unprecedented level of security to all the basic actions we took in this financial crisis. An Thank unprecedented level of transparency and disclosure. Thank, Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. Chair recognized Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, it's kind of interesting the way you framed your testimony and your involvement in some of these decisions before the committee today. Um, I think you've tried to give the impression that uh, uh, you had to do what you had to do because of the uh, si financial situation. That, that's pretty much what you've said, right? Oh, uh, absolutely. Thank you. And then you uh, uh, you used the term, you kept using the term, we made uh, decisions together. Uh, then you set a dividing line of November 24th. That was, uh, was that when you received the word that you were going to be nominated for Trek? Treasury Secretary? That's when the announcement was made. Yes. Um, so you've tried to distance yourself from decisions that were made before that, but in fact... No, no, I, I have not tried to dis. I, I take well, pride well, and saying, full uh, responsibility uh, it, now, for all those decisions. Now, okay, then you also uh, were aware when uh, the New York Federal Reserve Board ultimately selected on November 3rd 2008 uh, to, to purchase the underlying assets. Uh, oh, absolutely. You, yes. You were. And, and, I, and again, as I said, and I take pride what you in that said decision. Is you, uh, also, you had, no, you had no knowledge of any cover up, right? Uh, or intent not to give full information and disclosure. Uh, of course not. Of course not. So you took credit for the decision, but not the cover up. No, no, and I, then, I no, no. You've, dist you've distanced yourself from any cover up before November 24th, and then, of course, you were out of the picture from November 24th forward. Is that correct? Uh, Congressman, I'm not trying to distance myself from anything. I will take well, complete responsibility for decisions I was uh -huh. played a role so, in shaping, was part of shaping, including all decisions up to the 24th on this case. And I'm happy to take responsibility for all decisions so I've made then, then you were since aware then, too. of 100 cents, 100 cents on a day a dollar bail. A absolutely. A absolutely. And uh, the risk uh, that, that was posed by uh, that, uh, that offer. So you knew about that, but you weren't attempting to cover up. That's your testimony today. Of course not. Today. Okay. Uh, so I, I believe either you made a bad uh, decision there, uh, or in fact there was the attempt to cover up one, one of the biggest bailouts, backdoor bailouts, uh, in, in history. Uh, now, you've tried to frame it as you did it because um, you did it in the interest of the people and the, failing, uh, the failure of the system. I'm telling you, I believe these are lame excuses. Either you were in charge and did the wrong, wrong thing or you participated in the wrong thing. This to, uh, it, to me, it appears like, you know, when you were uh, being confirmed, uh, a lot of controversy surrounded you're not paying your taxes. You gave lame excuses then. I believe you're giving the that, committee that, that is lame excuses now. And okay. I want my final question is, 
why shouldn't we ask for your resignation as Secretary of the Treasury? I didn't think you should have been Secretary of the Treasury when it was disclosed that you didn't pay your taxes because that's the highest financial responsibility position in the United States government. So why shouldn't you that step is, down that now? That is your right. That is your right to that opinion. I have worked in public service all my life. I have never been a politician. I have served my country as carefully and ably as I can, and it is a great privilege to me for me to work with this president to help repair the damage that, that was here when we took office. Yes. And I will do so as long as he asks me to do so, to the best of my ability, with great pride in this country and in him. Yeah. Again, I think you're, you're punning the blame, and I think you're trying to position yourself as uh, the savior Congressman, you don't, of the you don't know me very well. institution. And yet, you, you, don't, I you don't know me very well. I believe I will take that we're not getting the whole story. We're getting a lame story in a monumental backdoor decision of bailout for which the American taxpayers will stay on the hook for huge amounts of money. Even by estimates of the Treasury Department, there will be billions of dollars from this deal, which either you should have been overseeing uh, and you said you had knowledge of, uh, and you failed to take some steps to further protect the taxpayer interest. Uh, you were either uh, incompetent on the job uh, or you were not doing uh, you, uh, your job and knew uh, what was taking place and tried to conceal it. And I think that's grounds for your removal. Congressman, I was there. I know what I was responsible for. I take full responsibility and I said great pride in those judgments. The, the gentleman's time has expired, but the okay. Secretary may answer the question as he, he sees fit. He takes great pride in those judgments. I do. I take great pride in those judgments. And, and people have a right to disagree with them. And they have a right to go back and look at them with great care and analysis. And I hope you will give the same care and judgment to looking at those decisions in retrospect with the benefit of hindsight that we gave in making those decisions at that time. Uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, it's my uh, uh, time to answer or ask questions. And I'm uh, yielding myself five minutes. Uh, Mr. Geithner, the New York Fed agreed to Goldman Sachs' demands for billions to, center, uh, to settle its counterparty claims with AIG, 100 cents on a dollar. But for more than a year before that, Goldman and AIG had been locked into a dispute over that money, and Goldman believed it would lose up to $2.5 billion if AIG defaulted. Did you know at the time that Goldman Sachs had concluded it would not receive 100 cents on a dollar from AIG in the event of default. I did not know, and, and I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, Goldman had said publicly that they didn't need the government's money, that it was fully hedged, and would not have been materially affected if AIG had defaulted. But that turns out to be disingenuous. Committee investigators have learned that Goldman's supplemental insurance policy would not pay in the event that the U.S. government bailed out AIG. Goldman's protection would pay only in the event AIG defaulted. Goldman had not anticipated the government bailout and so hadn't put that contingency into the terms of its contracts. That failure put Goldman at real risk of losing the entire amount of disputed money once the government rescued AIG. Did you have any knowledge at the time? Did Lloyd Blankfein or anyone at Goldman ever admit to you or anyone working under you that Goldman Sachs was not fully hedged in the event the government took over AIG? and that Goldman was at risk of losing at least $2.5 billion if the government bailed out AIG and imposed less than 100 cents on a dollar on counterparties. Uh, Congressman, I am not aware, and I don't see how I could have been aware, of the pre precise details of the hedging strategies of all those firms to the event of a default by AIG. But we made a very careful effort to try to assess, working with the supervisors of all the institutions that exposure to AIG about what their economic exposure would be. Yeah, had you talked it, to Lloyd Blankfein, for example, about this? Do you remember talking to him? In, in the Goldman Sachs case in particular, because there were a lot of press reports that were cons consequential in this case, I did ask them directly what their exposure was, and I asked them to show me what their internal information system reports showed about that exposure. It, we're going to, the, the committee, if I may, is going to uh, have a series of questions to submit to you in writing 
so that you'll be given an opportunity Happy to, to have a, an extensive answer Happy on this point. Those questions. Yeah. Now, uh, Mr. Secretary, once the government stepped in, there was only one way for Goldman Sachs to get any piece of the $2.5 billion, and that was if the New York Fed voluntarily agreed to give it to them. Now, if the New York Fed had fought for taxpayers, uh, Goldman would have lost money it didn't have any hope of recovering. In spite of public statements to the contrary, the New York Fed had a lot of leverage, a lot of leverage to negotiate a reduction which would have saved taxpayers billions. But instead, the New York Fed took Goldman Sachs' position in its dispute with AIG and settled it fully with taxpayers' money. Now, Mr. Geithner, under normal circumstances, Goldman Sachs would have had to sue AIG in court to recover the disputed $2.5 billion, and they would have settled for something less than that. Isn't it true that the New York Fed gave Goldman Sachs a better deal than it could have ever expected from AIG or any market uh, player at any other time? Congressman, if we had the ability, like we have for normal companies, to put them through bankruptcy, if we had the ability, like we have for banks, to put them into an orderly winding process, down, wind down process like quasi-bankruptcy, we could have done many things. But under the laws of the land, we did not have the ability. So we faced a very simple choice. Let AIG default or prevent it. What, what? And there was no way, financial, legal, or otherwise, we could have imposed haircuts, selectively default on any of those institutions, without the risk of downgrade and default. And well, that is the I just only wanna, I reason... I just want to say, Mr. Uh, Secretary, since when does saving the system require the taxpayers to give a better deal than the market would normally deliver? Yet, you know, that is what the New York Fed did. The government gave Goldman Sachs more than Goldman Sachs had any right to expect, while at the same time giving no financial relief, whatever, to millions of Americans facing a foreclosure crisis. And if that doesn't illustrate what the New York Fed thought it was working for, I don't, or who it was working for, uh, I don't know what does. Congressman, you, you may respond, and then my time's right. expired. Congressman, that is not true, and it is unfair to the public servants. What's not true? What you just said. What's is, not, what? What is, it is true? It is not true that the actions we took in AIG were for the benefit of anybody but the millions of Americans who at that point were suffering from the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. The only way to help reduce that damage, protect that damage, was to fix the system and prevent catastrophic failure that would have made that crisis worse. That is the only motive that underpinned these actions by the government. I thank and the gentleman. My time's expired. The chair recognized Mr. Duncan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you talked about looking at, at these uh, events with the uh, benefit of hindsight. Two men who did were uh, uh, Peter Boone, who is uh, a researcher at the London School of Economics, and Simon Johnson, a professor at the MIT. Uh, uh, could the gentleman uh, be closer to the mic so we can hear you? Thank you. Um, Simon Johnson, a professor at M the MIT uh, Sloan School of Management, and they wrote in the uh, New Republic magazine on the, in the September 23rd issue, quote, the Fed may well have mitigated our current crisis by sowing the seeds for the next one. And they say, in fact, the Fed has ex exacerbated the possibility of another similar, even larger crisis. In fact, the way they put it, they say, quote, as a result, unless real reform happens soon, we face the prospect of another bubble burst bailout cycle that will be even more dangerous than the one we've just been through. Now, I assume you know that the American people have, are very, very angry about these uh, bailouts and the bonuses and the salaries that have come about um, through this, what most people see as a big government, big business duopoly. And they feel like this big government, big business duopoly has um, uh, been manipulated in such a way as to allow just mind-boggling salaries and bonuses and allow a very few elitists at the top to come out to, like robber barons or uh, to an extent uh, really not known in American history. Uh, because of big government through the Federal Reserve System, our free market system was not allowed to uh, operate. And it seems to most of us that it's not capitalism to uh, uh, when government uses billions and billions of taxpayer money to prop up a very few well-connected firms. Now that leads me to two questions. One, has the Treasury informed any 
of these financial giants that we will not follow too big to fail policies in the future? And secondly, do you think we should limit these salaries, uh, these ridiculously excessive salaries and bonuses that are even uh, being talked about uh, even today in any of these firms that uh, got taxpayer bailout uh, funds? Congressman, that was a very thoughtful question. You asked exactly the right question. In a financial crisis, you face this tragic choice. You can let it try to burn itself out and let the damage spread to all sorts of innocent victims, or you can act to prevent it, knowing that acting to prevent it will create the risk that in the future, investors will expect the government to step in the future and save firms from the consequences of failure. That is the dilemma at the heart of strategy in financial crisis. To stand back and let it burn is irresponsible. It's what happened in the Great Depression. It almost happened to this country. The moral, just, pragmatic, fair choice, and this should be true if you're a Republican or a Democrat, is to act to protect the innocent. But as you said wisely, by definition, that creates the risks we sow the seeds for future crises. And that's why in the financial reform problem we all plan, we all have a huge stake in trying to make sure we not just limit risk taking in the future, but that investors and equity holders and creditors and managers and executives do not run these firms with the expectations the government will be there again. And that's why it's so important we put in place types of bankruptcy mechanisms that we have now for banks, but we do not have for institutions like AIG. Now, absolutely, we have made clear in public, in crystal clear terms, in reform proposals that are now moving through the Congress, that we need to end this expectation of too big to fail in government assistance. And if you look at what we have done since we came to office, we have moved very aggressively to pull the government out of these institutions, to make sure we are not in these institutions a day longer than is necessary, to replace the public capital with private capital. And we've done that by forcing disclosure and forcing firms to recapitalize with private money, precisely because we want to limit the scale of the government's involvement and end this exceptional period as quickly as we could. And that strategy has been very, very effective in ways that people on the right and the left should welcome. On the right, it means that the government is out much more quickly than anybody expected. On the left, people should know with confidence now that we have far more resources now available to help address the long-term challenges we face as a country, to reduce our long-term deficits, and try to meet the things that we have to do to fix what was broken in this country. But you asked a very good question, and I agree very much with the thrust of your concern. Well, that was a good answer to my first question, but my second question was, do you think bonuses and these bonuses and salaries should be limited in any way in these firms that did receive government bailout money? I think what, time's expired, but please answer the question. I think what happened to compensation across this country and in the financial system was terribly catastrophic. In the, it's, it's, it's judged by, it came as in the wave of a huge increase in income inequality in the United States over decades. In the financial system, it was much worse. And it was much more consequential because it helped encourage a level of risk taking that again brought the system to the edge of the collapse. So it is deeply important in the public interest of the country that con Congress legislate reforms that will change how bankers are paid. Government can't do it alone, though. Shareholders and their representatives on the boards of these firms have to bring about much tougher limits on how firms are paid. I think that's very important to do, and I hope we'll have support from the Congress in making sure we have the basis for doing that. Thanks, the gentleman. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, I'm well aware of your family's uh, commitment to public service, so uh, it, it makes it more difficult, in a sense, but. Uh, uh, to ask these questions, but I honestly feel that uh, that the conduct of yourself and Mr. Paulson were not consistently on the side of the American taxpayer, uh, and, I, and I'll explain why. I'll give you two examples. We had the situation with Bear Stearns. The circumstances are the same. The world is on the brink. We got a disaster. We're worried about the whole system melted down. With your support, uh, Mr. Paulson, uh, Mr. Bernanke. We forced Bear Stearns shareholders from a position, I think that was a high of uh, $172 a share, 
in January, we forced them down to $2 a share because the American taxpayer money was in the bailout. And that was something that was supported by the Fed, by the Treasury, because we felt that because the taxpayer was bailing them out, that the shareholders of Bear Stearns should not be held harmless. Now, you have a different situation here, slightly different. A number of weeks later where we have AIG going under. And this is, these, are, these are credit default swaps. So the money going into AIG is going right out to the counterparties. This is a, this is a pass through. And the folks on the other side are Goldman Sachs. Largely, that's, that's a principal beneficiary of all this. And we don't negotiate a nickel, not a cent, off of what they're getting. You're in the same position. You're supposed to be negotiating on behalf of the American people. Now, you're saying, oh, the regulations were different. Let me tell you something. We were changing the rules and regulations every single day. We were taking action, the Fed, under 13.3, under extraordinary circumstances. You had every opportunity, every opportunity to weigh in on behalf of the American people and make these people take a new deal, make them take a haircut. You scalped the folks on Bear Stearns. Two cents on a dollar they got. Two cents on a dollar. The folks at Goldman Sachs got 100 cents on a dollar. And... That is just unacceptable, totally unacceptable. You had the opportunity, and you know I, I just think it was a terrible decision on your part, and also on Mr. Paulson's part. And he's up later, and we'll talk to him. But Congressman, I, how I do you expect to to, to look? You and and the thing about changing over to the Obama administration, you get the same people who are relying on you. The American taxpayer, when you're you're in one job, and the American American taxpayer is relying you on the on the other job. I don't see a conflict. I really don't. You could have done the the right thing by those people, by the American taxpayer, because their money was putting into the being put into this deal. Congressman, and, I, and it just stinks to the high heaven what happened here. Congressman, and, I, and I, I don't like the obfuscation. And and to top it all off. The, the disclosure was not there. The disclosure was not there at the proper time to tell the American people and tell this Congress what was going on. And that is just inexcusable. And it makes me doubt. It makes me doubt your commitment to the American people. It makes me doubt Mr. Paulson, Paulson's uh, commitment to the American people. And I think the commitment to Goldman Sachs trumped the responsibility that, that our officials had to the American people. Congressman, I respect your opinion. I know you hold those opinions strongly, but I completely disagree. The American taxpayer would not have been better off if the government had made it possible for equity holders and Bear Stearns to get more money. The American taxpayer would not have been better off if we had let AIG default. None of us did anything out of any concern. There's a difference between giving them 100, 100 cents on a dollar and, and letting them default. This was a new game. You were creating new facilities every week to we help were. folks. We, we were. Because we, were, we were letting people go to the discount window that never had an opportunity to do that. We were changing the rules day by day, and, and we had the banks at, at a position where we could have exercised a lot of leverage, and, and, and you chose not to do I it. I you chose not to do it. Right. I disagree with you. And, and it I doesn't mean be... we have to pay them 100 cents on the dollar or we let them fail. There are increments here, and, and they're, they're we never not, use that leverage. Not, not in this case. In this case, not, exactly. Not, no, not Under 13.3, we could have taken different steps than we took here. 13.3 had nothing to do with this in this particular case. What 13.3 was, and this is important for people to understand, 13.3 was authority given to the Federal Reserve to protect the financial system from broad-based runs. It gave us the authority only to lend against collateral to make sure that firms that were solvent could fund. We did that because of the catastrophic damage caused by decades of previous financial crises. Yep. We used that authority because we thought there was no other choice. Look, and we used that authority appropriately. Let me just say, but, I'm reclaiming my question. time. G gentlemen, when, gentlemen. When, when Hank Paulson pulled nine banks into a room and said, you're taking bailout money, that was extraordinary action. Okay. Gentleman's time has expired. I must. He move could have on. done the same thing negotiating a better rate on behalf of the American taxpayer. I yield sure. back. I. I, I if it would have been possible, we would have done it. Yeah. Why would I want to be sitting here before you today having to defend actions that look like 
they could have been avoided. There is nobody who was part of that decision that would not have done that if it would have been possible. I try to be as careful as I can in explaining the reasons why it was not possible, but it comes down to this basic tragic choice. If you are prepared to default, you can impose haircuts. If you can't accept the consequences of default, <coughs> you do not have any leverage. It would have been vastly more expensive to the American taxpayer. It would have been much more damaging to people you and I care about, people you and I wake up every day worrying about, if we had let that firm fail. There was no choice between default and the restructuring of those contracts, and they left the taxpayer better off. There was no off. shared gentlemen, sacrifice, gentlemen, 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 no shared uh, sacrifice uh, for uh, Goldman gentlemen, Sachs uh, and the American people. Yeah, but a gentleman from Massachusetts yield, uh, the gentleman's time has expired, and I now call him Mr. Turner from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Geithner, in um, an answer to one of my colleagues, you previously stated that you had never been a politician. I want to assure you from your answers today that you are absolutely a politician. And, and let me tell you one of the Do you mean that examples, as a compliment or not? Let, I can't let tell. Let me tell you one of the, the answers that, that, that trouble me about the issue in your written testimony of the team concluded AIG's failure would be catastrophic. You go on to talk about the insurance arms of AIG. Now, this is not the first hearing that this committee has had or other, other committees. And you know that we're aware of the independence of the insurance arms of AIG. We've got um, <clears throat> Morris Greenberg, a former chairman and the CEO of AIG, said, to the best of my knowledge, the problems that came to a head this year did not originate in AIG's insurance businesses, which remained fundamentally strong. We had the head of the um, New York State Insurance Department, Superintendent Eric Danalo, uh, came in and said this, before I go further, I would like to make one critical point. It is important for everyone, and especially policyholders and AIG insurance companies, to understand that the insurance companies, which are regulated by New York and other states, are solvent and have the funds to pay any policy or policyholders' claims. They had independent reserves. Um, you did not bail out the insurance companies of, of AIG, correct? They, they didn't need it. You bailed out the, the parent, right? Yes, so, so when but we go if through, the parent had so, defaulted... So when we go through your answer of if AIG had failed, the catastrophic effect of all of the insurance companies that were on AIG, they, they, they weren't bailed out by you. No, that's not true. Um, but maybe this is helpful to go back a little bit. When AIG came to us that weekend, remember the Fed is not their regulator. Fed had no responsibility authority over what, how they ran their business. That was the province of other regulators. It was inconceivable to me that this was a problem we were going to have to try to solve. And we got all the people we could, including the New York State Insurance Commissioner and his staff, other people to look at and Let's explain pause to us. Did you bail out the life insurance arms of AIG? The, the, those insurance companies. Did, did you companies, bail out the life insurance arms of AIG? Well, I, again, I wouldn't use that term. The actions we took helped Did you bail prevent, out the health insurance arm of AIG? Well, the, again, the actions we took to prevent the fault of the firm protected well, the, those companies Mr. Geithner, the from the risk of failure. The testimony we've received previously from those who were looking at those arms was uh, that they were substantially sound and so the catastrophic effects that, that you list I, um, certainly I are uh, something that we would all can, have been we would right. have all have been I, concerned about. I disagree completely. The people will disagree, can look at this and they can come to different judgments, but the people who were responsible for looking at those insurance companies, frankly, had no idea of the risks with firms term, and you could not separate those companies from the companies that had taken terrible risks. The, the uh, tragic thing in the structure of the company was they were so closely linked they couldn't separate them. Why would we have not, if it had been possible to separate the place that was taking the firm down, to separate that cleanly, separate that from those, we would have done that in a second. And in fact, much of what the management of this firm is trying to do today still, 15 months later, is designed to achieve that objective. But they were tightly connected. They could not have been separated. And the insurance supervisors who were responsible for the individual firm did not know the extent to which the financial basis of the insurance companies was so connected to the holding company and the AIFP that had taken all those risks. Well, Mr. Secretary, as, as you were going through uh, the bailouts and as we look to uh, the counterparties and the funds that were received, one of the biggest concerns that I've had through all of this process 
is that I believe that when it all becomes public, and it hasn't all become public yet because we, we don't have, have everything from you, that this may turn out to be the largest theft in history. That there were parties that were participating in, <clears throat> um, with, through mortgage-backed securities and through uh, the credit default swaps in to defrauding Mr. and Mrs. American citizen on Main Street who was receiving a loan on their home that was negative in loan-to-value ratio and also had a greater risk than was, be rep was being reported as the mortgage-backed securities and credit default swaps were, um, were passed up the, uh, the chain. Do you have any information <clears throat> that, uh, of AIG knowing that the loan to value ratios were inflated and that the risks were being under, understated because I truly believe that for throughout this system that, it, that brought down the, the systematic mortgage crisis system in the process, uh, that there was a significant amount of defrauding going on and that people need to be held accountable. And I don't think in your system where you're bailing out, you're taking into consideration those that were bad actors. I completely agree that this country allowed, under the laws of the land, a terrible erosion in underwriting standards, a terrible amount of predation and abusive practices in mortgage lending and consumer finance. We should never have let that happen. And yeah. I hope you will join with us in trying to pass reforms that will prevent that from happening. But, but in and your bailout, you know, take that time, let, let, hold, hold a second. Let me, let me just say something to all the members. You know, right now, we have like 30 some members that still do not have an opportunity uh, uh, to question. So we're going to have to stick to the time. So uh, I want you to respect that. I mean, I noticed that a couple of situations where you're going over, but I'm saying to you that when the red light comes on, that's it. So ladies, so I want you to know, uh, we're now moving to um, uh, Mr. Quigley of Ohio. Illinois, I'm sorry. Mr. Quigley of Illinois, is he here? Ms. Capture of Ohio. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. Can you provide for the record a copy of the recusal agreement that you signed when you were at the New York Fed? Uh, I did not sign a recusal agreement. I withdrew from day-to-day -day management operations policy uses of the New York Fed, and my colleagues, both in Washington and in, and in New York, can attest to that. So there was no formal agreement? No, as I said in my testimony, what I did is I withdrew from, and this was very important to do. Again, no precedent for this, a sitting president of New York Fed being nominated to be Secretary of the Treasury. And I withdrew from, after carefully consulting my colleagues from, involvement in monetary policy decisions. I did not go to the FOMC meeting in December. And I withdrew from all decisions about these individual cases involving the financial system and from day-to-day -day management. And that was Thank you. the right thing to do at that time. Thank you uh, for clarifying that. Uh, number two, uh, a lot of people think that the president of the New York Fed works for the U.S. government. But in fact, you work for the private banks that elected you. No, that is not uh, true. Can, can you provide for the record the names of the handful of bankers on the board of the New York Fed that elected you in 2003, please? That is a matter of public record. 2003. And of, course, of course we can do that. Thank you very much. But um, um, Congresswoman, can Golden, I just say, you, what you just said was not true. I work in the public interest. Officials of the Federal Reserve work for the public interest, and they work for the government. But the people don't elect you. The, the heads of the feds around the country don't elect you. It's the individuals who sit on the board of the New York Fed that elect you. Is that correct? It's, it's that's slightly more complicated than that. The, what the Congress did in setting up the Fed is set up a system where the presidents of the regional reserve banks are elected by their board but yes. it requires the approval of the chairman of the Board of Governors in Washington for them to serve. So it is yes. a delicate balance of checks and balances, yes. and Congress designed that system. But it is largely private banks that elected you, and I would like you to provide that for the record, please. Oh, and absolutely. I can That's tell a matter you, of public record. The Cleveland Fed is not equal to the New York Fed, so I'm very interested in your answer to the record. Uh, number three. Uh, Goldman Sachs was the largest domestic recipient of funds in this AIG counterparty arrangement. Let me ask you, now as Treasury Secretary, your Chief of Staff is the gatekeeper for access to you. Could you please provide his name? His name is Mark Patterson. 
thank you. And um, for whom did he work before you selected him as your chief of staff? He worked for the president's transition team. Uh, no, before that, which Wall Street firm did and he work for? Before that, again, this is a matter of public record, and you know, you know the answer to this question. What he worked it? for Goldman Sachs, but thank you very Mark much. Patterson, you answered no, my question, no, Mr. Secretary. Now let the, me say this: Mark, the AIG no, transaction. You, you have answered the question. No, what you've you're answered doing is the question. Thank you. The AIG transaction was disturbing to many observers. Why did our government not require? the bank creditors to take the lead and bear some of the cost in any plan to stabilize AIG. You, in effect, nationalized the company and let the bank creditors off the hook. Why did you, as president of the New York Fed, not work out an arrangement to remove the London unit from the company rather than allowing the unit to infect the entire company? If we had had the types of bankruptcy procedures we have for banks, it is possible that ultimately we could have done that. And if it would have been easy and cheaper for the taxpayer for us to separate the riskiest parts of the firm from the healthy, profitable insurance companies, we would do that. And in fact, that is the core of the restructuring strategy the company is now undertaking. But that choice was not available to us at the time. If it had been possible, of course we would have done that. But because we did not have the tools that we have under bankruptcy, we did not have that choice. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Your phone logs from the subpoenaed material this committee requested, which I would like to insert in the record, show between September 14th that and November 26th. The, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The critical period when the bailout occurred and just, be, and just after September 15th when the three major rating uh, agencies downgraded uh, AIG's uh, credit rating, you made hundreds of calls. And the, the most, over 225, to Secretary Paulson, who was then Secretary of Treasury. What firm did he work for prior to his appointment as Secretary of Treasury? He worked for Goldman Sachs. He worked for Goldman Sachs. Now, Goldman Sachs, as I understand it, got the most in counterparty payments of any domestic institution. Is that true, $14 billion? I actually don't know if it's that true, but that's a matter Societe of public record. Societe Generale got the most uh, from an international firm, but Goldman Sachs was number one. Now, you made about 100 calls to Federal Chair, um, Fed Chair Ben Bernanke, but then the next highest number of calls in that period, you made 103 to a man expired, named so Dan Jester. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll end. May I just ask, what firm did he work for? He worked, for, as you know, he worked for Goldman Sachs. Thank you, and I will have additional questions um, uh, with regard to who you phoned, and we will right. place that in the record. Well, Thank you. Right. Mr. Thank you Chairman, much. can I just say one thing in, in response to this? I just want to say it's very important. Congressman, you were suggesting that the people that were involved in this were not acting in the public interest. And you were suggesting that they were working for the private interest, not the public interest. And that is not true. I would never, and I believe none of those individuals would be ever part of any decision like that. And I think these people were people of enormous integrity and experience operating under exceptional circumstances with no precedent, doing the best they could for what was in the public interest. And well, I think it's important to say for the record. I must move. I must move. I must move. Um, um, uh, a gentleman from Florida, Georgia, Congressman Westmore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Geithner, um, when did AIG, if you could just give us a date, when did AIG call and say uh, we need some money? Well, they came to Treasury and the Fed formally, I think, on that Friday. Well, Friday, which was, the I think it was the well, the calendar will show. It was the Friday in September, uh, the 11th or the 12th, I think. Okay, so it was a Friday in September, yeah. and uh, at the time there were advisors of AIG that were also advising the New York Fed. Uh, were you aware of any conflicts uh, amongst these advisors, or were there any discussions about w what kind of conflict this might bring about? Well, when AIG came to us and started to try to walk us through their financial condition, they had advisors with them, and they were also in discussion with other advisors that were not with us in the room at that time. Did when when did that dollar amount? become uh, after the discussions, uh, at what point in time did a dollar amount uh, derived at? 
You mean the initial terms yes. of the initial loan? The initial. I think that we, we reached that decision probably just on the eve of the formal agreement. Okay. I mean, we, we you know, again, we were trying to do... And what would that date have been? Do you remember that well, date? Well, it would have been, you know, the 16th was when we concluded this transaction, so it would have been just before that. Let me ask, uh, on the uh, counterparties, uh, when was that meeting uh, with the counterparties to discuss what the payment might be to them? Do you remember I, those I, dates? I do not believe there was a meeting with counterparties. What I asked my colleagues to do after looking at a range of options is to approach the counterparties individually and try to negotiate concessions. So there was no actual meeting where all the county par counterparties were in a room? I don't and, think, and I, I, I'd have to check the record. I'd be happy to check the record and get back to you. But I do not believe that my colleagues at New York Fed brought them in a room together. So when you say your colleagues, these are people that actually worked for you. They were under your direction. Absolutely. They, and they acted in my direction. Yes, sir. So you were aware of the 100% payment to the counterparties? Uh, as I've said many times, we decided, and I fully supported I the decision you, to. Just, that's a yes. That yes, you, that's a yes. You, okay. Absolutely. Now, in each one of these uh, uh, meetings with the counterparties to negotiate, we did. We weren't able to negotiate any of them down. Yeah, I mean, it's a. It's. I think it's the And I mean, these thing. were separate meetings, I guess. Yeah. I mean, did you question the negotiating skills of some of these people? No, that, I, they, uh, these were, again, these were very talented people with a lot of experience who knew how to do this. Many had done this for a living. But again, unless you can threaten default or threaten to pay below par, you understand this. You don't have any leverage in a transaction. And in fact, if we had negotiated with the threat of default like that, our concern was that would risk a, a downgrade, would have brought about the collapse of the firm. Do you know if AIG had approached any of these people about any type of uh, negotiations about what uh, a sum may have been? Because once the government gets behind it, it, it like you said, it takes away your negotiating you're, you're skill. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And I don't, I don't know, I'm not sure, but I think, that if I'm not mistaken, AIG had probably tried to do that before, before the government came in. But I, I, I can't speak to that today. But these, these people with these uh, credit default swaps, uh, they were all bright people. They knew the high risk of what they were getting involved with, did they not? I mean, Well, you know, the tragic lesson of this crisis is lots of bright people with lots of experience who, had, who should have known better made bets on the future of the country that assumed house prices would never fall. And the judgments AIG made were very similar to the mistakes the rating agencies made. But these people were making a lot of money off of this. I mean, this was a high-risk, high-reward business, right? Oh, uh, you mean the people at AIG? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's obvious that AIG deal is, is, is a bad deal for the taxpayers. And is this deal being renegotiated? Uh, and is anybody at the Treasury working with AIG to try to renegotiate this deal. Right. It is a, Congressman, it is a better deal for the taxpayer than the alternatives, and it's proving in many ways far better than many of us thought, although, as I said, the U.S. government is still exposed to substantial risk of loss. But we have a new board in place. But just answer, because yes. I got the, one more yeah. question. But no, are no, you no, read, no, are gentlemen, you no, no, gentlemen's time has expired. And of course, uh, the gentleman from Maryland is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, uh, for your testimony. Uh, as you indicated, uh, the previous administration uh, came to Congress and to the country and said we faced an extraordinary uh, circumstance that the failure to act to help rescue the financial industry would hurt people on Main Street, innocent bystanders in this process. And you took uh, the action that you did, and you properly said that we need to learn the lessons. Uh, from what happened. Uh, and the administration and the Congress have been working to do just that. Uh, here in the House, we already passed a Wall Street accountability uh, bill to try and do two things. Number one, provide the Fed and others with the tools uh, to make sure you don't have a situation where a firm becomes too big to fail in a manner that it hurts innocent people. Second, to make sure that there's a fail safe if somehow that happens. There's a pool of money raised from the banks, not from the taxpayers, to pay for the rescue. And number three, uh, 
and the President has proposed this, a fee on the biggest financial institutions, $50 billion plus in assets, to recover every penny of TARP money. And I think it's important to understand, that everyone understand, that includes every penny extended to AIG and every ex penny extended to the counterparties. Now, in the House, we passed a bill, and we had an amendment to that bill offered by Congressman Gary Peters of Michigan. I've got it right here. And it says that that fee will remain on the biggest banks, not just to capitalize a fund to be used in the event of future problems that they have to pay for their own, but it says you keep that fee on until you recover every penny. And I must say, I was surprised, I wish all our colleagues on the other side of the aisle were here, I was surprised that this very simple idea was rejected unanimously by the other side in a vote uh, we had on this. Uh, and that vote would have ensured, it passed, but that was a vote to make sure that we get back every penny that the taxpayer gave to AIG, every penny that the taxpayer gave to the counterparties. Uh, so if you could just speak to the importance of making sure, number one, we take measures to prevent this from happening in the, in the, in the future, but just as importantly, making sure we let everybody on Main Street that their money uh, that they helped sent to rescue the package will be recovered if we adopt the, the proposal in the House and the President's proposal. If Congress joins the President in adopting this proposed financial fee, then the American taxpayer will not be exposed to a penny of loss for everything the government had to do to fix this mess in AIG or everywhere else. That is not enough, though. We believe it is very important to make sure we work with Congress to put in, trace, in place constraints that would prevent this from happening again. It was a tragic failure of the country not to act sooner to limit risk taking by some of the largest institutions in the world that were operating with not enough capital and no oversight. And we have to make it clear in the future that we're going we are going to be able to let firms fail without costing the taxpayers money and without costing collateral damage. Now, uh, Mr. Van Hall, I just want to say one thing. The cost of the American people cannot be captured in the simple financial costs of the TARP. We will protect them from those costs if Congress passes this fee. But the costs of the crisis are much more damaging, cause much more damage. It can never be captured by the accounting costs of the losses under TARP. But we have a great responsibility and obligation to reform the system so they're not in that position again. And the least we can do is to make sure that the taxpayers aren't bearing the direct costs that we took in AIG, forced to take in AIG and elsewhere. It's exactly right, and it's better than that, though, uh, Congressman, because the specific transaction that is subject of so much attention appropriately in this hearing themselves are likely to earn the taxpayer a modest profit. But the government is still exposed to some risk of loss on the rest of its investments. But if we adopt this fee, the taxpayers will not bear a penny of that cost. Thank you. Me. Chair recognizes. Thank you. Just to be clear, there's $68 billion worth of loss, 30.4 uh, 30 billion associated with this AIG deal we're talking about now. So there's significant uh, loss to the taxpayers already through TARP. And so this new tax is, is simply about making up for that revenue. Uh, Mr. Mr., uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, do you support H.R. 4173, the Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act? Congressman, I'm not sure uh, of the precise uh, 
legislative amendment you're citing. No, it's not an amendment. It's a bill well, sponsored by the, Barney Frank of is Massachusetts, the, the, the is chairman. Is this the comprehensive financial reform law that passed the House in December? Yes. Yes, I support that. You support that. Okay. And, and do you support um, the, Volcker, the Volcker rule? Uh, absolutely. That, that, that what, what the president proposed is that working with the bill that passed the House, which included a provision that I think Mr. Kandrowski authored to give the government the ability to limit risk-taking by banks, that we make sure those translate into limits that will actually prevent risk-taking in the future. So it's consistent with H.R. 4173? Absolutely. The, that bill, and this is very important for people to understand, that bill included I understand. Provision, I'm on the committee. Yeah, included a provision that would give the government the ability to limit risk-taking in wasn't a way it, that helped prevent future crises. Wasn't it your legislative staff that, that uh, really worked to change the Kanjorski Amendment? Well, again, we worked closely with members of that committee on a whole range of those provisions to make sure that they met the intent. No, you're not answering my question. Oh, on that amendment, absolutely we worked with them on that amendment. You worked but, with uh, them on, on that amendment but on, on all to provisions limit it in terms of uh, its reach. No, we worked on it to limit to make sure that okay, it was going not, to work. Okay. So, in essence, uh, the Volcker rule is something you support? Yes. Okay. Um, you, you testified last month before the Joint Economic Committee, quote, I would not support reinstating glass de gaulle and I don't actually believe that the end of glass de gaulle played a significant role in the cause of this crisis. Do you still stand by that statement? Absolutely. How do you reconcile that belief with this rule that, in essence, uh, limits or forces banks to di divest uh, in hedge funds and private equity and all these other additional uh, elements that is, in essence, glass de gaulle no, uh, Well, what Glass-Siegel did was to allow banks to underwrite equities and to engage in a whole range of other types of financial activities, insurance as well, it that limited that ability, and, and to we be support, clear. And we support, as I think the bill that you cited did support, it did actually provide authority to limit a set of activities so that the access to the safety net is not subsidizing excessive risk taking. It's a simple principle. I know it's does, it, does, it, does it dial back some of the gram leach by reforms? It does do that. Okay, but it is so not what people typically refer to as Glass-Steagall. Okay. So it also says that if you engage in a certain type of, uh, if you have a certain form, meaning a bank holding company, you have to adhere to certain rules, correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay. You also testified before the Financial Services Committee, of which I said um, last year, that, finan quote, financial products and institutions should be regulated by the economic function they provide and the risks they present, not the f legal form they take. That's right. I agree with that. And and so you support a rule that says, based on a legal form you take, you have to adhere to these principles. Uh, how do you reconcile this? Uh, they're perfectly consistent, but let me state the how? basic principle again. They're perfectly okay. opposite. No, no, what we're saying is, and this is very important for people to understand, if you are operating in the financial markets, you're helping companies raise credit, raise capital. You're helping make markets work. You're providing liquidity to markets. It doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter to us or the American people, whether you called Goldman Sachs or whether you're called JP Morgan. You should be subjected to a set of constraints on capital, on leverage, and how you're funded that limit the amount of risks you take. If in addition to that, you want to own a bank and operate a bank, then there are a set of other limits that we think are good in the public interest so that, again, you can't take advantage of that access to the safety net to subsidize a set of activities that are not essential to. But basically you're saying if you just simply drop the bank holding company label, you're out from under those Absolutely regulations. not. And that would be a mistake for the country. Our, our view is... That's we, actually with the, the, the one-page rule that... No, it does not, it does not do that. It's not, not, it's not a fair reading of the rule. But, Congressman, maybe, maybe this would be helpful for me to say to you. We will work very closely with members on both sides of the aisle to make sure that this legislation results in a set of sensible constraints and risk-taking. That would be something new Gentlemen's, uh, time uh, the, has expired. over the last 13 months because you have not reached out to Republicans to be clear on the financial that, services. That is committee. not true, but again, I'm happy going forward to make sure that as we try to give these force of law, reflect them in regulation, we do so carefully with full consultation. 
The uh, gentleman's time has expired, and the chairman recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Geithner, for being here. Uh, number one, I just want to remind uh, my colleagues uh, on both sides that the whole request for the bailout that uh, had to be administered by the Treasury Department uh, was at the request of then President Bush. Uh, and second, I understand your testimony that uh, the people responsible for administering this made the best decisions they could under the circumstances. Uh, I just want to ask a couple of questions, though, uh, that start with uh, one of the statements you made, Mr. Geithner, about the effect of the actions taken has stabilized the financial system. Uh, I'm not here to argue that. The question I have is, has it helped the broad Main Street economy? And there are many uh, who believe, and I'm among them, uh, that Wall Street got out ahead of itself, uh, got in the business of self-enrichment rather than financing American jobs, American entrepreneurs, and actually transformed itself uh, in, from an entity that was about creating jobs into the greatest job-killing machine uh, in the history of the country. Uh, there's two things uh, that uh, I want to ask. One is, the, the bank fee that President Obama has endorsed, you see that is essential uh, to have the folks who were largely responsible for the financial meltdown uh, pay the cost so that it is not the taxpayers. Is that correct? Absolutely. In the reforms we proposed to the Congress back in June, at the center of that proposal was a basic principle, which in the future, governments exposed to risk of loss, right. the banks pay. In the TARP legislation you referred to, there is an explicit provision there that puts an obligation on me to propose ways to coop the costs, and we propose that in the President's financial responsibility. Right, thank, and I support that. I'm glad you're doing it. Uh, second, uh, there are a number of us, well over 60, that are supporting a tax on Wall Street bonuses. Uh, and I just want to get your opinion on this, and I'll give an example of the kind of conduct that was allowed to occur. It's been reported, as you know, in the New York Times that Goldman Sachs, had a department that bundled subprime mortgages. Uh, it then had folks who advocated to the rating agencies to give it the highest rating possible. Uh, it then went to its trusted clients uh, and sold those, and then it went to its trading desk and sold them short. Is that the type of conduct that you think should be monitored and curbed uh, by any financial regulatory uh, 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 monitor? Uh, Congressman, I believe deeply that we need tougher rules enforced more effectively and evenly to make sure that consumers and investors are not taken advantage of and the system is not so fragile, government has to step in the future and take this enormous risk of loss. Okay, let, me, let me ask you about the bonus tax because I'd be interested in this. Uh, firms like Goldman uh, receive TARP funds. Uh, they receive low interest money from the open window of the other firm made the request for. He assured us that Wall Street had learned its ways. Goldman and the other Wall Street firms uh, are back to their old ways. They've been so successful, and let's give them credit. They're good at what they do. The question is whether what they do is good for the economy and for Main Street. Uh, they've been able to set aside 140 to $160 billion. Uh, do you have an opinion for bonuses? And they could have lent that out. They could have added to their capital base. And the third choice was they could put it in their pockets, which is the one they have chosen. Uh, do you think, in view of the fact that much of their profit was made through taxpayer generosity, it would be appropriate to tax bonuses, uh, as I suggest in my legislation, at 50 percent above 50,000? Congressman, of course, I would be happy to take a careful look at that legislation and talk to you about how best to deal with that. The basic principle that we support fully is to make sure that the American taxpayer is not s exposed to a penny of losses from the actions the government had to take under the TARP authority. And I completely agree, as I said earlier, that we need to work with the Congress to make sure we bring about fundamental changes in how bankers are paid so that they are not taking risks that could imperil the economy as a whole. Doing that is hard to do right. We've tried in the past, not very successfully. It's an obligation okay. that shareholders have and boards have too, but it is the government's responsibility in the end right. to make my, sure we're My time's almost up. The, the, where we would take the money that was raised from that and put it into small business lending. And as you know, the big banks that receive TARP funds have reduced lending to American enterprise. And folks in Vermont who run businesses ask me, if those guys make so much money, how come they can't lend me any? I, I agree. And if you, I think if you saw on the paper today, 
We're, we are uh, close to proposing to the Congress that we take a large amount of the resources that we've gotten back from banks, from the large banks, and devote them to exactly that objective, to trying to make sure that small banks and small businesses have access to credit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. My time is up. And the, the chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being with us uh, today. Now, Mr. Secretary, you, are, you were involved, uh, you have said this many times, involved with the decision 15, 18 months ago relative to the initial TARP bailout. You were involved in all that. You thought it was the right decision to make at the time. Sorry, Coming to Congress decisions? asking for the $700 billion. Oh, I thought it was, it was absolutely essential at and, that point. And, the country this, had no choice. And this, this committee has had several hearings on the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and you were involved in, in that decision. We have emails that talked about, you know, you were in the loop, you knew what was going on there, you were supportive of what took place with the merger of, uh, with the acquisition of Merrill by Bank of America. Yes or no? Well, it, that is right that at that time, I was part of an effort to try to find a solution, private solution, to Merrill Lynch at that point, and I thought that that action at the time was necessary and appropriate, yes. And, and, and today you have said that, you know, you think the initial decision uh, relative to AIG and the payment to the counterparties, you think that was appropriate? Uh, you've, you've stated that strongly in your written testimony. You talk about this is in the best interest of the American people. I do. I do. Uh, we did not act to help foreign banks. We acted because the consequences of failing at that time in those circumstances would have been catastrophic to our economy, American families, and American businesses. You think it was definitely the right decision? I do. And the staff that worked for you at the New York Fed would be in agreement with that analysis, that this was so critical, this had to get done. The sky was going to fall. The world was going to end if we did not do what you decided to do relative to the counterparties and the $62 billion that was spent. Is that correct? I, I believe it is, but I think there are, to be fair to say, there were those among us involved in this, in each of the institutions involved, Washington, New York, Treasury, who were deeply troubled by that choice, were not comfortable with this. With we're it. comfortable with it, but you thought it was what you had to do at the time. I believe right? that, yes. You, and, and it was so important, as you've said in your written and uh, your testimony here this morning, your oral testimony, that you know this was critical to American families, American businesses. So I believe that. Th this it begs the, the obvious question: Why the secrecy relative to disclosure? If it's that important, sixty-two billion dollars, why in the heck not disclose it when it's happening? Since you've subsequently done that, why the secrecy? And frankly. Why weren't you involved? If it's that critical, if it's that important, why in the heck did you recuse yourself? Why weren't you involved? Well, again, just to step back a sec, when the Fed disclosed this in March of 2009, I thought it was the right thing to do. And I think reasonable people looking back at this could say, why wasn't that possible sooner? I think that's a reasonable question. Why wasn't it possible but, in November when it was all going down? Right. But uh, all I can say is what I understand it was involved in, and I was not involved in discussions about decisions about what to do with that particular transaction, the counterparties or the details. And that's because... Well, let me ask you this. Do you believe the decision that was made by the folks who work for you at the New York Fed to not disclose until March, not disclose when it was all taking place, do you support that decision? Congressman, I, as it's I said... It's a yes or I no. Have, well, I mean, you've said you're for transparency. You said this was so critical, the world was going to end, everything was going to go to, you know... Let me tell you something, I, be, I, let me, let me tell you something I deeply believe, okay? It is very hard to put yourself in shoes you did not occupy and have really a fair sense to evaluate those actions in that case. And I don't feel like I can put myself in their shoes at that time. Let me, let me, let me, let me tell you what I think happened. But, but I do believe that they acted with great integrity, care, but and judgment. Here's what, after happened. here's what happened. Mr. Lynch was on the right, right trail over here. I mean, this is a pattern. We've seen it. You came to the Congress of the United States, you said, give us $700 billion of taxpayer money. I did not money. do that. No, I'm, saying, I'm saying the government. The government came to the Congress and said, give us $700 billion. Your government, billion. your the president at that time. I understand. I mean, I'm, I didn't say Democrat or Republican. I understand the government. Give us the money. We're going to go buy the troubled assets. They didn't do that. Nine days later, 10 days later, as Mr. Lynch put it out, you were in the room when they told the nine biggest banks, we're not going to buy the troubled assets. You're going to take the target. I was, and that was, that was one of the best decisions, one of the most important decisions. But, but understand the pattern. We, the Congress of the United States was, was told one thing. Ten days later, an entirely different action was taken place. I don't, I, don't think that, I don't think that's actually correct. The, what Congress authorized... You don't the think the Congress to, passed that bill because they understood that the money that the taxpayers were going to put up was going to be used by troubled assets? Well, as I said, I can't put myself in your shoes, but I think the salient point is that the authority that the President Bush asked for 
gave my predecessor the authority to put capital in banks. And doing that, here's the pattern, Mr. Right Guyton, Mr. Secretary, here's the pattern. The government comes to the taxpayer says, we need more of your money. We need a boatload of your money. The world's going to end. We're going to do it. For, we want it for a specific purpose. Then they do it for something else. Then they come to the, the, they come to the taxpayer and say, we need more of your money, and we're, and we're, going, to, and we're going to use $62 billion, and they don't disclose to the taxpayer what's going on. Uh, this, this is why we never should have traveled down this road. This unprecedented involvement by the government in the private sector. We've seen it time. We've seen it with Gentlemen's initial time. time is expired. We've seen it with Bank of America Merrill Lynch. We've seen it now with AIG. I thank the chairman. Okay. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, Mr. Clay. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank uh, uh, Chairman Towns and Mr. Isser for conducting this uh, hearing. Um, Secretary Geithner, several economists uh, and policy make makers assert that AIG's ability to provide cash collateral to their counterparties was not relevant in designing their assistance package. Uh, what is your opinion on this claim, that it was not relevant in designing the assistance? Uh, I agree that the, what, was, what was relevant and necessary was how to restructure this firm in ways to protect the taxpayer the extent we could from the risk of greater losses. And our choice was at that point this very stark, tragic choice, which is to let AIG default or not. And we thought that default itself would have been much more expensive. Okay, let me help me and help, uh, help I guess, help the American people understand. Why was A AIG's ability to make payments to its counterparties for their toxic assets even a factor? in determining the amount of bailout money to award them? For an insurance company or any financial institution to operate, they need to be able to operate with a high credit rating. Without that, they could not borrow money to function. They could not write insurance contracts because people would not believe they would have the financial wherewithal to back those commitments. Mm. So the rating is critical. If we were to have defaulted on any of those legal contracts, AIG would have been downgraded. The counterparties would have the right to take more money and to default on and to bring about the basic collapse of the firm. So it's that stark, tragic choice. If the AIG had not paid, they would have lost the rating and the firms would have collapsed. The firm would have collapsed. If we uh, had continued to lend the money for them to make those payments, the rating would have also been jeopardy because AIG already had a lot of debt at that point. So the choice was, again, to restructure them so that we limited the drain of cash and left the taxpayer with any potential positive return on those underlying securities. So you are, are saying that the counterparties would have had a right through bankruptcy. Um, a legal right to sue to recoup that claim. Uh, okay. Did, did anyone involved in the concession negotiations ever suggest... Uh, that AIG's counterparties should not be relevant in their bailout package. Had, did, did, did that issue ever arise among the, the negotiations or, or anyone that you encountered during the negotiations? That's a complicated question, good question, but as I try to explain the testimony, the, what we were guided by, what was going to be the best way at least cost to prevent default and protect the system. And the entire system was at stake then. And no firm in the country would have been insulated fully from the collapse of the entire American financial system. And our judgment was that AIG's default would have materially raised the probability of that broader collapse. So again, our choices were terrible choices, but they came down to what was the best way to prevent that outcome on the best terms for the taxpayer. Okay, so then that gets to the point of being too big to fail. AIG's tentacles were that widespread throughout the country and the world? That there are two, it, it, it's exactly the right question. There are two things that mattered in this case. One is you had a set of firms like AIG, huge, risky, spread everywhere, 
involved in a whole range of things. And you had a world that was burning. So again, the first time since the Great Depression, you had financial systems around the world really at the brink of stopping, uh, stopping in their tracks. And it's those two conditions that are most risky. If the world had been stable, everything had been fine, we weren't on the edge of the worst recession in generations, then we could have been afforded to be completely indifferent to the fate of AIG or all those institutions. But because AIG was so large and so interconnected, and because the system was so fragile, it would have been irresponsible to take the risk that failure would have, would have uh, dramatically amplified the pressures that we're still living with today. Did, could, could you help describe what the reaction was in negotiations to the counterparties, uh, pros and cons, right. uh, as far as, as, as you know, paying counterparties? We, again, we wrestled with lots of choices, as I try to explain in my written testimony. We thought about whether it was better to default, to impose a haircut, to negotiate concessions under threat of default. We thought about keep paying and watching that money keep running out the door with the counterparty still holding the underlying assets. We thought about negotiating over time, trying to stretch it out, see if we could find a better way to solve that problem. Yes. None of those options were realistic. None of them were feasible. They were not better than the choice we chose. And again, if you, I think you look back and you take a fair reading of this, although the government is still exposed to substantial risk of loss, those losses are much lower today because of the actions we took in AIG. And this transaction, which again, people are so understandably concerned about, has put the taxpayer in a better position than if simply we'd, we kept making those payments or if we defaulted on them. Thank you, Gentlemen's Mr. Secretary. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, Congressman Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. You know, we're, we're supposed to do oversight and reform. So we're trying to get the information so that we can do the reform to make sure the next time this process comes up, we have procedures and laws that address this. And so it's real important that we identify how this went so we can try to correct it and make sure it doesn't happen again. Not only um, in um, March you knew that there was a so-called disclosure issue. But in February, you had said um, in a speech that one of the major uh, issues that you were concerned about is the lack of disclosure that was causing the American people not to trust the system. Now, I think we'll all agree that in layman's terms, with the average citizen, when they heard disclosure issue, they hear cover-up. Now, why in a system that's supposed to be open, the American people have a right to know where their money goes. Why was there even a disclosure issue? Why were we even discussing the so-called cover-up of the $160 billion where it was going um, in this process? Why was that even an issue that as soon as you knew that there was a problem there that somebody didn't clarify this? Was that your staff had basically did not inform you that there had been this cover-up, this disclosure issue? Um, and did you make that de decision, or was that decision made outside? Because AIG sent the information over. It was an internal process within the government itself that said, we're not going to disclose to the public this information. Uh, my colleagues at New York Fed, I think, have put in the public domain a very thoughtful explanation of the judgments they wrestled with and ultimately reached. And I know, and I'm confident, that their colleagues in Washington spent a huge amount of time throughout those months trying to wrestle with how to meet the understandable public interest in greater disclosure of these things. And they ultimately, I think appropriately, came to the decision that they could and should put that information in the public domain. Now, you're exactly right. I have been a great proponent of greater transparency. And the centerpiece of the strategy that we adopted to fix this mess in the financial system was to force the largest banks in the country to disclose for the first time to the public, to all investors, the scale of losses they might face in the event this recession was much more damaging than it proved to be. And that provided the basis for private investors judging who was strong, who was less strong, and deciding to put did, in capital into those institutions. So did I, you, were you told, in other words, did your staff know the cover-up was there, disclosure issue was there before you knew it was there? Was the decision to 
I, again, I don't, uh, the, the, I think, again, as the, as the record the committee's already put in the public domain shows, there were discussions that were happening about what to disclose when throughout that period of time. Were but, you involved in those discussions? As I said in my thing, I'll say, I'll say it again, I played no role in decisions about what to disclose about these transactions to these individual counterparties. Did you, did your staff make the decision not to inform you or include you in that decision making process? Yes, they did, although I made the would decision. You want, did, would you want to know, know about that or would you prefer that you didn't know about it at the time? I think in retrospect, I wish I'd known, frankly, but after November 24th, I appropriately removed myself from decisions about a whole range of policy issues the Fed was dealing with. But the people that were making those decisions in close consultation with people in Washington and with legal counsel are people of great judgment, enormous integrity, and I have enormous trust and confidence, not in just in their judgment, but in the quality decisions they made throughout that period of time. Do you feel today that at the time that they made the decision to do the cover-up, the disclosure issue, that they felt you did not want to know about it at the time? You think they made a decision I not, that... It, I do not. In, in my entire time there, I was never aware of a situation in which my colleagues sought to shield me from something consequential. I was president of the New York Fed. I was going to be accountable for decisions made on my watch. But after the 24th, for reasons that I think are fair and right for the institution, I could no longer run those day-to-day -day judgments. And I withdrew from those, and I think those were necessary. Now, and your staff decided to shield you from no, the cover-up side of it, no, too? No, I decided that I would withdraw myself from. I didn't decide this alone. I decided this in consultation with the chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and with the incoming administration to protect the institution from the unique condition that I was in then. Mr. Secretary, what date did you know that there was a cover-up, a disclosure issue? When were you informed? I only knew about these discussions about disclosure when they started to make, to be in the public domain. I actually don't know when they first rose to the attention of the Congress, but when they rose to the attention of the Congress and they were in the press, then I was aware of them. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, let me thank you, Secretary uh, Geithner, for your testimony. And of course, um, uh, we Mr. will Chairman. now. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous uh, consent that all members be allowed to put their questions in writing to the Secretary and would ask the, the Secretary if he would respond to them in writing since so many members are not able to ask their questions. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. I am I, not sure what the right point of order here is, but uh, I recognize how uh, tremendously busy the Secretary is, but I also recognize the need for this Congress. and people on both sides of the aisle to be able to ask, ask some questions. We, we've been waiting patiently here all day. I, I would hope that the chairman would uh, yeah, do let what's me, necessary. Let me say what the problem is. You know, I'm one that, as you know, and you've been here long enough now to really know me because I believe in openness and I believe in going as long as it takes. But um, Mr. Paulson has a problem with his schedule in terms of the amount of time that he would be allowed. So if we continue, then he will not be able to testify. So I think that's, that's the issue that we have to deal with. So that's the reason why we're cutting it, uh, 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 because, the, and it was agreed that this would happen. And of course, um, uh, I understand that there's several people that uh, did not have an opportunity to raise questions. Right. But what, we, what I would suggest is that you put the questions to the secretary in writing, and he will answer. Because if not, then the second witness we will not be able to hear from at all. And I think but that Mr. Would Chairman, be, if, would, I, if I could be so bold, my guess is if we were to survey or, or talk to the people on this uh, the panel, particularly people that haven't had a chance to ask questions, I think with all due respect, we'd much rather hear from the current Treasury Secretary than the past Treasury Secretary, whose schedule is probably a little bit more flexible than, than the current I, I, Treasury. I understand that, but the point of the matter is, is that we have a hearing that's been scheduled and, of course, it's been structured, and uh, I wish we could sort of stay here and uh, and allow everybody to do that. But the point is that I think in this situation, uh, but, um, Mr. Chairman, it, I, 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 I'd be delighted to yield to the gentleman again, yes. Uh, and I appreciate it, because you, you've always been so fair and very generous and, and, and personally very good to me. I, is there a way that we could vote on which direction to go on this? Well, you know, it's actually up to the chairman. But let me say what, what I'd like to do. You know, I would give 
a minute to two on this side and a minute to two on this side, and that's it. I mean, we have to move forward. I mean, we have a scheduled hearing that's uh, here looking for certain the information. We're certain, looking for certain information. In order to get the information, we need to talk to the present secretary. We need to talk to the past. And, of course, we have other that we still would, want would to the gentleman Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I join with you in that unanimous consent for two additional minutes per side equally divided. Right. Uh, reserving the right to object. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say that any member of this committee has the ability to submit questions in writing. Sure. Mr. Geithner, in, a, in response to an earlier question, said that, in, you know, in the interest of time, that he would be willing to answer questions in writing. Is that not true, Mr. Geithner? Uh, absolutely, of course. Okay, so yeah. Mr. Chairman, anybody who wouldn't get a chance to ask a question here can still put it in writing. Yeah. I, res I withdraw any objection. Right. Let me just say that uh, we will go two, two on this side, two on that side, Mr. Chairman. but a minute. Remember, Mr. Yes. Chairman, reserving the right to object. Yeah. Yeah. What, I mean, I don't know what you're objecting to. If you'll recognize me, uh, re unanimous re consent request for two minutes each. I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman, to forego my time with Secretary Paulson to ask Secretary Kite. Well, I, I wish we could operate that way, but, the, uh, you know, when, when you have hearings that are structured, they're not structured in the fact that someone would give up their time. You know, I mean, that, that's not the way we do it. So the point of the matter is, is that we either accept the two minutes on the side uh, or we move forward. Okay? So that, that's, that, that's what's on the table. So two minutes on this side, two minutes on that side. Okay, uh, you, you want to okay, designate the... I withdraw my objection. Right we we'll designate the two on this side... Uh, Mr. Connolly, you have a minute to raise one question with the secretary. Mr. Connolly from Virginia. And then our two gentlemen. Okay. Are you ready to go? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank Recognize you. Recognize for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Geithner, uh, we only have one minute. Uh, and, and one has the yeah, sense that minute. some people in this room uh, perhaps want to rewrite history. Uh, and I understand, given the history, why they might want to do that. In your opening statement, you talked about the need for financial regulatory reform. Could you expand on why we need that, particularly when it comes to regulating that which was resisted from regulation in the past, like derivatives and credit default swaps? I, I, I don't think it's a hard case to make. I think you just have to look at the wreckage caused by the crisis to say the system failed dramatically. And again, the two most simple failures that happened is people were allowed to take risk without constraints. We let a system operate where institutions that were huge and consequential operated with no adult supervision, with no constraints, and they brought the country to the edge of collapse. Let me just say one thing in common with the following firms. Fannie and Freddie, the largest investment banks in the country, AIG, a set of specialized insurance companies, a whole range of consumer finance companies, a bunch of threats, they all had one thing in common, which they were not subject to a set of sensible rules to constrain the risk they had to take. What we propose in financial reform is to change that. It's a simple imperative. That's, a not, that's not enough, though, because people will make mistakes in the future. So we need to make sure when they make those mistakes that we can let them fail, and failure can happen without catastrophic damage. We need to be able to contain the damage, isolate it, draw a line around it, put them out of their misery, put them out of existence, without the taxpayer being exposed. And we need to make sure that we don't have a system where the taxpayer is exposed to the risk of loss or that investors and creditors live with the expectation the government will be there again. And again, that's something that is a, I think we all have a huge obligation responsibility. It was the laws of the land that allowed that to happen. The laws of the land that made it impossible for the government to act. And I think we need to work together to change that. I thank the gentleman and I thank the chairman for his consideration. Thank, thank you very much. I now recognize Mr. Fortenberry for thank one you. minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. Uh, for the last year and a half, we've been privatizing, privatizing profits and socializing risk. And if the optics on the AIG aren't bad enough, the counterparties to the AIG uh, who received 100 percent parity for their liabilities, seven of the ten, top ten are foreign firms. So CAT, General was the top recipient of $16.5 billion of American taxpayer bailouts, in effect, followed by Goldman Sachs. Now, you said this economy is in crisis. This year, Goldman Sachs will give $16 billion of bonus payments, about $500,000 per employee. This is really difficult to understand why there wasn't, at first, a desire to have transparency uh, in regards to counterparty transactions. Would you address that, please? 
Oh, I, as I, I'm not sure if you were here for the prior conversation. I've been here the entire time, okay. except for but, votes. Uh, but again, the actions we took were necessary in the public interest, better than the alternatives, to help prevent catastrophic damage. And if you are outraged, as I think you should be, about how the economy and our system was in this mess, I hope you will join with us in trying to work to make sure it doesn't happen in the future. This is not something that should be Republican or Democrat. There is a deep, I think, moral obligation we have to okay. try to make sure that we put in place reforms that will prevent this from happening again. If the government had done that sooner, this would have been less damaging. And a critical part of the failure was we ran a country, largest economy in the world, largest financial system in the world, without having the kind of bankruptcy type powers we had for banks for decades. Let's try to and do that on a bipartisan basis, sir, please. But you understand why the Gen I'm disposes sorry, the gentleman's so time has expired. Thank and you. now I recognize the gentleman from uh, Illinois, Congressman Davis, for one minute. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Let me just ask. If you had to do it again, to do it all over, would you change any of the decisions that you made in the fall of 2008 to rescue AIG and pay the counterparties par? Congressman, I, again, as I, I think about this a lot. And one of the great strengths of our country is, again, people will be able to look back and come to their own judgment whether we made the best choices. But I am very confident that we made the best of a set of terrible choices, that there were no better alternatives. We did not have the option of bankruptcy. We did not have the option of default. We did not have the option of selective haircuts. It would have been catastrophic to let the institution fail. We didn't rescue AIG. We intervened so that we could dismember it safely without it wrecking the country and the system. I think the big mistakes we made as a country and they are mistakes that we have to reflect on deeply for a long time, were why the government didn't act sooner to limit risk-taking, why the government did provide competent authorities the ability to contain risk-taking, and why didn't we did have in place the kind of tools we've had for a long time for banks to try to deal with these kind of failures. I think those were tragic mistakes. The lesson of financial crises is if you don't act sooner, Things get to the point where they can cause catastrophic damage. And if you let it, if you stand back and hope it'll burn itself out, correct itself, it'll be a good, healthy adjustment for the economy, that can cause enormous damage. And it'll cause enormous damage not just to the American lives and people we'll be living with for a long time, but to the revenue base of the country. Right. Deeply impairs the capacity for government to do things that are necessary, like that we need resources for protect national security, make sure teachers can be in the schools. These things are deeply connected. If you stand back and try to hope the market will fix itself, you court catastrophe. I hope we learn that lesson. should never happen again. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. And I recognize the gentleman uh, from Utah, Mr. Chaffee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Secretary. I was going to ask about the 18 phone calls you made to Rahm Emanuel more than any other member of Congress. But we'll have to save that for another day. What I would like to ask you about is this idea that they, they're going to make profits. Um, I, I'm going to read two statements and ask you a question from Neil Borofsky's uh, testimony that's, that's coming up. First one is, quote, on, on page 13, Treasury's own TARP fun financial statement estimates that Treasury will not be made whole, but is rather projected to lose more than $30 billion on its AIG investments. Second quote later in the same paragraph, narrowly asserting that taxpayers will be, quote, made whole, end quote, on Maiden Lane 3, just one part of the AOG counterparty transactions, without mentioning the huge losses Treasury expects to suffer on other inextricably linked parts of the very same transactions is simply unacceptable. The American people deserve better. So my question, in, in hoping that you could respond to those two statements is, when you refer to profits from the AIG counterparty bailout, are you counting the cost of the $35 billion in cash AIG handed over to counterparties, uh, to the counterparties, or just the $27 billion they got directly from the New York Fed? Uh, Congressman, I think that uh, Mr. Borowski and I actually agree on this, and I said in my statement, I was very clear. Mm -hmm. The government is still exposed to substantial risk of loss on its investments in AIG. The Federal Reserve, in this transaction, I think more generally, is unlikely to face any loss. That is a good thing. We should welcome that. 
but the government is still exposed to risk of loss. We don't know how large those losses will be. What we refer to is not a projection. It's just an estimate based on current market prices. But the really important thing, and I hope you will join us in this, is if we adopt this res financial responsibility fee, the taxpayer will not bear a penny of the burden for sounds what like we did Sounds like a tax to me. It doesn't sound, tarp. sounds like a tax to me. And that, well, you, you can call it what you want, but what it is is a simple I call it principle. a tax, I think, and I, I wish think, you would, too. I'd call it what it is. Well, you know, in the, again, in the law that Congress passed authorizing these actions, mm -hmm. Congress required the Secretary of Treasury to propose a way to make sure taxpayers are held harmless. We did that. I hope you will join us in supporting that, because there is no reason yeah. why the American taxpayers should be exposed to a penny of loss in what we did in AIG. We can make that possible. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, uh, for your testimony. Of course, and now uh, you may be excused. Now we call upon our second panel. We got a list. Yeah, you, if you have not had a chance to question. The second witness, the second witness for today's hearing is former Treasury Secretary under the Bush administration, uh, Secretary Henry Paulson. Uh, Mr. Paulson, please uh, stand as I administer the oath. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. I, I do. Right. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that he answered in the affirmative. I'll ask the witness to summarize his testimony in five minutes, and of course, we know the procedure. You know, the yellow light means you have a minute left, and the red light means stop, and, and then, of course, we will have time to uh, raise questions with you. You know the procedure. You've been through this quite a few times, so uh, good to have you back. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> thank you, and I will uh, go through this quickly. Uh, first of all, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and distinguished members of the committee, I appreciate the invitation to testify before this committee. I was Secretary of the Treasury in 2008. In that role, I had the privilege to work with many talented men and women in government and the private sector who labored to pull our nation back from the brink of disaster. The decision to rescue AIG was correct, and I strongly supported it. An AIG failure would have been devastating to the financial system and to the economy. Today's hearing relates to payments to AIG's credit default swap counterparties. I was not involved in any of the decisions made with respect to those payments, nor was I involved in any of the decisions about AIG's public disclosure of those payments. Those matters were handled by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the Federal Reserve Board. They sought to make appropriate decisions on those matters, and I am confident that this review will show that they did. I have limited knowledge on the topics of immediate interest to the committee, but I will share the following observations. The rescue of AIG was necessary, and I believe that we in the government who acted to rescue it, including Secretary Geithner, Chairman Bernanke, and me, acted properly and in the best interest of our country. The reasons the rescue of AIG was necessary are well worth examining. I believe they are representative of the causes of other aspects of the crisis and indicate where regulatory reform is necessary. There are three reasons we needed to save AIG that stand out in my mind. First, AIG was incredibly large and interconnected. It had $1 trillion balance sheet 
a massive derivatives business that connected it to hundreds of financial institutions, businesses, and governments, tens of millions of life insurance customers, and tens of billions of dollars of contracts guaranteeing the retirement savings of individuals. If AIG collapsed, it would have buckled our financial system and wrought economic havoc on the lives of millions of our citizens. Second, AIG was seriously underregulated. Although many of AIG's subsidiaries, including its insurance companies, were subject to varying levels of regulation, the parent entity was, for all practical purposes, an unregulated holding company. Consequently, there was no single regulator with a complete picture of AIG or a comprehensive understanding of how it was run. It was not until AIG started to fail that regulators began to understand how badly managed it had been and how much the toxic aspects of parts of its business had infected otherwise healthy parts. Third, AIG could not be effectively wound down. Unlike failed depository institutions, which can be taken over by the FDIC with little or no harm to depositors, or the GSEs, which were seamlessly placed into conservatorship by Treasury and the Federal Housing Finance Agency, there was and is no resolution authority available to wind down a failing institution like AIG. The only option is bankruptcy a process that is simply not capable of protecting the millions of Americans whose finances are intertwined with AIG's. The government rescue of AIG in the fall of 2008 was directly shaped by these realities. We had to protect the economy and the finances of millions of Americans. We could not have anticipated the magnitude of AIG's problems, and we had no way of letting it fail without disastrous collateral consequences. We had to intervene, and I'm thankful we did. I do not mean to say that I'm happy we needed to intervene. Taxpayer money should not have to be spent to save a misguided and mismanaged enterprise. But the fundamental problem lies not in how we intervened, but why we needed to intervene. We need to modernize our regulatory structure by creating a systemic, systemic risk regulator and resolution authority so any large firm that fails can be liquidated without destabilizing the system. Large financial institutions in this country will always play a role that is essential to our economic growth, but they must only be permitted to grow and interconnect throughout our economy under careful oversight and with a mechanism for allowing those connections to be broken safely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you um, uh, very much for your, your testimony. Uh, let me say that you were deeply and aggressively involved in dealing with the financial crisis. And uh, uh, we saw that with AIG, of course, and Bank of America, and, and with the TARP. My question is, why did you sit on the sideline uh, and, and not use your considerable influence to call the CEOs of the uh, counterparties and to get them to take a haircut? I mean, why wouldn't you do that? I mean, you you a person that was uh, very influential in all of this, you know, uh, uh, and I can understand why you wouldn't do that. Well, M Mr. Chairman, as you indicated, I had no involvement uh, at all in the, uh, the the payment to the counterparties, no involvement whatsoever. Now, to, to explain this, we worked very collaboratively during during the crisis. There was a lot going on, uh, coming at us from all sides, and whichever agency had the authorities took responsibility for execution. And this was clearly a case. It was a Federal Reserve loan. They had the authorities to make it and administer it and they had the technical expertise to, uh, uh, to, do, to do the restructuring. But, you know, uh, I just see it a little strange that you would sit on the sideline and not help the American people in terms of, uh, I mean, you were so involved 
in the early stages and you were, I mean, and throughout the process yeah, and then chairman. to sit on the sideline at a time like this, I, I, I just find Mr. that. Mr. Chairman, anybody that knows me know I was not sitting on the sideline. I was, I, I was not involved in this issue, but I was involved in many other issues every single day of the week. Uh, and including weekends, so I, I didn't. Spend why not? I mean, why wouldn't you be involved in this? Well, because this was a Federal Reserve loan. They had the authority. They had the technical expertise, and and I, was, and I said in my testimony, I have great confidence in the the professionalism, professionalism, the integrity, the motives, the abilities of the people that were that were handling this. So this was their job to handle, and I was working on many other things which were in my bailiwick. Let me ask another question then. Um, why wouldn't you um, uh, let AIG go into bankruptcy? Why, why not? Uh, if, if AIG had failed, this was a huge financial organization, interconnections throughout the economy, if it had failed with the system as fragile as it was, I believe it would have taken down Could the whole... Talk directly into the microphone. They're having problems I believe problems it would have taken you. down the whole financial system and our economy. It would have been a disaster. Today, after all the actions that have been taken by the U.S. government, we still have this terrible 10% unemployment level. I believe that if the system had come down and failed, we could easily have had unemployment reaching or exceeding the 25% level we had in the Great Depression. We would have lost uh, many additional billions of dollars in uh, American savings. Uh, the home prices would be much lower than they are today. So as unattractive as the government rescue of AIG was, and none of us that supported that found that to be an attractive or desirable option. It was just much, much better than the alternative, which would have been economic disaster in this country. Right. Um, I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from California, the ranking member. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that we go to the members who did not have an opportunity in the first round. And, and Mr. Chairman, I would also ask us one thing. Will you agree, since the Secretary said he would answer our questions, to join with me in ensuring that all questions are answered or that we bring the uh, Secretary back, uh, assuming he does not answer them for some reason? So ordered. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lukermeyer would be next to those waiting. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Paulson, um, one of the things that we're looking into here with the AIG, can you explain to me, is AIG and their financial products, was, was that a subsidiary of AIG or was that uh, part of their business model? I, I believe it was part of the, uh, the, the business model. It wasn't a separate entity that was separately capitalized? It was, I, it was, it, it was clearly... It was clearly at the, at the holding company, and it was it was a uh, it was part of it, was it, part, makes it, was, it wasn't part of an insurance business model, but it was sure part of the uh, of the company's business strategy. Because it makes a big difference if it's not part of the insurance part of the company, and it's a subsidiary that's separately capitalized. You can let that thing go down, and it doesn't impact the insurance part of it, which I believe it was. Is that not correct? Well, I would say this to you: this com company was so big and intertwined that it was, if, if there was any way that the people who were working on this could have found a way to just hive off and let one small part of the company uh, it, go with down. With the gentleman suspend, uh, Mr. Paulson, excuse me, uh, we want to make sure that members right. can hear your testimony. And, you know, the, it's okay. amazing with so much money in this federal government, we don't have a better sound system, but okay. I'm going to need you to speak as closely to that mic as you can, so everyone okay. can hear you. Thank you. You make so, it. So, to, to just be to, to just be clear, there, there was no way to, to, to hive off and and handle the situation uh, differently. There was a very few days to act to prevent bankruptcy, with no wind down p powers to l let let this company be liquidated and, and avoid bankruptcy. Well, with all due respect, if it's a separate entity, a subsidiary, it could go down and the rest of it could still stand I, on its own, sir. But uh, I, I, that being I, I another, let me, let me move on here with another question very quickly. 
Um, in in, in uh, Secretary Geithner's uh, testimony, he indicated that he felt that contractually uh, the, the contracts that we had, with the, the investments that were made by foreign banks into AIG that they were involved with, need to be uh, adhered to and, 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 uh, and worked with. Was, was, the, was the government a part of those contracts? I, as I've said in, in my testimony, I had no involvement with, with the payment of any of those contracts. I just was not involved in so, that matter. So the government wasn't a party of the contracts then? But <coughs> the government wasn't a party of the again, contracts. Again, this was, this was not something that I was directly involved in. I've said that I very much trust the motives and the abilities and the judgments of the people that made those decisions. But, but I wasn't party to them, and I, I, I can't, uh, I can't okay. answer that question. Well, that's one of the frustrations, and I appreciate your, your candor, but it's my frustration with the chair and that we don't get full testimony and be able to get all the questions answered, ask, ask and then answer, so we can come to you with, with what we feel is good information to be able to get some, some good back and forth here. So I apologize to you. Let me go, move on to something else. I know right now we're looking at, and the President's proposed some uh, too big to fail uh, sort of uh, strategies to try and uh, address the issue of too big to fail. Uh, where, where are you in this de debate? What do you think about the proposal that's on the table right now, sir? When I was uh, Secretary of the Treasury, I put out a regulatory blueprint, and I still believe that that, that, that is the way to go. I am uh, very, uh, I think it's essential that we have wind down authorities, resolution authorities, so that any financial organization, no matter how big, can be liquidated outside of the bankruptcy process without taking down the rest of the economy. And so I think that is essential, and there are, <coughs> there are some uh, parts uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the proposals that are up here being debated by Congress, which are the same as in the regulatory blueprint we put forward. A big one being the systemic risk regulator, and I'm uh, strongly in favor of a systemic risk regulator. Do you, do you believe that we need to take the the, the uh, risk uh, investments that are part of some of many of the big banks right now and take them off the books and set up a separate subsidiary for this, so we can I, sort of have go back to a glass steagall firewall there? I th th that is not my re recommendation. I, I I believe that when you look at the at the crisis, what I saw in the crisis was it, it was across a number of financial types of financial institutions, and the the excess of risk taking I saw was not limited to one business activity. It was much broader than that, and I think we need a broader approach. And so again, what I favor is a systemic risk regulator and wind down authorities is the way I would handle that. Well, one of the problems I have with that, with what you're suggesting, sir, is that suddenly now we have the taxpayers through FDIC insurance on the hook for these risk takers who are out here. Uh, I think it's important that we take these things off the books and have a separate sir that if it goes down, it goes down and the, and, the F, and the banks and the insurance funds and the taxpayers as a whole are not on the hook for all this. I think it's very important we go down that road because I think what you've done with, with AIG is suddenly use the federal government as the official underwriter of all investments in the world. If we're underwriting foreign contracts, investments, what have we done? We've gone down that road. And I, I'm, I appreciate your comments, and I yield Gen back to the chair. Gentlemen's time's expired. Uh, chair, uh, in keeping with the uh, uh, necessity of making sure the members who do not ask questions in the last round are given a chance to go first, uh, we recognize Mr. Tierney. Thank you for your patience, and you may proceed for five thank minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Paulson, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, so you were in full agreement with not allowing AIG to go bankrupt? Absolutely. Okay. So I, I think back home people don't know where to give the credit for this, so I, I want to make sure we give credit where credit's due if that was a good decision. Uh, you know, people see Mr. Geithner uh, now as treasurer, and I think that the decisions were all made by him when he was treasurer. In fact, these were decisions made in 2008. Uh, you were uh, President Bush's Secretary of the Treasury, correct? Absolutely. And, and uh, Mr. Bernanke was the uh, head of the Fed. And then, of course, we had the New York Federal Reserve Board participating in these conversations as well. So that's you know, pretty much the group that decided that uh, they should give $85 billion in September to AIG. Those are mostly the participants, am I right? Yeah, we were, as I said in my testimony, I very much supported that, uh, right. that rescue. Okay, and then in November, uh, it was the same group, 
Uh, you as uh, President Bush's Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Bernanke, and the New York Fed decided to give additional funds to AIG, some of which were used to pay uh, the counterparties to the contracts, right? Yes. In, in November, uh, in the TARP, we made a, a, a $40 billion capital investment, and then the Fed put some additional money in to uh, uh, which was uh, which was used uh, for the contracts. Well, and just so we're clear, we're giving credit here. The TARP, the seven hundred billion dollars of TARP, in fact, was uh, during your term as Secretary of Treasury oh, under yeah, President I'm not, Bush. I'm, I, I'm I'm proud of that. So okay, that's, and that was your idea, was it? The TARP. And that was there was a number of our ideas, but yes, and that's something I'm proud of, and it's something that was very necessary. And the eighty-five billion dollars uh, that was loaned to AIG was not appropriated by Congress. Nobody asked Congress to make a vote on that. Am I right? No, that was a decision taken by the Fed with the support of. And what money? What source of money did they use to get that 85 billion? Uh, they, they, they they use their funds. And their funds emanate from where? From the U.S. government. What were they fees from other banks? Were they uh, they come from your Treasury? Where do they come? They they come from the the, the the Fed. Obviously, can print money. Okay, and. Did they take money that they had from fees charged to member banks, or did they print money to accommodate this $85 billion? You, you, you'd have to ask the Fed that. All right. You're not aware during any discussions where I, that was? I'd like them to, to answer that question. Well, I, you may not like to answer the question, no, sir, but I, if you know the information, I'm asking I you to share say, with us what, I, you are, and what is your best understanding of where my, that money my, came my, from. My best understanding is all dollars are green, so those are ultimately taxpayer dollars. And that was why we're painfully aware that their taxpayer the, the, dollars the, the, are. That, that, that was why the the treasury was supportive, and right. we, uh, we we were very supportive of that transaction. Okay. We all understand that the full faith and, and uh, yeah. promise comes to the government on that. The taxpayer dollars were painfully aware, but I'm asking you whether, since they didn't come to Congress for an appropriation, whether the 85 billion dollars came from fees charged to member banks was newly printed money or some combination of the both? It, 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 I don't believe it came from uh, fees charged from member banks. All right. Thank you. Uh, now, we got to the point where a decision had to be made about whether or not to let AIG go bankrupt. Uh, later, it came to a point whether or not to pay the, the uh, counterparties 100 percent uh, on those contracts or not. But once the decision made not to let them go bankrupt, you lost any leverage, really, to argue uh, in terms of getting, uh, to being able to pay less than 100 percent. Is that a fair statement? As I said, I didn't uh, participate in the uh, in, in those decisions r regarding well, payment, and I, I also said we didn't have the wind down powers. Okay, but you know, you were involved with I, I think I forget how many uh, Congressman Captors said that there were phone calls between the New York Fed and you. Some uh, I yield 225. 225 telephone conversations between the head of the New York Fed and you during this period of time. So I. I think we might be fair in assuming that you were discussing some of these matters. Well, we had we had many matters to discuss, and this was one uh, of them, over right? a range of things. And and the matters we discussed, we clearly discussed the rescue. Uh, as I said, I did not have involvement and was not. Here's, here's my final question. I need your help with this. Most people at home hear people draw the conclusion that not to allow AIG to go into bankruptcy would have been devastating because the consequences would have been severe. It would be enormously helpful if you could put yourself in the position of the uh, local uh, bookkeeper for a, a medical firm or housekeeper or lawyer or teacher's aide. How specifically would that individual have been harmed if you had not made the decision to not allow AIG to go bankrupt? What would have been the consequence to them? And, and, and that's the right question, Congressman, because they were the real victims. They would have lost jobs. Would have lost. But how? How would that have happened? To show me from the time you made the decision what would have spiraled down to affect their lives. Well, uh, the gentleman's time has expired, uh, but the witness uh, w would be pleased to answer his question, I hope. Uh, okay. What I believe, we, we were at, at, at around the time of the AIG rescue, when markets were frozen, we had a situation in this country where even Blue chip industrial companies were having trouble financing. I knew we were on the brink. That if AIG had gone down, I believe that we would have had a situation where Main Street companies, industrial companies of all size, would not have been able to raise money for their basic f funding. 
and they wouldn't have been able to pay their employees. They would have had to let them go. Employees wouldn't have paid their bills. This would have rippled through the economy. The Today, Congressman, we have, after everything that was done, all the resources, we have 10% unemployment. I believe we easily would have had 25% unemployment. Today, we have uh, home prices that have dropped precipitously in some parts of the country. Home prices would have gone much lower. AIG guaranteed tens of billions of dollars of savings for uh, retirement savings for Americans. There would have been great losses. This would have been an economic nightmare. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Thank you, no, Chair recognizes Mr. Souter. Thank you. I've got a variation of the same uh, question you were just going through because one of the, the problems we have is, is that it appears that AIG was treated differently than other uh, companies throughout this whole thing in this sense, that the holders of the debt were paid at par, uh, which means that, the, the, in effect, uh, the banks got 100 percent, but, for example, GM creditors, uh, small businesses all across America uh, and in other uh, uh, companies that were let go, they got 10 cents on the dollar, 30 cents on the dollar, and it's part of a, a fact, but a, a perception that that was unfair, that Wall Street was covered but Main Street wasn't in, in debt. Now, AIG was different in what sense? Now, I know, uh, it, it was it 120 separate finance companies and 80 insurance, or is that flip, something like that? In other words, it was a collection, it wasn't one. It was a big one. complex collection of companies, correct in that if the insurance divisions were separated and, and came under state, part of the argument is state regulation, that they were so intertwined with the finance. But uh, let me ask one other question before we get into details of that. You said bankruptcy wasn't an option, um, but it also meant that did you try to put pressure on the people who held the debt to write down some of their debt, or did, once you made the statement we weren't going to let it fail, were they just playing hardball and saying we weren't going to write down anything, why didn't they get the same pressure that GM suppliers had and everybody else to write down their debt? As I've said, and this isn't me trying to suggest anything was done wrong, I had nothing to do with that. So I, I, I was not involved in the negotiation, I was not involved in anything surrounding those payments. But I will explain one thing to you, which is fundamental for, for you to understand, is the government, we have an antiquated regulatory system and a lack of the necessary authorities. And so if there was a bank, there, was a, there is a way to wind that down. But this was, this was a non-bank, and, Just, and there was- I understand that. Let me read There's no way to avoid Let me it. ask you, there's no way except the threat of real bankruptcy, and that if you're a bank, and think you can negotiate at par and get a full percent and you don't have a threat of bankruptcy, the question is, is did anybody threaten them? Did anybody say that if we're not going to, I mean, did we in effect yield the debate at the beginning, they played hardball and we had no way to do it, uh, that uh, if in effect uh, you would have to say, hey, we can cover the insurance people, but the finance side over here, you better negotiate down or that side will go bankrupt and then you'd wind up probably having to do what we did in TARP anyway, which is put cap to try to cover the fact that they've just had to put more money in the banking system, but not necessarily at par. As I said, uh, Congressman, I didn't, uh, as I said, I, I, I wasn't involved in that. So I, I can't You're comment. saying the New York Fed I, I, I can't comment beyond what I said. That at, at some, when, when you got involved, once TARP w was there, the decision was already made that it wasn't going to go bankrupt. Is that correct? When, when I, when I well, for first of all, I was involved in supporting the initial rescue, and then... So you were involved. Just a second. You were involved, and did yeah, you so advise I, the Fed to try to get what they could and not do well, pay at well, par? What the Fed, the, the initial rescue was not the, it was not when they dealt with the, the payment to counterparties. So I was supported the Fed on the initial loan, and then uh, l later in... November, the situation had deteriorated to the point, and values in insurance businesses all around the world had deteriorated to the point that this was a company that would go down without capital. And so now we had capital, and, and 
my team and I participated in, in making that decision, made the decision to put $40 billion of equity into AIG. Uh, the, the problem that, that I have is it appears to me that AIG was treated differently so, so much so, even listening to that, it's like, well, we, we, we put some money in initially, and then we put more money in because they couldn't fail, where in the other, everything from Citibank to Merrill Lynch to everything else, there were processes where there were conditions on money coming in, where there were uh, guidelines on money coming in, and they used the leverage of the threat of bankruptcy to, to do that. Then, then in this case, it appears that it was different, and it partly is that the creditors are different. For, furthermore, the, the, uh, that some of the critical information here was withheld from being uh, public at, at the request of the New York Fed, that had that been public, people would have seen it. And there was an attempt to even keep it quieter because that was critical, that information, to understand what was going on behind. And it's, it, that, that it is extremely frustrating to all of us on this committee, and you can hear it in different types of questions, uh, about how this came to be. And we, the, the I don't think there's been a, a compelling case made that AIG is unique. Has expired. Thank you. But I would say that if Mr. Paulson wants to respond uh, to the gentleman, you may do so. And if not, we'll go to the next I question. No response, okay. I thank the gentleman. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Kanjorski. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Welcome back, Mr. Paulson. You, you really miss Washington, I assume. Uh, <laughs> you can't guess how much. <laughs> I, I, those, I, I, I listened to the comments of the Secretary, your, your successor, and now you, and I'm listening to the members' questions and how much memory is lost in a year or 14 months from those fateful days in September and October, which all of us hope we never relive, but in fact were very much significantly different than today, and the coolness of being able to answer. One of the questions I was particularly interested in, because I was very involved at that time with AIG and what was happening from my aspect of having some jurisdiction over insurance, is that, as I understand it, because of fa uh, financial products in London was without assets and had a tremendous involvement in counterparty positions of about $2.8 trillion and whose counterparty positions were starting to fail and they had to honor them, their initial internal decision of AIG was to use the assets of the world's largest insurance company and they sought permission and uh, it was pending and finally approved by their regulator, the state of New York, to take assets out of the insurance uh, companies, about $30 billion, and use those assets to, to cover their exposed counterparty positions. Uh, now, if that had happened at that time, those insurance companies would have failed because their assets would have been taken, converted, and they wouldn't have been enough to cover the counterparty position, so it would have wiped out the insurance companies, which in turn would have affected every insurance holder in the country that was involved with AIG at the time and would have been a catastrophic collapse of the insurance industry, and not, notwithstanding the counterparty and, and derivative position. Now, luckily, uh, the regulator in the state of New York didn't grant his permission to use that $30 million until much later when it was futile. And at that point, the losses on the counterparty positions, I think, rose to $55 billion and were climbing on a daily basis. And that's when the infusion of funds that you talk about adding equity to AIG or the capacity through the use of government funds to cover those counterparty losses. They didn't cover all those losses, and subsequently, within probably 30 days, another huge amount of money was infused into AIG's various corporate structures to get some st stability. And not that I could say nothing has changed from that, but that was the, in, uh, the significant circumstances in this uh, month or two months after September 18th that everybody was faced with. But as I understand it, the Federal Reserve was, was the person with the checkbook under the instance, under 313 powers. They were just plugging that money in. And it wasn't a decision made at the Secretary's level of Treasury or at the presidential level. It was a Federal Reserve regulator level who was making that decision. And I dare say regulator not for AIG, but regulator that had regulation over some of the largest banking institutions in the world 
that if they had been not, if their counterparty positions were in honor, they would have immediately collapsed. And that's what we were calling the meltdown. Everything was going to implode. And, and, and you had to stop it at the headwaters, not wait until it got out into, to the little dams out of the stream. Is that relatively the correct position? I would say without signing off on every fact you mentioned, I would say you've got it in the sense that there was, this was a very complex company and there was, if, if it had gone into bankruptcy, it would have been a huge mess and it would have, it would have uh, one part of the company would have contaminated the other and it would have rippled through the U.S. economy and, and the result would have been absolute disaster. Mr. Chairman, I know there are other questioners. I've had the opportunity to ask some today, so I yield back the balance of my time. I uh, thank the gentleman for his courtesy. Uh, before uh, I, I recognize uh, Mr. Uh, Bacchus, I want to take the liberty as chair to um, recognize students from Padua French Franciscan High School in Parma, Ohio, or visiting uh, the Capitol and uh, seeing their government at work right here. So. Welcome, uh, you and your teacher, and we're pleased that you stopped by for a visit. Thank you. The uh, chair recognizes Mr. Barkas of Alabama. Uh, welcome, former secretary. Uh, secretary Paulson, um, March 2009, you know, September, uh, March 16th was when uh, AIG was, the payments were made to AIG or, or guaranteed. Um, leading up to that, you were, you participated in uh, several meetings uh, about AIG. Is that correct? Prior to March of of 2009. Prior to March, yeah, I had a number of meetings uh, about AIG as we were putting in capital. I know one of the meetings. Uh, I'm looking at March 24th. My questioning of, of Mr. Geithner. He mentions uh, Secretary Geithner that you, uh, he said that uh, he and you met with AIG to discuss Lehman's failure. Discuss what? Uh, September 14th. Now that was two days before. Oh, oh yeah, yes. You're saying, so I, I, you were talking about 2009, right. March, and I think you're talking about September 14th, uh, 2008. That's right, okay, all right. I, and I, I stand corrected, I am. Uh, that discussion, uh, but you, you participated in some of the discussions about AIG and their financial condition leading up to... Yes, and uh, the, 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 the weekend of September 13th and 14th was a weekend when we were uh, uh, had financial institutions together working to come up with a solution to prevent the failure of Lehman. And it was that weekend that we learned also about AIG, and I had uh, two meetings over the course of that weekend at the New York Fed with Tim Geithner, with, with uh, officials from AIG. Right. Uh, in those meetings, was there any discussion of, of uh, asking the counterparties to take less than 100 percent? Was there any discussion of what? Any discussion of the counterparties taking less than 100 percent? I, I sir, sure don't recall any. We were talking about the financial problems that, uh, that, uh, that, that AIG had, and it was clearly, it, they clearly had issues with counterparties. Right. What? what? Uh, they, they clearly had issues with counterparties because that was the, the, the crux of the issue, was uh, what was a ratings, a potential uh, uh, ratings downgrade, which would cause uh, the company to have to post collateral, and so and so that would lead to uh, to dispute. So, so their obligations to the counterparties was discussed. Well, well, obviously that was the uh, the, the 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 issue. Any 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 institution that is facing failure sure. is, is going to have an issue with paying uh, paying creditors. Sure. I'm not. Uh, you know, once that intervention occurred, then the, the really the taxpayers, the U.S. government, owned 79.8 percent of AIG, uh, more or less. I guess is that's correct, isn't it? Yep. Uh, that being the case, I, I see in this same 
2009, now this is skipping forward to March of 2009, uh, Secretary Geithner uh, emailed William Dudley and Edward Quince and he said, where are you on the AIG counterparty disclosure issue? Um, you know, are you for disclosing or not now? Hey, would the gentleman the yield? Could, could you put up slide one, please, so they could see it? Thank you. Uh, what would your advice have been on whether or not that should have been a public disclosure of, uh, of the counterparties and their obligation? And would the fact that, that really the taxpayers own over 79 percent, almost 80 percent of the company have made any difference? Well, as a general proposition, I'm very much for disclosure, uh, but I wasn't part of this. I had nothing to do with that decision, and I am not going to sit here now and second guess others that were, uh, you know, that I know people with, sure. with, with strong integrity and, and, and goodwill trying right. to do the right thing. Well, just <clears throat> take a situation where, the, where you do have a company that's, you know, 80 percent owned by the U.S. government. Uh, would that, would that uh, tend to make you think that, they, that there ought to be disclosures of their obligation? Well, but, but public companies uh, The, the have, gentleman, uh, public uh, companies time is expired. Mr. Paulson, the gentleman's time has expired, but you can answer his question. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, but pu public companies have disclosure obligations, and that's governed by the SEC, and, and I think those, are, that those need to be adhered to. Thank you. Okay, I, uh, I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes uh, Mr. Cummings of Maryland. You may proceed. Mr. Paulson, good seeing you again. Let me ask you this. Mr. Paulson, do you, do you, um, do you realize that uh, a lot of the American people believe that there's uh, a sort of Wall Street club and that, let me, let me finish, that you all play golf together and you have a lot of fun and then you, you know, when the billions come around, you're able to kind of distribute them. I mean, I, I'm just saying, do you know that that's how people feel? I, I, I sure do. And uh, even though Can you I'm keep a, your voice up? I said, even though I'm not a golfer, I sure know that's how people feel. Yeah, and they, and they, when they see these deals going on, then the, the next thing they do is they begin to look at where people worked. And then they see the relationships, and then they say, well, you know, we don't have a chance because it seems like they're kind of looking out for, for themselves, but not looking out for us. And so, you know, you, you just gave a statement about transparency, and, um, you know, they, and I think one of the things that bothers people is when they don't see transparency, then they begin not to trust. And when they begin not to trust, it becomes very difficult for them to go along with any program. And then when you put on top of that, that they can't see themselves benefiting. And I know that you mentioned that if, if we didn't do what we did, and unemployment may have gone up to 25%, but it's hard for people to even see that. You, you understand? Yeah, I, uh, Congressman, you've got it. And that's, uh, people are very, very angry and I understand it, why they're angry, and they're rightfully so, because they don't see the connection. Uh, and, and they don't recognize that what was done wasn't done for the banks. It was to, to it, it, they, they were going to be the victims if, yeah. if, if we didn't step in. And so among the conditions in the top AIG, SSFI, investment senior preferred stock and warrant summary of senior preferred terms, as posted on Treasury's Department's website, the following condition is noted. Quote, the annual bonus pools payable to senior partners in respect of each of 2008 and 2009 shall not exceed the average of the annual bonus pools paid to senior partners for 2006 and 2007. Do you believe it was appropriate for Treasury to allow AIG to create any bonus pool for senior partners considering it had just found it necessary to extend $40 billion to the firm through the TARP. I'm not going to get into uh, second-guessing decisions that were made at, at, at Treasury about bonuses. I realize this was, a, this was a very difficult decision because the taxpayer had 
a lot of money in this company. Right. And this company needed to perform well and needed to hold the team together to in order to repay tax. Uh, right. Repay and, tax and, and the taxpayers were saying to themselves, look, these are our tax dollars. Uh, we worked hard for these tax dollars, and now these guys who screwed up everything are, are getting bonuses. Yeah, you're right. No one, me included, likes to see private business profit from taxpayer assistance. That makes people angry. And to me, I just hope that part of that anger is is, is not a diversion from what we need to do, but is an incentive to fix the system so that we'll have resolution powers and never again will we we'll have a company that's so big, too big to fail, so the taxpayer has to come and put money in, that, that a company can be liquidated and wound down in a way in which the taxpayer's not on the hook again. Mm -hmm. But so I understand there's that anger out there and that frustration. I think it's very understandable. And uh, I think there's a number of ways to do something about it, but the best way to do something about it is reform the system so that, uh, that we don't uh, ever again have to, to bail out a big institution, rescue a big institution. It can be liquidated if it fails. Now, the, with regard to the original Treasury TARP investment in AIG, was this structured as a loan or as an equity investment? Uh, uh, Congressman, it was an equity investment. And was this in the AIG parent holding company or in the individual subsidiaries? This was this was in in, in the in the parent. This was a this was a forty billion dollar uh, equity investment because a company needed equity. And was it made subordinate to any other creditors of AIG? Well, a a preferred is by definition uh, senior to the common and and subordinated to the other creditors. And how does this compare to the various Federal Reserve investments in AIG? Well, th this would be, th this, this is subordinate to the other Federal Reserve uh, investments in AIG because a determination was made. The rating agencies basically said that you need to put capital in this institution or there will be a downgrade and then it would have, it would have precipitated the failure. And why was it structured in this way? It, it, it was structured in that way because that's the way it preferred uh, needs to be structured. That's where it, that, it wouldn't have been capital if it, if it hadn't been subordinated to the, other, uh, to, to, the, to the other liabilities. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank, I thank the gentleman. Chair recognizes Mr. Stearns from Florida. You may proceed for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Paulson, uh, Mr. Geithner has testified that he recused himself during this counterparty negotiation. Did you know that while you were Secretary of Treasury? I knew that. Just yes or no? Yes. You I, did I, know. Okay. I, he, did you know Tim that Geithner he did not sign? did not participate in any. I didn't view him as a decision maker. I viewed okay. him as recused. Did he call you up and advise you that I've recused myself? Did he call you up? He, he, How did he, he notify you? Well, he, he, he told me on the phone that he did not think it would be appropriate for him to be okay. viewed as a decision maker. Did you know maker. he never got a letter? All he did, he testified that he recused himself. He decided. He put up a flag and said, I recuse myself. I'm not going to be involved with a counterparty negotiation. Didn't get a... Like you went to the White House counsel and you went to the Secretary of Treasury, you, get a, you got a letter. He never got a letter. He never got a written confirmation of his recusal. Did you know that? Do you know that he was just doing it on his own by his own volition? I did not know the details. Okay. Did you think of a person who would recuse himself in this crisis we had, that he could go about and operate in his present job and not have a conflict of interest? Did you ever occur to yourself to say, gee, the chairman of the Federal Reserve is in this crisis, we're having the counterparty negotiations, and by golly, he's going to step aside and says he knows nothing about it. That's what he's saying today. I, Doesn't I, that seem sort of fakey to you? I, I, no, it didn't, because I thought it was an extraordinary position we had to have a president of the okay, New York Fed Treasury, now, so I thought question, it was a he reasonable... He said in open testimony that his chief of staff, while he was chairman of the Federal Reserve, was a former employee, employee of Goldman Sachs. Did you know that? Yes. Did you ever call the chief of staff, his chief of staff, former employee of Goldman Sachs? 
during the process of the counterparty negotiations? Did you ever call? If I go to the logs, will I see your name calling him? The, the, uh, his chief of staff, uh, who was a former uh, uh, employee of Goldman Sachs. And he worked did, for you did, when did, you were CEO. He didn't take on that job until after I had left, and he had become Treasury Secretary. Do you think that, do you think, did you ever call him at all? If I go back to logs, will I find that you called Geithner's chief of staff, former employee of Goldman Sachs, what, during the uh, counterparty negotiations? Uh, yeah, I, no, no, I didn't. There, you there, never called him. There, there's, as I said, the former, uh, his chief of staff, I think the person you're referring to, well, well, we didn't know about it until today. Is someone who became his chief of staff when he became Treasury Secretary after I had left no, office. No, but he said that while he was uh, at the Federal Reserve, he, he was his chief of staff. I, That's what he said today. I don't believe that was the case. Okay, but, all right. But in any event, when he was, when, when Tim okay, was Okay, let me the, just go on. I have the time. I talked with Tim. Here's the problem that I think a lot of us are having. Mr. Geithner said he was not involved with the counterparty negotiations. You're saying you didn't, you were, you were not involved. Oh, yes, you heard a little bit about it, but on November 6th, when they gave $62 billion to all these parties who came in and looted AIG, all you guys say, I knew nothing about it, and yet it appears that this happened. Now, recently, Michael McWraith, who's director of the National Association of Insurance Commissioner, told the Senate Banking Committee, he said, you know, if AIG had gone in bankruptcy, we would have taken care of it. It would have been an orderly disposition. This is what he said. AIG's insurance operations and their other companies would have simply, we would have simply bought up AIG's insurance assets, allowing a seamless delivery of AIG's insurance obligations. So the question is, considering that the state insurance commissioners would likely have seized AIG's insurance subsidiaries, protected policy holders in an AIG bankruptcy, why was it necessary to bail out AIG with taxpayers' money? based upon the testimony of the director of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. I respectfully disagree with him, and I believe that if So you disagree with this guy with I, all his knowledge and his years I, I, of experience? I will just say many people with years of experience had some regulatory responsibilities with regard to AIG, but this company was a, had a huge problem, and it is case number one on what is wrong with our regulatory system. There was no single regulator that had a line of sight on the total company. So there were regulators that looked at different pieces of it, and if the company had gone down, it, it would have been a huge mess. Is your testimony, Mr. Guyton has sort of implied, he scares members of Congress, he scares the public, we are all scared. He said, if AIG was not bailed out, this country would have collapsed. He intimated our Constitution would not have been able to be enforced. There would be a revolution in this country. Do you think it's at that extreme? If we let AIG go bankrupt, we would have had that kind of collapse and revolutionary spirit in this country? Is that what your position is today? I certainly have never said that. But what I He implied that. What, what, what I've said is I believe we would have had an absolute economic disaster. And our system gentlemen, of gentlemen, government. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentlemen's time has expired. I will now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Paulson, thank you for being here today. Now, in your testimony, you state that in your capacity as United States Treasury Secretary, you were not involved in any decisions with respect to payments to AIG's counterparties, and that you were not involved in any of the decisions concerning AIG's disclosure of those payments. I, I'd like to accept that at face value, uh, Mr. Paulson, except the critical decisions concerning payments to counterparties were made after the passage of the Emergency Economic Recovery Act by Congress at your request. And the uh, Emergency Economic Recovery Act made the Treasury Secretary responsible for the use of funds authorized by Congress. Negotiations on the counterparty payments by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York did not begin until November 6, 2008, and the funding of the payment of the counterclaims was backed by funds made available under the Emergency Economic Recovery Act. So, Mr. Paulson, uh, doesn't it make it your responsibility to, to know how those funds were used? I, I think you will find, uh, Congressman, and I think SIGTARP reported this, that the TARP investment, the $40 billion TARP investment, was equity, 
and that those funds did not go into this maiden lane vehicle uh, where where the, 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 the Fed the, the Fed loan. So, so you went, didn't have any knowledge of the counterparty I, 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 I uh, transa no. payment transactions? I, I, I did not. Are you not. telling us that? I, I did not. And are you telling us that uh, you were not aware of, of any of the discussions leading to the counterparty payments with any of the principals? You weren't? Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. And you're telling us that as Treasury Secretary, you had no role whatsoever in the decision on counterparty payments, that you didn't even, you didn't ask anyone any questions, that you never expressed an opinion on the matter, that you were completely unaware of the nature of proposed transactions until it was consummated, and no one asked you any questions about how these Emergency Economic Stabilization uh, Act or the Recovery Act funds uh, would be used to stabilize AIG, the one financial institution more than any other that was at the well, heart of the crisis. You just didn't know. Well, uh, uh, Congressman, we asked a lot of questions about the $40 billion TARP equity investment. That was that, that was something that was that was that was our job and it was our authority. Did you ask and about as, the nature and, of the and, as, I, and as I stuff. said, the the loan that was a Fed authority, and they had the authority and the technical expertise to handle that, and that was that, that was their job, and we were consumed with other matters, and had great confidence in them to carry out their responsibilities very professionally and well. Well, uh, you know, Mr. Paulson, uh, no one disputes that you worked very hard throughout the crisis. Uh, it's well known. You were personally talking with senior executives at every, all major financial institutions uh, on your now legendary cell phone, which I might add uh, is, uh, in the, is in the Museum of American uh, History. Uh, but how is it that you played no role in the, in the handling of this AIG relief, that you didn't have an interest in it. I, how is it that despite Goldman Sachs' extensive role as a counterparty to an agent for AIG in the transaction, your extensive personal network of associations within Goldman, which extended to several Goldman alumni on staff at Treasury, that you can say that you didn't have any knowledge and by implication no influence over the transaction? I, I don't understand that. Well, I, I can, it can't be any clearer. I had, I, I uh, assumed that Goldman Sachs knew that Goldman Sachs and I assumed most other major uh, financial institutions were counterparties, but I had no knowledge of what the individual claims were. And that was my concern here was not about uh, counterparty claims when we uh, rescued AIG. My, my, my concern was about what was going to happen to the American economy and the American people. And again, you, you need to understand when we worked together, uh, the Fed and Treasury, we had different authorities, different responsibilities, and there was so much going on I, that we, we had a lot to do and they had the authority and responsibility for dealing with the loan and The thing that I have trouble with, though, is that the government gave Goldman Sachs, your former firm, a better deal than it had a right to expect. You heard the previous testimony here. I, I just, it, it's mystifying how you, as Treasury Secretary, this could happen and you not really know anything about it. And uh, did you, if, unless you recused yourself from any discussions, uh -huh about AIG I, I didn't or have, about uh, Goldman I, Sachs. I didn't have to recuse myself because mm. the fact was no one discussed it with me, consulted it w w with me. Uh, I was involved in other matters. This was, uh, this was a Federal Reserve Authority and they had the technical expertise I, and that was their yeah. job. Thank, thank you. Time. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Paulson. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Well, you're gonna, you're gonna no, I'm saying we have votes on the floor, and of course um, uh, we uh, have four votes, and that we, uh, due to a previous agreement with Mr. Paulson, that we're now going to uh, allow him to go. Uh, and, Mr. Chairman, yeah, be, could we ask if Mr. Paulson could stay just for five more minutes to complete on our side? Two people will split time. Uh, two? 
Well, let me just put it this way then. Now, who, who else has not had an opportunity to? Is one, two, three. Right. Mr. Paulson. Mr. Paulson. Could you give us um, another seven minutes and let me split three and a half uh, and three and a half? Yeah, okay. okay. We, we can look at Mr. Okay. Chairman, yeah. well, I would be willing to put mine in writing to Secretary Paulson if he'd be willing to respond within a certain given time right. rather than. Yeah, Mr. Secretary, uh, yes. Well, Mr. Well, Mr. Secretary, there's, there's a, a request in terms of uh, if we give the questions to you in writing, yes, you will respond. We, we, we will get back to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Paulson, you uh, were. Let's see how we're going to break this down first. You, you were know, one of the chief operating uh, uh, officers of Goldman. Yield, hold on. Gentleman Yield, you're going to give us additional seven, eight minutes? Uh, is it okay? Okay, good. All right, so we'll break it down. Four. You, you were okay. you were it one of the top. be eight minutes, right? Yeah. Right, eight minutes. You were one of the top officers for Goldman Sachs, right? Yes, the top yeah. officer. And some of the people that work for Goldman Sachs want to work for Mr. Geithner. Uh, I, 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 I believe I know. Yeah. And when you one. when you left Goldman Sachs and went to the Treasury, you were there three years, and you got two hundred million dollars in tax benefits. Uh, because you didn't have to pay capital gains on $500 million worth of stock, right? I would strongly disagree with that. Because, well, that's what's been because reported. Because l l let me just exp okay, exp well, l it's okay. okay. You, can re you can respond. I I'll send a question to you in writing. Okay. The, the concern I have is the same concern that Mr. Stearns has. You came before our conference very nervous, saying, oh, my gosh, the sky's falling. We've got to come up with this money very, very quickly. And you actually were visibly nervous when you came before our caucus. And then we have this bailout uh, of uh, AIG, and uh, you, you don't know anything about it. Mr. Geithner had nothing to do with it. It just really boggles the mind that some of the biggest people involved in this whole thing from beginning to end had nothing to do with it. They didn't know. It, was some, I, it makes you want to think that some clerk someplace was making these decisions. I don't think anybody's going to buy that. You and Mr. Geithner and others were directly involved in making this decision, were you not? Of course we are directly involved, and I, I, I said it in my testimony. I heard uh, Mr. Geithner's testimony. I heard him say the same thing. We, we were, I, I was very supportive of that decision uh, of to, to, to uh, prevent the failure of AIG. Go to gentlemen, who's next on this on my side? Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two minutes. Right. Okay, Mr. Yeah. Secretary, I need to make this uh, happen in two minutes. Uh, you were centrally involved with the negotiations regarding Bear Stearns when uh, you insisted on a very, very low price on the part of the, uh, the Bear Stearns shareholders uh, in order to protect the taxpayer. Uh, it has been reported that you, you were very supportive of a $2 a share price. Uh, in order to protect the, the share, excuse me, to protect the taxpayer's interest. And yet, in, in this situation with AIG, and, and you were the CEO of Goldman Sachs back in 2006, there was a long standing relationship there between AIG and Goldman Sachs that you were well aware of. Goldman Sachs was a major uh, counterparty on a lot of these credit default swaps. Uh, with AIG when you were the CEO at Goldman, and that relationship continued after you left. You would have known that these people were, were uh, that, that Goldman was exposed here with these credit default swaps when the money went from the taxpayer to AIG and through to your, your former company. And, and I guess the question that everybody has here is why, when you insisted on on Bear Stearns taking a big haircut, why did you allow Goldman to be reimbursed, your former company, at 100 cents on a dollar in that situation? Well, why did you not weigh in on behalf of the taxpayer? As I've said a number of, on a number of occasions, I did not know, I had no knowledge of the size of the claim of any bank and I had no involvement in a decision to make payments to the counterparties, none whatsoever. I was very supportive of the rescue of AIG 
because a failure of that uh, company would have been disastrous. Especially to Goldman Sachs. The gentleman's been, time has expired. It would have been disastrous to the American people. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield uh, two minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Thank Mr. Mr. Thank George. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Paulson, I want to clarify the chain of events surrounding the original request for the TARP dollars, original request of Congress. You came to the Congress. Everyone in this committee, I think everyone in Congress would admit, you came to us in September said, we need the, we, we need the money to buy troubled assets, toxic assets. As everyone knows, at some point you changed your mind. When did you change your mind and decide you weren't going to purchase the troubled assets, you were going to inject capital into the banks? When did that happen? I changed my mind. I came to Congress on September 18th. Congress it, first voted it down. It, it, it October took, 3rd, we voted it for it. When, did you, when did you change it your our, mind? It was our strategy when I came to Congress to buy illiquid assets, purchase illiquid assets. When? I, we got two, two minutes. Two when did you change on, your mind? And it was. But by the time before the vote on October 3rd or after the vote, uh, I, when did you change your mind? I had begun considering putting uh, putting a, a capital into the banks as one option uh, as we got near the final vote. But I had not changed my mind yet on the strategy. And I will say one other thing to you: right up, even after we put capital in the banks which we were forced wait, wait, to do wait, by what is it? Did you change your mind before I, the vote or after I, the vote? Because had, we have I, the, we have well, the interchange. I changed my mind. I changed my mind after the vote because I, I did not okay. change my, can this, I just say this? I did not change my mind on purchasing illiquid assets we have the slide until, until mid to late October after we put the capital in, after we put the capital in. So you're just in. so I'm clear. You're saying you didn't change your mind until after the vote. So I want to, I want to point to this, the, the book, the David Wessel's book that came out in the Fed We Trust, page 226, 227. And you've just been given a copy of what it says. House of Representatives rejected the Bush administration's bank rescue plan on the 29th of 2008. The next morning, Mr. Paulson ran into Michelle Davis, the spokeswoman and policy coordinator in the Treasury building. Quote, I think we're going to have to put equity in the banks. He said, despite what Paulson had told Congress, buying toxic assets was going to take too long. Davis gave him a blank stare. Quote, we haven't even gotten the bill through Congress. She remembered thinking, how are we going to explain this? She told her boss, we can't say that now. He took the advice. So, again, I'm asking you, was it before or after? Well, because you've said two different things. You said, I started thinking about it, but you said, I didn't make the decision until after. But you sold the Congress on the simple fact that you were going to buy the troubled assets. That's why they needed the money. If you would let me and this con your spokeswoman yeah, yeah, directly yeah. contradicts that. Congressman, let me answer the question. Give, give me a minute to answer the question. The, during that period, when Congress was acting, the situation worsened considerably. As we got near the final vote, I was beginning to be clear to me that we were going to need to think through other options. But no, long after, even after we put capital in the banks. Did you express okay, that concern to the after, Congress? The gentleman's time has expired. It, even after we put capital in the banks, it was still my intent to proceed with an illiquid asset purchase program until we got into late October. Let me ask you one question. Gentleman, is that, is that I'm statement sorry, accurate? Is gentleman, the statement time on the screen accurate, is, Mr. Chairman? I think it's, a, I think it's important for the is committee expired. to know that. I now yield two minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Holland. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Paulson. And I accept your testimony that failure to act, uh, in, enact the financial rescue plan would have uh, led to, as you said, uh, economic uh, disaster. Uh, when you and the uh, President, President Bush, came before the Congress uh, in, in, in an emergency, you submitted a plan that did not include, at the time, a mechanism to make sure that the taxpayer would recoup any dollars that had been extended uh, to the financial sector. Uh, the Congress, at that time, inserted a provision uh, requiring the President, whoever that President may be, uh, to submit a plan to recover those funds on behalf of the taxpayer. Uh, President Obama has now done that in proposing a fee. And my question to you is, do you agree that given everything the taxpayer did to save the financial industry, that in addition to taking measures to prevent this from happening in the future, we should also make sure that we put in place a mechanism to recover the monies that went to Wall Street and other financial banks as part of the rescue? I, I, I do agree with that. And, but the, the, the provision that was put into the TARP legislation envisioned, contemplated, looking at a five-year window and at the end of that five-year time period, if, if the uh, taxpayer hadn't recovered the money, then there was going to be a, a, a tax. Now, today, as I look at the circumstance, 
The money is going to come back from the banks, in my judgment, with a profit to the taxpayer. And it's too early to tell about whether, to, to what extent the money is going to come back from the rest of the program. I frankly think uh, the, the taxpayers will end up being pleasantly surprised and much more will come back. So my only question about the fee, the, the, the tax that's being suggested is, is it too soon to make that judgment? Number one, but most importantly, I don't want that to take our focus off of dealing with what is a real problem. We better but, fix this system but, so it doesn't happen But again. would you agree there should be a mechanism in place at, to ensure that at the end of the day, the taxpayer is recoups 100% yeah, of the target. Yeah, that was, that was the intent of, of Congress, and I think right. it was the right thing to do. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Um, thank you, Mr. Paulson, Speaking for... Congressman, uh, yes. woman, I, I had agreed to stay for uh, a, another eight minutes. It's been ten minutes. <laughs> for that reason, okay. uh, I um, dismissed the gentleman who had who had the time to tell him his time had passed. And I would, and for the committee, and especially for Chairman Towns, uh, may I thank you for not only eight minutes, but 10 minutes. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> We'd like to call the third panel. Witnesses will be seated. This is the third panel. The final witnesses for today's hearing are Neil Borofsky, the Special Inspector General for TARP, Thomas Baxter, the General Counsel, Executive Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Elias uh, Habayo, the former Chief Financial Officer of the Financial Services Group of AIG, and Stephen Friedman, the former Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and current member of the Board of Director, Directors of Goldman Sachs. May I ask the witnesses to stand while I administer the oath? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the witnesses that have answered in the affirmative, you may now be seated. I'll ask the witnesses to summarize their testimony in five minutes. The yellow light means you have a minute left. The red light means stop. And then, of course, we will have time for questions from members uh, whom I uh, now. All the witnesses have opening statements, so I believe that uh, given the four votes, the members will be back by the time your statements are done for questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Brofsky, would you present your testimony first? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it is a, it's an honor to once again to be back to testifying before this committee. 
I'd like to thank this committee for the support it's shown our office, as well as its leadership and tenacity in bringing about transparency to the AIG bailout generally and in particular to the counterparty payments. Um, this past November, we issued our audit, an audit that was re requested by Representative Cummings and 26 other members of Congress, including members of this committee, reporting on the decision-making process that led to then-President Geithner and the Federal Reserve making the decision, the choice, to pay 100 cents on the dollar, effectively par value, for a series of securities that at the time were worth less than half of that amount. And as we demonstrate in the audit, that was in fact a choice, uh, a series of policy choices that were made that limited the ability of the Federal Reserve um, in its negotiations, and a choice to conduct the negotiations in the way that they did. And in our audit and in our testimony, we lay out the different justifications and explanations given by the Federal Reserve, many of which Secretary Geithner uh, repeated this morning, and our responses and in some cases our criticisms of those policy decisions. What I'd like to focus on today, though, is expanding a different theme in the audit, and that's looking at the tone and amount of effort that went into those negotiations, even assuming all of those policy de decisions which restricted the latitude of the Federal Reserve. How are those negotiations conducted? Well, essentially, uh, a number of mid and senior level executives at the FRBNY reached out to their counterpart at AIG's counterparties. They did basically over the telephone and after informing them that um, the, even the negotiations themselves were voluntary, they asked if they would be willing to take a haircut on the, on the, on the amount of concession. For seven of the eight, the answer was no. For the eighth, UBS, the answer was yes, so long as the other counterparties also agreed to a similar concession. The Federal Reserve at that point did, decided to shut down negotiations, not to pursue that willingness to go, negotiate, um, and decided with the approval of Secretary Geithner to pay 100 cents on the dollar. Now, this stands in stark contrast to a negotiation that occurred just a few weeks earlier. And this, of course, was the negotiation by which the government purchased $125 billion of preferred securities from the nine largest institutions as part of the TARP's capital purchase program. There, unlike in AIG, it were the principals that were involved. President Geithner, Secretary Paulson, and Chairman Bernanke on behalf of the government, and on behalf of the counterparties, the banks, some of the exact same banks uh, that were subject to the AIG discussions, the chief executive officers. There, unlike in AIG, the conversations weren't conducted over the telephone. Each of those CEOs was summoned to Washington and told to appear in a Treasury conference room, gathered together. And there, unlike in AIG, the message was forceful. President Geithner, Chairman Bernanke, Secretary Paulson and others made it very clear of the importance that they believed that this negotiation was, how important it was for the banks to agree. They, they used the terms like that it would be good for the country for them to do so. No such similar effort was taken with respect to the AIG negotiations. And the result with the capital purchase program, 100 percent agreement. The result for the AIG, as we all know, were failed negotiations. Now, would it have made a difference if President Geithner or Secretary Paulson got on the phone and talked to those chief executive officers? Would it have resulted in the savings of billions or tens of billions of dollars for the taxpayer? We don't know. We can't know. But we do know, because we've recently been informed by the French regulator, the same regulator that the Federal Reserve cited their intransigence as being one of the, the great barriers to achieving the effective negotiated haircuts, they recently told SIGTARP that, in fact, they would have been willing to engage in just such a negotiation, so long as it was at a very high level, so long as it was completely transparent, and as long as it was universal agreement. Everyone came around the table. And we also know that if such negotiations occurred and were successful, they would have addressed all of the concerns that Secretary Geithner addressed this morning and many of the concerns that were outlined in our, in our audit of, of concerns by the Federal Reserve. But we'll never know because that effort was simply not taken. Madam Chair, our audit covers, uh, I see my time is, is, is running low. Uh, our audit obviously covers a lot of other issues as does our testimony, including some of the recent troubling um, comments from Treasury that impact transparency. Uh, and of course, I'll be available to answer any questions that you or, or other members of the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Borowski. Mr. Baxter, we'd like you to go next. Good afternoon, Madam, Madam Chairman Norton, Ranking Member Issa, and other members of this committee. 
Thank you for inviting me to appear here today. As the General Counsel of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, I welcome the opportunity to talk about the Federal Reserve's work to stabilize AIG at a critical point. I will also address the role played by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in securities disclosures made by AIG. Let me begin with just a few words about autumn 2008, when our nation was challenged by a financial crisis of a kind we had not seen since the Great Depression. At the New York Fed, we were literally working around the clock trying to implement a number of liquidity programs directed toward market stability. Today, we consider some of the actions taken during those frenetic times with respect to AIG. Everything we have done since this crisis began has been with the goal of stabilizing our financial system and assisting our economic recovery. Turning to September 2008 and the actions taken by the New York Fed, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, and the Department of the Treasury, they were designed to avoid the, systemic, the catastrophic systemic consequences that would have resulted from an AIG bankruptcy. Every American would have been adversely impacted. We did not lend to AIG because we wanted to, but because we had to. A decision not to act might have been easier on us, but it would have been worse for all. Now I will turn to the specific issues that bring me here today. First, there have been concerns about AIG's counterparties receiving large payments for terminating CDS contracts and selling collateralized debt obligations. There have been allegations that this was a backdoor bailout designed by the Federal Reserve to assist the banks at the expense of the American taxpayer. These allegations are not true. AIG was scheduled to announce an earnings loss of nearly $25 billion on November 10, 2008. Had we not reached agreement with the counterparties to terminate their credit default swap contracts by that date, by acquiring the CDOs, AIG would have been downgraded by the credit rating agencies and thrown once again to the brink of bankruptcy. This would have returned us to the situation we faced in September and required even further government support. We took the action needed to terminate the CDS contracts by the deadline, and our focus was on solving the AIG liquidity problem, not on benefiting AIG's counterparties. Second, I would like to clarify the misunderstanding that the, Treasury, that the Federal Reserve and Treasury Department received nothing of value in exchange for the payments to AIG's counterparties. As part of the termination deal, the Federal Reserve, through its special purpose vehicle Maiden Lane 3, paid approximately $29 billion and received assets with a fair market value of $29 billion. The par value of the assets was approximately $62 billion. Today, the value of the assets, which secure the Federal Reserve's loan, exceeds our loan balance by several billion dollars. Third, concerns have been expressed about our involvement in AIG's securities disclosures. In particular, there have been allegations that we somehow tried to engage in a cover-up by recommending that AIG strike certain sentences in its SEC disclosures related to the payments to the counterparties. These allegations are not true. Our sole purpose was to ensure that securities law disclosures by AIG were accurate and appropriately protective of taxpayer interests. Let me finish by thanking the committee for holding this hearing. We submitted an extensive statement yesterday and we have delivered 250,000 pages of documents to you. I believe that, upon careful examination, the committee will see that our actions successfully addressed a potentially calamitous risk to the economy, and in doing so, protected the interests of the American people. Uh, thank you, Mr. Baxter. Mr. Habayu. We're ready for your testimony. 
Madam Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to appear before you today. From September 2005 until May of last year, I was Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the Financial Div uh, Services Division at American International Group. I left AIG in May 2009 on excellent terms and continued to provide advisory services to the company while I planned the next phase of my career. By way of additional background, I'm a licensed CPA and practiced with Deloitte & Touche, becoming a partner in 2003. My position with AIG gave me some insights into Made in Lane 3. Made in Lane 3 LLC is a financing entity created by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The entity helped facilitate the unwinding of a significant portion of AIG financial products credit default swaps by purchasing the underlying multi-sector uh, CDO bonds from FP swap counterparties. At the same time, the related swaps were terminated. I understand that the committee is interested in learning more about these transactions. These transactions were critical to AIG. They significantly reduced the risk of substantial collateral postings to counterparties that FP was required to make under the swaps. They also reduced the erosion to AIG's capital from mounting mark-to-market -market losses on the swaps. A little history is helpful. During the subprime mortgage crisis, the bonds underlying FP swaps began to decrease in value. As a result, beginning in late 2007 through 2008, FP reported billions of dollars of mark-to-market -market losses on the swaps under the fair value accounting rules. FP also posted billions of dollars in collateral to its swap counterparties as a result of the declining market value of the bonds and declines in AIG's and the reference bond's credit ratings. AIG lacked the financial resources to come up with a large-scale solution. Because AIG is not a bank, it did not have access to funding through the Federal Reserve in the normal course. Instead, AIG had to rely on the capital markets. By the beginning of September 2008, the collateral postings and the mark-to-market -market losses, along with other factors, were straining AIG's liquidity. But AIG was not able to access the capital markets. On September 15, 2008, the rating agencies downgraded AIG, triggering an onslaught of new collateral calls. Even after the federal rescue on September 16, 2008, AIG still needed to reduce its exposure to the mark-to-market -market losses and collateral calls on FB swaps. The federal rescue did not stop these losses or payment obligations. This is what led to the creation of Maiden Lane 3. Under the terms negotiated by the New York Fed with the swap counterparties, Maiden Lane 3 bought the underlying bonds at the, the then market value. Specifically, Maiden Lane 3 purchased approximately $62 billion in notional amount of bonds underlying notional par value and its not market value. The collateral that FP had posted to date was used to pay the cost of terminating the swaps, specifically the counterparties, approximately $62 billion. To conclude, Maiden Lane 3 was critical in mitigating AIG's continued exposure to the significant mark-to-market -market losses and collateral calls on the swaps that was draining AIG's capital and liquidity. I'm happy to answer any questions the members of the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bayou. Uh, Mr. Friedman. As indicated in my prepared statement, I have little factual information to offer in response to the questions set forth in the committee's invitation for me to testify. The explanation for my lack of involvement in the, thank you, in the um, New York Reserve Bank AIG counterparty transactions requires an appreciation of the 
limited role that a reserve bank's chairman and board of directors play in a reserve bank's operation. A reserve bank's board of directors is really more akin to an advisory board. It is, it is actually sort of a hybrid, more akin to that than it is to the board of directors of a typical uh, corporation. Reserve bank directors serve part-time, uh, make observations on the economy and markets, make recommendations on monetary policy, and approve the bank's budget, internal controls, and policies and procedures and, and uh, personnel matters. Um, but consistent with the structure created by the Federal Reserve Act, uh, the directors of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks have no role in the regulation, supervision, or oversight of banks, bank holding companies, or other financial institutions. Uh, such responsibilities including the extraordinary financial interventions of 2008, are instead carried out by the officers of the 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks acting at the direction and with the oversight of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington. Uh, in other words, the Board of Governors in Washington effectively is the Board of Directors uh, for Reserve Bank undertakings such as the AIG financial rescue transactions. Uh, accordingly, uh, as I explained to committee staff and, and consistent with the Fed's ground rules, um, whether as chairman of the uh, New York Federal Reserve Board or otherwise, uh, I was not involved in the decision to bail out AIG, the decision to repay the AIG counterparties at par, or the decision not to publicly disclose those counterparties' names. Uh, I did not ratify those decisions, and I do not know um, just who made those decisions. Uh, I am advised that um, on the evening of um, uh, November 9th, 2008, the chair of the bank's audit committee and I received a telephonic summary briefing from bank officials about the transaction. Uh, at that point, the deal had been signed up and was to be announced by the Board of Governors the next, um, the next morning. Um, I, finally, I would note that by statutory design, the boards of the reserve banks are comprised of members with intentionally diverse financial interests and affiliations, such that the director's recommendations and advice on monetary policy include input from a diverse array of bankers, borrowers, and community leaders. Uh, because the boards, once again by statutory design, include bank executives and bank shareholders, many current directors would have conflicts of interest if the reserve bank boards of directors also had any authority over or any role in individual supervisory matters. Uh, matters like the New York Reserve Bank's rescue of AIG and the AIG counterparty transactions. But the New York Reserve Board does not have such authority, and it and I were walled off from these matters, really ring-fenced. Uh, I stand ready to answer any questions the committee may have. Mr. Friedman, um, let's begin with Mr. Baxter. Mr. Baxter, the committee notes um, that you have said publicly a number of occasions that AIG and not the Federal Reserve of New York had the final say on disclosures. The committee has, uh, however, in its possession an email, I believe it is up there, it was obtained by subpoena um, it, it, um, it involves a senior person in your office, and the words said are, any public disclosure by AIG was still subject to FRS approval, Federal Reserve Service approval. That sound like, sounds pretty much like the Federal Reserve has the final approval with that kind of statement. If what you say about AIG having the final decision is true, why did a top New York Fed employee uh, say that the final approval, in effect, uh, rests with the, F the Federal Reserve? 
Madam Chairman, um, as I look at that email, I don't see it being addressed to me. So I will have to speculate as to why the author of that email included what do you, Who do you think it was addressed to, Mr. Baxter? You know, well, they, uh, you, know uh, you don't just send emails in the air. Do we, do I, I can't read it well enough, Madam Chair, to tell you, um, but it doesn't look like it's addressed to me. Madam Chair, I'm willing well, to speculate. Well, since, so. since you raised the, the issue of, of who it is um, from Stephen Mazzari to uh, Sarah Dahlgren, it is your top people, your proxies speak for you. Do they not? They, they, are, they are not only very, very senior people, they are also very diligent people. And with respect to the email, uh, Madam Chair, it doesn't refer to securities disclosure. Um, it refers to a public disclosure by AIG, so I'd point that out as, as one item. With respect to AIG's securities disclosures, those are AIG's legal obligations under our securities laws, given that AIG was then and is now a publicly traded company. So in the first instance, AIG has a responsibility to comply with our securities laws, and that's the starting point. Now, it is true that AIG shared its securities law disclosures with the Fed. And it is true that the Fed commented on those draft securities law disclosures of AIG. Our purpose in making those comments was twofold. First, to assure accuracy. And second, to protect the taxpayer interest. But at no point, Madam Chair, did we ever interfere with a mandatory obligation of AIG to report to the SEC in a, in a securities filing? It was always for the two interests that I, that I mentioned, the interest of accuracy and the interest of protecting the taxpayer interest that we commented on AIG's public, list, public disclosures. Now, now it could not the, be. The word approval is a very troubling word here. It, it implies it what it says. It is, Madam Chair, and it could not be for an AIG public filing an approval because that legal obligation with respect to AIG's securities filings as a public company is AIG's. It cannot be delegated to someone else. Yeah, agreed. Not even someone at the Agreed, Federal but Reserve. it looks as though, it looks as though a very powerful agency was saying otherwise. I agree with what you say, but that's not what the email said. And you can, uh, perhaps you can see why it, it, it makes it look as though the Federal Reserve of New York is not being up front with, was not being up front with the American people. Here behind the scenes were these, um, were these emails uh, that put the Federal Reserve in a position that you yourself indicate is not a position it can have under law. Correct. Um, uh, Mr. Borofsky, perhaps you can help me. I'm sitting here listening to um, this testimony, and I still cannot understand. I need uh, to understand, um, for a moment, putting yourself in the position of the parties, why you think uh, uh, AIG's counterparts were paid 100 cents on the dollar. Well, I think that you know, it, it's hard to put myself in, into to the shoes of, of either the, the, the counterparties or the Federal Reserve, but my understanding of the discussions, I certainly understand why the counterparties wanted to be paid 100 cents on the dollar. Now, of um, course, but that's not, why would the government want to do that? I mean, you, you cannot assume in a situation like this that somebody wants to do evil or wants to cheat the taxpayers. We're trying to find, get beneath the appearance, trying to place ourselves at the table with the parties, including the government, including the Federal Reserve, including AIG. So, so you yourself, in your testimony, lay out what had just occurred. Why would that procedure not be used? I, I cannot give you an answer to that question. I think that if, if that effort and that tone were there, I, Mr. Baxter could answer that question. Probably Secretary Geithner could best answer that question. Um, but put your, I mean, uh, again, if, if uh, if you have to assume that, that uh, uh, the best 
and not the worst, then what would be the best reason I, for, for, for not using the government's bargaining power? I, I really cannot, I cannot imagine. I, I think that, again, if accepting the, the policy limitations that they, that they imposed upon themselves, and, and we don't accept them necessarily in the audit, but even accepting them, it seems to me that taking the effort uh, you know, apparently, you know, Secretary Geithner at the time was frequently speaking to the, the CEOs of, of many of these counterparties. It seems to it seems that just putting a little extra effort in, in in trying to communicate the importance of this. I mean, negotiations were ongoing. It's not as if as it, it may, some may, may may think that they made no effort in negotiations. There was some effort in negotiations. So there was effort. So you know, when, when you say that they said, "Would you accept?" Uh, 100 cents on the dollar, less than 100 cents on the dollar. Well, anybody would answer no to that question. I mean, the surprising thing is that one of them did answer yes, and that wasn't pursued. And why do you think he answered yes and the others answered no? Um, I think they were willing to negotiate because I think that, you know, if you look at it from... Did from, he know the others had answered no? Well, he said yes only as long as all the others would say yes. So his idea was that we would do that UBS... Well, why didn't he this. stick with the others? I mean, there must have been some... Mr. Baxter... Well, why would, what, you know, if you see that there's solidarity here and maybe you can get the government <laughs> where you want it, uh, why would, would one person say yes? He must have known something. He must have felt, did he feel something for the country? Did he feel something for the economy that made him do it? Is he a patriot and the others not? I mean, I think that there was, you know, this was, this was UBS, and I think there probably was a recognition that the Federal Reserve had done so much for the global economy and the American taxpayer, put in, putting the American taxpayer had sort of, have literally taken the entire global economy on its back and was supporting not just the U.S. institutions, but, but the global systemic risk that the sacrifices the taxpayer had made. And that, I think, is a powerful argument uh, to, in, in the context of negotiations if it's made clear how important it was to the American uh, decision makers, to the, to the principals. And I think that perhaps, I don't want to crawl into the mind of, of the UBS, but there was a willingness uh, to, to engage in these discussions, but as long as all the others. And because seven of the eight had said no, the Federal Reserve sh essentially shut down those negotiations. Um, but I think it is a very fair question to say, why not do something similar to what was done just a couple weeks before in Washington with respect to the capital purchase program, which is, again, those were not compelled, uh, a compelled transaction. It was ultimately a voluntary transaction, but it dealt with the negotiations, if you will, were conducted in a very, very forceful manner mm -hmm. uh, that made it very clear that this was a, 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 an issue of national importance. So I would ask you the same question, Mr. Baxter. To the, the one, one of the reasons why people are so angry at the banks and at the government is because this is a common sense question that anybody would ask without being very learned or very practiced in negotiation. So could you give us your answer? And I think, and I think Madam Chair, this is a key question. The key question is, why didn't the Federal Reserve um, act successfully to get a concession of perhaps... Is your mic on, sir? I think it is. Mm -hmm. why, why weren't we successful in getting a concession from the counterparties? Why wasn't AIG successful in getting a concession from the counterparties? Because that, that was the situation. And, and it is related to bargaining power. Now, typically, when a debtor is trying to restructure a debt with a creditor, the bargaining power that the debtor gets, Madam Chair, is from the threat of bankruptcy. This negotiation with the counterparties was taking place in the first week of November 2008. So how would, it, how would the threat of bankruptcy have played during that particular period of time? And of course, Madam Chair, you know that the Federal Reserve had already interceded to save AIG from bankruptcy on September 16th of 2008, only six weeks before. So what about the bankruptcy threat? And I have three responses. First, that threat was not credible, given the actions of September 2008. Second, that, that threat of bankruptcy was not true. We weren't prepared to put AIG into bankruptcy in November of 2008. And we don't misrepresent situations in negotiations at the, the Federal threat, Reserve. But the threat was there. Excuse me, the difficulty uh, uh, 
and the bargaining positions were there. So, so I, I still don't understand uh, why I ask a simple question, then proceed with business as usual as if uh, you weren't holding that threat card. And, and I'm trying to explain exactly why we had no bargaining power with respect to the bankruptcy risk. The first is it wasn't credible. The second is it wasn't true, and it would have been unethical for us to suggest otherwise. And the third is it would have been counterproductive because the biggest threat we were facing at that point was the threat of the credit rating agencies downgrading Mr. Baxter, I understand that nuclear bomb threats are not credible. And I can understand your argument as to the insolvency. Mr. Borofsky, now it's true that when you come in and you tell somebody you know, you're gonna kill them, and you know for sure that you're not, and they know for sure you're not, then the question becomes what is the next step after the nuclear bomb threat? Sure, I, I think there's two things. First of all, what, what I was suggesting, the, uh, um, that the principals got involved in negotiation, I wasn't suggesting that they threatened bankruptcy. Uh, my, my, my comparison to, to what happened a couple weeks earlier was, again, was presuming all the, the restrictions that the Mr. Baxter and Secretary Geithner had, had put on themselves, including not wanting to threaten bankruptcy. So, so first of all, I think that what I was, when drawing this comparison, I wasn't suggesting that they do. Um, as to the complete absence of leverage, um, again, I think you have to look at this in the context of what the situation was, what the position of U.S. government officials explaining how important this was, much like they had two weeks earlier. And I don't think that they needed to threaten bankruptcy. However, as, as Secretary Geithner noted this morning, um, there was a very serious concern at the Federal Reserve and in the markets that there was going to be a downgrade of AIG, uh, a downgrade that, that Secretary Geithner and the Federal Reserve have indicated to us would have resulted in um, AIG going into bankruptcy despite the best efforts of the Federal Reserve. There was a limit on how much money perhaps the Federal Reserve was willing to print uh, at some point if it was, bankruptcy was triggered. Um, and I think that, again, without threatening bankruptcy, uh, I think that if there was a negotiation, if everyone was in the room, um, the Federal Reserve could point to the fact that there was a possibility of a downgrade. They could point to what the market was treating AIG's debt at the time. The, the credit default swaps were, were through the roof. There was fear in the market that AIG would default. Um, and again, without threatening the bankruptcy, could point out the fact that if there was not a resolution, if they didn't agree to a haircut, it may be difficult for the Federal Reserve to get board approval, for example, uh, to pay 100 cents on the dollar. That had not, they had not yet received that approval. Uh, what I'm saying is that there is a whole different range of options in that negotiation that could have occurred had they simply brought everyone in the same room uh, and if it was made a priority, if there was a level of effort across the board, I can't tell you if it would have worked. I have no idea if it would have worked. Well, have you ever heard a hundred, a hundred cents in the dollar being given in, I mean, I've had no situation like this, but isn't that even rare uh, as a as a way to come forward when you see a desperate situation on, this, on the side of the, on, on the other side? Surely um, some gradations down from that were in order. And I guess I should ask Mr. Baxter, um, the puzzling thing is to come up with 100 cents on a dollar without proceeding through some other process until you maybe had to get there. We don't see, we, the committee does not see how you, and, and is, is bothered by the spontaneous <laughs> nature of the acceptance of the notion that the government had to pay 100 cents on the dollar, we've hardly heard of a negotiation in our lifetime where that's what two unequal parties at the table end up doing. No concession, 100 cents on the dollar. So uh, perhaps you can tell us why what Mr. Borofsky says, at least some since yes, of course, you're not going to put them into bankruptcy. We do not question nearly as much the bottom line here as we question how you got to that bottom line. Well, because we couldn't use the threat of bankruptcy, Madam Chair, one question was could we use our regulatory or supervisory power? And we considered the answer to that question no, because that would have been an abuse of our power. And the reason we felt that is that it wasn't using the supervisory power with respect to an institution to get it to do something to enhance its safety and soundness. For example, like raise more capital. If an institution doesn't do that, then it's appropriate if the Fed believes there is insufficient capital 
to use a promise or a threat, perhaps of enforcement action, to induce the institution to take that action. This, that was not the case here. Here, the suggestion is we use our regulatory power to cause a counterparty to give up property in the form of a concession. So it's not using the regulatory power for the purpose intended by law. It's using the regulatory power as a promise or a threat to extract money from someone. And that raises all kinds of considerations that are not consistent with the rule of law. And, and if, so you just did, you, another point. You, you apparently didn't think you had to change the regulatory power in order to deal with Bank of America. Somehow you'd have to go back, change the law in order to deal with AIG. Well, Madam Chair, remember what happened when we asked the two French banks, Sokjen and Kalyan, if they would give a concession. Their first answer was no, and then they were supported in that negative answer by the French Banking Commission. So, so that happened with the two French banks. You also asked earlier about UBS. Now, UBS said we might consider as much as a 2% concession, but only if everyone does it, everyone else does that as well. And so there was, there was a fairly effective blocking action there by UBS. Now, on the point about um, participating in the benefits of all of the Federal Reserve's and the Treasury's action, in combating the financial crisis. With respect to UBS, Madam Chair, remember UBS had already been rescued by Switzerland in the financial crisis. So again, in UBS, we're dealing with UBS. We ask them if they would consider a concession. You know what their answer is, but, but it's a hard case to make that, that they owe the United States a favor when Switzerland had already come to their rescue. Thank you, Mr. Baxter. I'm going to move now, since I've had more than a lot of time because it took you all so long to get back. I'm going to move to the ranking member. I thank the chairwoman, and uh, I certainly uh, think that this was a good case for you're not necessarily wanting a floor vote today, uh, but any but other not day. Tomorrow, sir. But not tomorrow. But not tomorrow. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Baxter, I didn't know who you were after 30 years of loyal service until a few days ago. So uh, forgive me for maybe not playing total catch-up. Your, uh, your old boss, uh, Secretary, now Secretary Geithner, uh, spoke glowingly about uh, the staff and the hard work and the people involved. But we now believe and understand that uh, a staff report was done within the Fed that said, let AIG go bankrupt, and that that was never, ever brought before the board, that in fact Sec uh, Chairman Bernanke pulled it so it not be considered by the broader Board of Governors. Are you familiar with that study or report? I am, I am not. You are not. So he kept it from a person who was at the, I mean these emails show you were at the center of all of this. He kept from you his own staff's decision. Chairman Bernanke did not trust his own governors or even the, the New York Fed's inner circle with a recommendation that said let him go bankrupt. Does that surprise you? First, uh, first ranking member, um, I'm, I'm the general counsel of the New York Fed. The chairman. But all, the, all that the question was, it was in the New York Fed. It was well, a study on behalf of the New York Fed. And well, I don't know the study, and, and I'm sorry I don't. Okay. Well, uh, with any luck, and with the indulgence of the chair, we will get discovery on that. As of right now, all I have is a whistleblower and one senator who confirmed that it exists but has said on, on CNBC that he can't release it even though he thinks it's damning. Uh, <clears throat> additionally, you're familiar with the Schedule A of the documents. Okay, so this, this unredacted form shows 57773 and some alpha numeric after that, and then shows that Deutsche Bank would be the, the counterparty recipient, the, the breakdown. Basically, these are sort of who owns the bonds, to put it in terms of the American people to understand. Are you familiar with this document called Schedule A? Uh, it was delivered from the Fed. This is Schedule A to the shortfall agreement? Yes. Yes, I'm familiar with that. Are you familiar with the cover up that said that, that, that AIG? with the insistence of the Fed clearly perpetrated by getting this made confidential and not disclosed to the public until 2018, that work continuing until May of this year, or last year? 
Congressman, there was no cover-up. Um, I can explain the processing of the Schedule A well, to the Well, if you can just briefly agreement. tell me the first part, which is, are you familiar with the work that went on to seal this from being disclosed in public SEC filings at least until 2018? I am, I am familiar. Okay. And in a short way, do you think that is right or wrong? Uh, I, I think all of the conduct was perfectly appropriate. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that because, although I don't agree, ultimately I just wanted that answer and we'll see uh, in time on other people. Can you uh, put up slide 23, please? Can you please explain what happened following your receipt of an email from Mar Marshall Hubner? And did AIG ever make this filing with the SEC? Would you like me to explain Please, this? Please, as briefly as possible. This concerned um, a salary increase for the chief financial officer of AIG. And, and Mr. Eubner was concerned about that salary increase. I was also concerned about that salary increase. And as a result of our collective concern, I had conversations with AIG and the chief financial officer in question decided that he really did not want the salary okay. increase at this time. The salary increase was withdrawn. Okay, so be, by talking him out of it, it didn't have to show up in a public filing. So it, it, no harm, no foul in this case. It had nothing to do with the public filing. It had everything to do with we didn't think this was appropriate. Okay. The salary increase. Uh, last question for you, and I want to quickly go to the SIGTARP. Do you know of a compelling legal authority that would have prevented AIG from going bankrupt? In other words, did the Fed have the authority to let them go bankrupt? Because Secretary Geithner has implied that he didn't have any options and he didn't have the authority to do anything but what he did. That's a pretty much yes or no. Did you or anyone at the New York Fed, to your knowledge, in fact, do a study or come up with a legal opinion that said you can't do anything else except let them go bankrupt or do this and you can't let them go bankrupt? First, we were not the supervisor of AIG on September 16th of 2008, so, so we had no supervisory no, no, but, but, responsibility. But my question is, Se since second, Secretary Geithner was there and said there was no other choice, your boss made the call. Do you know of a legal opinion that he was given or that exists today as to that? Well, I was his chief legal officer. And, and I would say then what I say now, and that is we need a resolution statute in this country to deal with institutions as systemically significant as AIG. We didn't have that tool in September of 2008, and we still don't have that tool, Congressman. Okay. We really need it. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to ask just for two more minutes quickly to sort of counter the very long time, but I'll be very I brief. Yield. I thank the Chairman. You're the gentleman two minutes. Uh, Mr. Borowski, your report directly contradicts so much of what we're hearing from people that were there or are there as to whether we'll get paid back. Let me just break it down to just two questions and then take the rest of the two minutes for your answer. One, is it true that we're just not going to get paid back by anyone's reasonable estimation certain funds? And two, had, had we used other means to underwrite AIG, such as we'll buy assets at a discount or we won't buy them, we will guarantee or, give or, or buy at a discount, you decide whether you want our AAA rating versus actually getting the transfer at a time when these banks wanted to transfer. If any of these other techniques that you are now aware of that, that logically could have been used, would we be in as bad a situation of not getting paid back as we are? And then please uh, elaborate on what we're seeing of what we're not going to get paid back that flies. And that doesn't even include, by the way, the idea that the money's come back and it's being respent in other ways. But just as to the, the, your knitting, can you give us as much knowledge, as much time as, as we, you have to answer that? Sure. Uh, Ranking Member Rice, first of all, I just want to take the chance, uh, as I said in my initial testimony, to thank you and the chairman. Uh, for your support of our organization and for the leadership and the tenacity that, that the two of you and this committee has shown in bringing transparency to the AIG bailout. Um, the Treasury's own calculations is when they did their financial statement at the year end, September 30th, 2009, projected a more than $30 billion loss on its AIG investment. 
Um, when you're looking at these counterparty payments, um, you can't look at just one part of them. They, they were basically in two chunks, if you will. There's the Federal Reserve loan to Maiden Lane 3, which purchased the securities. So it was about $29 billion. And the rest were counterparty payments, the, the balance of about $33 billion that AIG had previously made. So a total of about $62 billion. Now, with the chunk that the Federal Reserve lent to Maiden Lane 3, that portion, which we've been hearing about how that is on track uh, to be paid back, and the taxpayer may actually, and the, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York may actually make a profit on that, I see no reason to think that that's not true. That, that, that may very well be accurate. That one piece of it. However, the other piece, and these really are two sides of the same coin, and we've been critical of trying to separate that out and only looking at the Federal Reserve piece and saying, oh, because that's going to get paid back, it's a profit. That other part is part of the projected $30 billion loss. So one of the reasons why we're so critical is that if you just say, oh, on these transactions where the federal government, the taxpayer, is on track to be made whole, for someone who's not as familiar with the intricacies of these transactions as, as we all are, you would get the misimpression that the counterparty payments, the decision to pay 100 cents on the dollar, is going to leave the taxpayer whole. And by Treasury's own calculations, you can't separate that $30 billion of, of, of anticipated loss um, from these transactions because the money that AIG paid came from a loan from the Federal Reserve, a separate loan, that was then paid down with taxpayer money through the TARP. So yeah. I think it's, I'm sorry, so I think it's, it's very difficult and it's, I think it's inappropriate to separate those two out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and now you'll uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses <coughs> for your willingness to help the committee with its work. Uh, Mr. Borofsky, uh, we've been going back and forth with uh, Secretary Geithner and, and Secretary Paulson earlier today about uh, the decision to pay uh, the derivatives, the well, credit default swaps that were uh, entered into between AIG and, and Goldman Sachs and, and, and a, a handful of other companies. The position of the Secret Secretary Geithner is that uh, he didn't have any other tools other than paying 100 percent of the value, 100 cents on a dollar, or allowing AIG to go into default and bankruptcy. And uh, at least the testimony of Mr. Paulson is that he was not there. And uh, I find that mystifying. But were there, in your own impression and, and reviewing the record here, was there any opportunity for uh, Secretary Geithner, uh, the Treasury, the Fed, to negotiate a lower, negotiate a haircut with Goldman Sachs instead of paying them uh, at par value? Uh, and, and thereby saving the American taxpayer possibly billions of dollars. Uh, yes, and I think that as the Federal Reserve and, and the Secretary acknowledged, the whole plan, the, the hope from the Federal Reserve was to attempt a negotiated haircut. So a, if there was an agreement among the parties to pay, to accept less than par, that obviously wouldn't have violated any of the policy concerns that have been described. Um, and I think very much these negotiations could have been conducted in a different way a more forceful way. The comparison that, that you cited to Secretary Geithner earlier, um, and which is discussed in our testimony, is, is looking back to the capital purchase program uh, when the nine banks were, were summoned to Washington, D.C. Um, and as mentioned in my testimony, that is a pretty good example of what could have been done. Um, in there, of course, it was the principles that were involved in the negotiations for both sides whether it was Secretary then President Geithner, Secretary Paulson, Chairman Bernanke on behalf of the government, and the chief executive officers of the nine banks on the other side. That didn't happen with AIG. Um, the forcefulness of those negotiations, uh, being told that this was important for the American people. Now, I'm not suggesting threatening to pull their license or, or using regulatory authority to punish those that didn't participate, but right. emphasizing how as important it was to the policymakers of the United States government. That didn't happen. Uh, with respect to AIG. And indeed, again, these were conversations that were done largely over the telephone of mid-level executives. Those nine executives were summoned to D.C. For, for the TARP, and they were put around the table. And that communication, that this is really important, uh, and we could, you know, we, I could continue to speculate and, and give about nine or ten other things that could be said, all I think within the confines of 
the Fed's policy considerations. Now, we've, we've been somewhat critical of some of those policy considerations, and you know, we disagree with some of them as reflected in the audit. But I think that what's, what's bothersome is that even if you accept all of those concerns, they could have just tried a little harder. Uh, and maybe it would have been unsuccessful. Uh, we don't know. But as I, as, I, as I noted in my testimony, we recently spoke to the French regulator, and they said if the negotiations went something like that, they would at least be willing to engage. As, and we know that UBS would have been willing to engage. And we don't know what the reaction is of the other potential counterparties, because that telephone conversation from then President Geithner, or then Secretary Paulson, or Chairman uh, Bernanke, saying, hey, this is important. We want you to be involved. We know they were talking to these CEOs on a regular basis, but this wasn't elevated to that level. And we'll, we'll never know what the result might have been, but it may have resulted in saving the taxpayers billions, if not tens of billions of dollars. But we just don't know the answer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Baxter, uh, maybe you've been asked this question before, but uh, in terms of the decision to, to make the payment uh, at 100 cents on the dollar, uh, were, you, were you part of that discussion? I wasn't in the, the discussions with the counterparties, Congressman, but I was part of the, the supervisory team. How did you arrive at that? Could you tell me? Um, I can try. The, first of all, there was a critical deadline, Congressman, of November 10th, and that was the day that AIG was going to announce a $25 billion loss in its 10Q it's for the third quarter. So we were looking at that, and we were being told by the credit rating agencies that unless something happened with respect to the credit default swaps on or before November 10th, that there was a strong probability of a downgrade. Now, a downgrade would have been catastrophic. It would have brought us back to where we were in September on the brink of an AIG bankruptcy. So from those of us who were working on at the New York Fed, we looked at that as a hard deadline. And the execution risk of failing to get the credit default swaps torn up by that date was, was it would put us back on the brink of bankruptcy. So that was, that was the risk of deal failure. That was the execution risk. So we had to get the deal done. AIG had been unable, as Mr. Habayeb has testified, to get that, those credit default swaps torn up. On November 6th, Congressman, we got formal authorization from Stacia Kelly, who was then AIG's general counsel, to take over and see whether we could get those credit default swaps terminated by deadline. So we were operating against the clock to do that. Our choices were, should we push for concessions and try to use whatever leverage we had to get those concessions, or should we simply go to par, which would apply to every counterparty, and the way PAR works is you offset the collateral that these counterparties had been pulling out of AIG right. against, you offset that collateral yeah. against the PAR price of the bonds. So, so those, were the, those were the weighing of the risks as we faced them. And on the one hand, failure to get a deal on or before the 10th would have brought us back to the brink of an AIG bankruptcy. So the, the risk was in pushing for concession of perhaps 2%, we risked billions of further federal government assistance. Now, now, what happened? We asked eight counterparties about concessions. Seven said no. Two of those seven were French, and they were supported by the French government in their refusal. The, the one that said perhaps was UBS. It said perhaps up to 2%, but we need to be treated just like everybody else. So had we continued to use whatever leverage we had, and as I said earlier, we didn't have much. We risked losing the deal by November 10th, and that would have brought us right back to September to the brink of an AIG bankruptcy and to catastrophic systemic consequences that would have resulted. That balancing led us to see that the, the, the solution would be to go with no concessions, we brought that to President Geithner. He agreed, and that's what we did. Gentleman's time. We brought it home by deadline. We got it done by the 10th. Gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. 
Did, did I hear Mr. Baxter? Did you say that um, Mr. Geithner signed off on paying at par? He was part of that decision? He did. Um, I didn't have that impression earlier, but maybe I misunderstood something. Um, that uh, I'm not sure who to ask this particular question to first, but let me ask Mr. Uh, Borofsky. Um, in the, uh, one of the, the questions here is, my understanding was to avoid the, uh, and, and part of the question for the secrecy was to avoid the risk of the rating agencies downgrading uh, the securities and bonds. Um, do, is that true? Is that your impression? The Federal Reserve has cited as one of the reasons for justifications for paying the counterparties at par was one of the concerns about the effect of the rating agencies and, and the impact. Um, why, uh, why hadn't they already been downgraded? Well, they actually had, had been downgraded up, and, up until that point. But Do you believe they were keeping up? In other words, my, in many, the many hearings that you've been here and so on, it seems to me that to have a, a private economy work, one thing has to happen is the, because, you know, CalFed or whatever the big uh, insurance for state employees there is the biggest, I guess, investor, and he said he's only got a couple people to track. If those rating agencies aren't accurate, the no, whole and, and system collapses, and it's, it seemed to be questionable whether they were moving fast enough in the economy uh, to, to downgrade it. And in effect, here, a, a partner in the Fed was trying to help disguise it. I mean, ultimately, one of the, the observations in our audit is the outsized influence the credit rating agency had throughout this process. Um, as, as Mr. Baxter just stated, it was basically the rating agencies that were holding the gun to the head of the Federal Reserve, giving them the perception they had to move so quickly. It was the rating agencies that gave the fear to the Federal Reserve, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to, I'm paraphrasing Mr. Baxter, but, but that fear that, that AIG would be put into bankruptcy, uh, that that was a legitimate fear that the Federal Reserve had because of the result of the rating agencies. And of course, so much of the lead up to AIG's problems were the result of the rating agencies, first overvaluing uh, the, the, the CDOs and the bonds that underlie the, the credit default swaps, and then throughout the process. Indeed, it was the rating agencies um, who were ultimately looked at the original deal that the Fed brokered with AIG and the high interest rate and determined that too would lead to an eventual downgrade. So yes, they had an outside role, role in this for sure, okay. for certain. Mr. Baxter, my question to you would be, how can a free market economy work if uh, the Fed tries to manipulate the rating agencies by pumping money in and trying to conceal that? We never tried to manipulate the rating agencies, Congressman. We, we took their observations as they gave them to us, never tried to lever them in terms of what they were going to do with respect to AIG. Instead, what we tried to do was to restructure AIG to avoid a downgrade. Now, in the context of November 10th, and this is, a, this is an important point with respect to the credit default swaps, had that downgrade occurred, many of the counterparties would have had a right to terminate their credit default swaps, which would have enabled them to keep the cash collateral posted and the bonds. And, and that, that, is a, that is a critical piece here, because the way we restructured these credit default swaps, the Fed took the bonds into our vehicle made in lane three. And remember, the bonds had diminished in value from par to approximately half, and the, the counterparties had gotten collateral for that diminution in value. As those bonds, which we now have in our vehicle, as those bonds come back in value, as our nation emerges from the worst financial crisis in 70 years, we capture that value in a Federal Reserve vehicle. And, and, and so it is, it is the offset, if you will, in broad terms, conceptual terms, to the collateral that was posted. And, and so this is another important feature of the restructuring that the Fed did, which was far, far better than the alternative of allowing there to be a rating agency downgrade and, and, why and those did you catastrophic want that? Why did you want to conceal that? But never wanted to conceal that, Congressman. Um, it, it, it is, and we you, tried. Is it inaccurate to say that you asked for special conditions where the mar where markets wouldn't be able to see for fear they might speculate if they saw that you were taking uh, this well, position? Well, first, with respect to the Schedule A, to the shortfall agreement, which had the counterparty names, the QSIPs, the tranches, it was never the intention of AIG or the Fed 
for that schedule to be filed with a shortfall agreement. So there was a misunderstanding in the beginning, I think, as to why that wasn't attached. Now, the commission came back and said, we need, we need that exhibit attached. And then we made an application for confidential treatment because we thought that information would hurt the taxpayer interest in our vehicle. Now, the information I'm talking about are the counterparty names, the QCIP numbers identifying the bonds we hold, and the tranches. After the hearing that occurred before this committee in March, we and AIG changed our view on the counterparty names. So the only information today that is confidential with respect to the Schedule A is the QCIP numbers and the tranches, the identifying information for the cards, if you will, that the Fed holds in its hand in this vehicle. That's what we're keeping confidential now, and for the right reasons, because we're worried when we sell out that portfolio that if, they, if the street knows what we're holding, it'll hurt the taxpayer interest. That's the only reason. It's not a cover-up. Well, gentlemen's time. Gentlemen's time. Gentlemen's, gentlemen, gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, well, now you have five chance. minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Chairman, uh, Inspector General Barassi, thank you again for all the work you and your team have done over the last year, and uh, it's been simply invaluable. Uh, when I and 26 of uh, my colleagues wrote to request that you conduct an audit of the issues before us today. Our main concern was the decision-making process leading to paying AIG's counterparties at 100 percent par value. However, after Bloomberg and the New York Times published emails surrounding the disclosure, questions began to emerge about how the events surrounding the Maiden Lane uh, three transactions were disclosed to the SEC. One of the first things I did was send you a letter asking whether your staff already knew about the emails that were released to the press and did these emails affect the conclusions that you reached in your audit? I was also interested in whether you planned to open the audit. You responded quickly, uh, as you recall, saying that it was not your policy to comment on open investigation. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And I want to clarify, I want to clarify, in, in, in your office, audit and investigations are different tasks conducted by different personnel in different divisions, is that right? That's correct, generally speaking. Okay, and what are the missions of those divisions? Sure, audit, as, as, as you know, um, under ESA, we are, have the responsibility to both audit and investigate all actions taken under the top, TARP. The best way, to, I think, to think of audit, it's almost an investigation without the presumption that there was a crime. Uh, or a violation. It is a, it is a review, a historical review of what occurred and, and looking to see what went wrong, what went right, and explaining, bringing basic transparency and making recommendations. Our investigations division is a law enforcement uh, agency. We are like the FBI for the, for, for the TARP. Um, these are, it's populated generally by special agents who have full law enforcement authority, guns, badges, and the authority to, to make arrests. We also have attorney advisors and support personnel. And when we move something into the investigations division, it's because we're taking a look to see if there was misconduct. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is some reason or there's an allegation or we suspect in certain cases whether there's a crime or even a civil violation, we do support civil investigations as well, we move it over into that section. Mm -hmm. So with respect to, to your letter and the request, we didn't receive um, many of the documents that this committee received and um, including those documents, as well as some other documents that pertain very directly to some of the um, issues directly addressed in the audit. And we does, does it surprise you that you didn't receive them when you would, I mean, now looking at back? Some of the documents, I'm extremely surprised that we didn't receive. Um, and that's why we're conducting a new investigation to determine what the circumstances were of why some specific documents that we requested uh, were not provided to us. So an open investigation is not the same as an open audit, is that right? That, that's correct, sir. And I assume you cannot say whether the open investigation is civil or criminal, is that correct? Well, an investigation at this stage in particular, we're just starting out. We're just taking a look and see where it goes. Uh, if it does result in, in our belief for a referral for, for civil or criminal prosecution, we would do that. We would then interact with the Department of Justice. We don't have prosecutorial authority. If we determine otherwise, um, 
especially with, protect, with, result, with um, respect to these investigations, we have the option of preparing an investigative report which will provide to you and this committee reporting on our findings. Can you tell us what the time frame is for this? So you just, you just have to take your time and face, you to, can't figure that one out, huh? We're going, I mean, for us to do this right, 250,000 pages of documents that this committee received, we also received. Um, that's going to take us some time because we really can't determine what we didn't receive until we go through literally every page of those documents. Uh, and given the significance and importance of this, of this matter, um, I usually uh, drive my agents pretty hard and ask them to move very, very quickly. Uh, in this instance, I told them, above all, to move quickly, but we need to be very thorough and very accurate. And that will be followed as all investigations by a series of interviews once we get our hands around the, the, the document. So I, I hesitate to, to, I to put a time. Bloomberg reported this morning that you are quote, probing whether the New York Fed improperly limited the release of information about payments to AIG's bank counterparties. Is this correct? Or can you comment on that? Yes. Uh, we also have opened a, a probe into some of the allegations that came here. And again, I, I really want to stress that when we open an investigation, we're not presuming misconduct or, or anything like that. It's been suggested that there was misconduct. Again, and so what we're doing, it's our job, our responsibility, our statutory responsibility when, when such issues are raised, we have to go look at it. And as I said, uh, if, if everything was done in a legally um, correct manner, we'll report that. I see my time Thank is you. up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and now you have five minutes to uh, Congressman Bacchus. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brobsky, I'm going to ask you this question. You know, Secretary Geithner says that they didn't disclose some things, but now they've come, they've fully disclosed everything and they're trying to inform the American people. However, uh, I think his testimony today uh, appears to mislead the American people. And let me ask you about that. On page 10 of his testimony, he's talking about the AIG uh, bailout. We paid the fair market value at the time for the assets. Uh, Essentially, what the Federal Reserve did was to purchase these securities from the counterparty with a par value of $62 billion for a purchase price of $27 billion. That's not true, is it? It is partially true. Partially um, true. What they don't say is they got $27 billion of taxpayer funding and they got to keep $35 billion worth of collateral. I mean, it is true, in addition to the $27 billion that came from Made in Lane 3, all that other AIG collateral that they previously been paid, which was made possible largely by uh, the other loan from the Federal Reserve, which was backfilled $40 billion by, by, by taxpayer money. And um, I think in, in the Secretary's full testimony, he does acknowledge that there is an AIG loss. What we cite in our testimony was a statement that was put out by Treasury. Uh, which was completely unbalanced and gave the impression that the taxpayers would be made whole because of that narrow issue of Maiden Lane. And, and well, we that's think that's actually, actually what this statement this morning to me says, that they, they, uh, they purchased securities with a par value of $62 billion for a purchase price of $27 billion. It is literally true in the Maiden Lane 3 facility that is what occurred. It is literally true. Yeah. He said, in the end, the prices paid for the securities were their fair market value. That's not true either, is it? Well, again, with respect to the Maiden Lane 3 part of it, it is literally true, but it, it, to look at these transactions as a whole, when you look, the counterparties did receive 100 cents on the dollar for those securities and for tearing up the credit for default right. swap contracts. So the total compensation, when you include the collateral they were able to keep, yeah. was, was effectively but, par value. Because the counterparties, they received $62 billion and all, they, $27 billion of it paid directly from the special purpose vehicle. Uh, Mr. Baxter, Mr. Uh, Mr. Friedman, you'd agree with that. They received $27 billion from the special purpose vehicle. Is that correct? I think it's very important, Congressman Bacchus, to understand that we paid for multi-sector CDOs with a par value of $62 billion. Right. Our vehicle paid $29 billion. $29, all right. Now, now, $27 went to the counterparties. Two went to AIG. Okay. Another important aspect of this is then we received those multi-sector CDOs into our vehicle. 
with respect to the cash collateral that AIG posted. But what I'm saying. This is important. This is important. But I'm Congress. saying to say that. The, we we that now can recapture that. But because as those multi-sector CDOs come back in value, as our nation emerges from you, the worst financial crisis in 70 years, well, I understand about the work. But what I'm then saying, then the value comes back. But but what I'm saying, it was 27 billion, and then it was it was 35 billion dollars worth of collateral that the counterparties were allowed uh, to keep which they were legally entitled to. Oh, I understand that, but what I'm saying, to say that this, you know, that for $27 billion you got $62 billion worth of assets is certainly not the tr whole truth, is it? The whole truth, Congressman, is you have... No, I'm asking you... you, have, you I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer your question. You have insurance policies in the form of a CDS. You have assets that are insured. We got the assets. You, what happened with AIG is they got to tear up the insurance policy right. that was threatening its survival. Right. Secretary, Guy, I'm not, I understand that, all that. I mean, I, I've heard that repeatedly. That's the whole truth. But he also says that the fair market value, that you paid the fair market value, but these, some of these uh, uh, CDOs, some of them were, they were rated CCC or lower, and the market prices at the time, a lot of them were 20 cents and below that. Is that not correct? Well, Congressman, I'm a lawyer. I won't, uh, I won't comment on the value of any particular asset because it's beyond my, my sure. competence. Uh, let in, me in, our view, in our view, in the view of our experts. Well, BlackRock, who the Fed hired, said that uh, they said there was no doubt that the, uh, they valued the paper at the average of less than 50 cents on the dollar. That That's in November less, of 2008. That would have been somewhat less than $31 billion. In November of 2008, at the, one of the worst points in our financial crisis, the loan we made from the Fed to Maiden Lane 3, the vehicle that's holding the assets, is a six-year loan, and we have a right of renewal. So we can hold these assets. Well, I, just, I understand all that, but I'm saying at the time, you paid par for something that was trading. BlackRock says they were trading 50 cents on the dollar. We paid fair value. All right. Gentlemen, That's time has expired. Yeah, we have to. Um, now you have five minutes to the gentlewoman from New York, Congresswoman Maloney. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for yielding, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member, for holding this uh, hearing. Uh, along with many of my colleagues, we pushed very hard to have full disclosure, and, and I would like to put in the record uh, letters that uh, I wrote to the Fed requesting uh, full disclosure, along with letters from many of my constituents. With, without objection, uh, so ordered. Okay. I, I'd like to get back to Mr. Bacchus's questioning, and uh, Mr. Bax, Baxter, where you, you bought the, the $62 billion for $29 billion. Uh, my question is, what's the value now? Um, the, uh, the value now? Uh, I, I can't say, Congressman. Um, our well, did the taxpayers win or lose? Right as of today, we have uh, we have a situation where our loan balance is four billion dollars less than the than the amount of the portfolio, which I'll, I'll estimate, and and I think I need to estimate. Our loan balance is around around seventeen and the portfolio is around 21, 22. Well, let, let's get back to the line of question. Uh, I know and we all know that we released uh, the names of the counterparties, but I understand uh, that you still want to withhold other information concerning these assets. And what is that information? And why do you want to continue to keep it a secret? Uh, we believe in Congress, uh, many of us, that the sunshine is the best disinfectant and, uh, and, and anti-corruption and fraud deterrent. So why must we, why do you feel this should be kept secret? What is it and why, should, why do you feel you, we want to keep it secret? The, the information that we are still concerned about at the Fed on the Schedule A to the shortfall agreement is information about the QCIP numbers and tranches of the multi-sector CDOs that the Fed now has in Maiden Lane 3, its vehicle. Our experts, BlackRock, tell us that if, if we publish that information, 
when the day comes, and it may be four years, it may be six years, it may be longer, when the Fed wants to sell those assets, that we will be hurt. We will be hurt because traders in the market will know what we're holding. Like in a card game, if one player shows his hand to everyone else, that one player is prejudiced. So, so that's the worry. The worry is it will injure the taxpayer interest if we show our hand, if we show our QCIP numbers in our tranches. So, so, so that's the key. And we well, applied well, Mr. for- Mr. Baxter, uh, reclaiming my time, isn't it uh, standard policy for investors to disclose holdings like these in securities filings? Well, these particular multi-sector CDOs, it is not customary, I am told, for investors to put this information out. And if you do, again, I'm relying on what, uh, what experts at BlackRock have told us, if you do, you can be gamed by hedge funds and sophisticated players when the time comes when you want to sell. So, so you're saying that the public, uh, the taxpayer would be at greater risk in uh, it, the ability to reclaim these funds if this information was disclosed. Is that true? That, that is true, Congresswoman. I would also wonder why the average American would need to know the precise QCIP numbers and tranches of the Maiden Lane portfolio. It, it's the kind of information that, at least in my household, my family wouldn't, wouldn't know how to, uh, how to interpret. But, but sophisticated players, hedge funds, traders on the street, they could game us if that information was out there. Going forward, uh, uh, the Financial Services Committee has uh, passed a, a regulatory reform bill that includes in it a resolution authority, which would be a uh, wind-down authority so hopefully we would not be in this type of crisis again. And I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Friedman uh, from, you, you say you were privy to this information, but your experience in, in uh, finance, um, do you think things would have been different if uh, there was a more formal process for AIG, such as this resolution authority? And uh, could you tell us the difference between a government or taxpayers bailing out AIG and Lehman, which is a question many of my constituents uh, uh, are perplexed over. What was the difference between the two in, in, in response? Yes, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, as, as I mentioned when um, you and many of your colleagues were voting, the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is ring-fenced away from these um, supervisory, regulatory, or um, or, and, and certainly these uh, extraordinary issues. So I have no direct knowledge from that standpoint of this. Uh, as far as, so what I'm giving you is my opinion just as a person who's been around markets for many years. Uh, I, I, do, I do believe that um, for our financial system to work effectively, we have to get away from too big to fail uh, too intertwined to fail. I, I think these are, um, are, are, are dangerous things. Uh, and I, I earnestly hope that as Congress works its way through restructuring our financial regulatory system, they will have some form of resolution authority to give the, um, the people who are on the firing line the next time a crunch comes, uh, and one will come at some point in the future, the ability to uh, affect some sort of a conservatorship or resolution to wind down these entities. Uh, I think that um, people who are making money in markets um, should be at risk of losing money. Uh, but if there is not the ability to do this without jeopardizing the entire financial system of the country, uh, <coughs> and very much including Main Street, I think people get their, their, their uh, hands tied behind their back. So I, I, I earnestly hope we will have some kind of a resolution authority. Uh, as far as the difference between Lehman Brothers and AIG, I have no direct inside knowledge of this. I, I, can, I can say that um, AIG was a, um, to an outside observer, um, was a much bigger, more complex, and even more dangerous to the economy type of a situation. And there may well have been, a, a, and, and this uh, uh, Mr. Baxter would be much better able to answer than I, there may have been a, very much a difference in terms of the, the Fed's ability to enter into it. 
uh, based on the quality of the collateral they could get. But that I, I can't speak to personally myself. General, gentlewoman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, thank you. Uh, you'll now uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Illinois, Congressman Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank each of you for being here. Uh, Mr. Friedman, let me ask you, what was the role of the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in the decision to compensate AIG counterparties at par? Yeah, sir, my, my um, um, strong understanding and recollection of our role is that we were, in effect, a advisory board on most issues with administrative responsibilities for things like um, controls, audit committee, et cetera. And so we were walled away, ring-fenced away from regulatory issues, supervisory issues, or the extraordinary types of um, emergency interventions that took place during 2008. Um, if you um, think of the makeup of the board, um, during my tenure, something like um, six of the nine members were either had some affiliation with banks or with financial institutions. So there would have been myriad conflicts if we had had been involved. Uh, the, uh, in my experience, the staff of the bank was very meticulous in um, keeping us involved in these transactions. So I can say that um, um, I played no role in any of these decisions or in ratifying them. Uh, I've been advised very recently that um, on the night that the um, AIG transaction was finalized, uh, I and the um, chairman of our audit committee received a courtesy summary briefing from the um, from Fed officials telling us what had happened and that this would be announced the next morning. So I hope that's responsive. Well, let me ask, during the time period in October and November of 2008, when the Federal Reserve Board of, of, of New York staff were deciding how to address the problems, how to deal with them. Uh, did you get any briefings from the staff on the actions that they were taking and the policy options that they were considering? I, I, I recollect no, have no recollection of ever being asked for my views or proffering my views. I have a recollection of um, after the September um, intervention with the AAG was being uh, was carried out that evening being getting a courtesy summary posting from Mr. Geithner telling us what they had done, which would be in the newspapers the next day. And all of this was consistent with the design, as I understand it, of, of, of the statute that, uh, that a prior Congress passed for how the Federal Reserve Banks should, uh, should operate. Miss, you are on the Gold, Goldman Sachs Board of Directors. Yes, sir. And you were on the Goldman Sachs Board of Directors in late 2008. Is that? Yes, sir. As the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board of New York, Bank Board of New York, Board of Directors, do you think your access to information and the decision-making process at the Fed gave Goldman Sachs an advantage in weathering the storm when there were so many other yeah. firms um, floundering and, and yeah. folded? Uh, sir, absolutely none, uh, because the staff of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, in my experience, was very careful and meticulous to keep us away from any information that would um, be of that the type of nature you, you talked about. We had, we had the potential for conflicts was, was, was ripe there. You know, the purpose of that board, the primary purpose as I saw it, was it, it gave the president of the bank a group of, of knowledgeable market people that he could get information from 
as to what was happening in their areas, their, com their business areas, and their communities. And I would, I would speculate that if you had a Federal Reserve Bank in, in an area in the southwest, you'd want oil expertise. In an agricultural area, you'd want people with farm expertise. We had, uh, uh, we had a lot of financial market expertise, but the discussions were at the, uh, the, the level of what are you seeing in the markets, what are you seeing in the economy. Uh, they wouldn't ever tell you what was happening at another bank, which was probably a competitor of one you were affiliated with. And uh, I, I just think it was handled in a very um, professional and meticulous fashion. So the firewalls were, were yep. there that would prevent any conflict of interest? In my experience, they were very carefully uh, supervised, sir. And, and I, I, I never had a sense that anyone had any desire to transgress. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, I now yield myself five minutes, but I will yield a minute to the gentleman from Massachusetts before I raise my questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Friedman, just following up on, on uh, Mr. Davis's uh, question, I'm concerned about the overall influence of uh, Goldman Sachs in Treasury and, and at the Fed. And I think your own situation is somewhat instructive. As I understand, you, you were previously on the Goldman Sachs Board of Directors. I was, during the period you've been discussing, I was, and I'm still on this. Right, okay. And then you, you, you went, became a member of the New York Fed Board of Governors? Yes, sir. Okay. And while you were there, uh, apparently you, you owned uh, a significant amount of shares in, in uh, Goldman Sachs, but that was okay at the time because they were not a bank holding company, right? Yes, sir. And then, and then when they became a bank holding company, uh, you had a decision to make, and that was to either divest, right, or well, or get a waiver. Yeah. And I, and you applied for the waiver. Well, the 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 Fed uh, the Fed staff applied for the waiver. I did not apply for the waiver. Okay. And then while the waiver was pending, you bought thirty-seven thousand more shares. Of, of Goldman Sachs. Yeah. What Just, was the thinking behind that? Let, let me tell you what the, um, when, um, when I went on the Fed board, uh, uh, the Fed Reserve Board, I was a director of Goldman Sachs. I had Goldman Sachs shares, and I would be regularly receiving Goldman Sachs shares as part of your directorship grants. I get that part, but, okay. but if, if you're not in compliance and you're asking for a waiver, what, what, what about the decision to buy 37,000 more shares of Goldman Sachs? Okay. At, at the time Goldman Sachs became a um, bank holding company, I was then became technically ineligible to be a Class C director. So there were a number of options. I, I, was, I, was, not, I was not going to at that point, it would not have been feasible for me to resign from the Goldman Sachs board uh, and sell all my shares. I had done that several years before when I went to the um, uh, to take an administrative post in a, in a prior administration. So that left two options. One was for the um, Fed to basically say, your status has changed, you need to resign, in which case I would have um, promptly um, um, saluted smartly and resigned that afternoon. Excuse me, sir, I'm sorry, but your answer is for the last three minutes has been unresponsive. So. You, you knew you were not in compliance. You had to apply for a waiver to stay, to stay yeah, in, that, okay. in that position, yet you bought 37,000 yeah. more shares. Can you, can you please, and I don't mean to badger you, but could you ask, answer that part of the question? I will. Uh, my understanding of the practices and precedents of the Federal Reserve was that during the pendency of a waiver, uh, you continued on in your um, role as a director, and the rules were in abeyance. And that was actually the practice of what happened. I, yeah. I continued uh, chairing the board. Uh, ultimately, during this period, when Mr. Geithner was tapped to go to Washington. I, I still don't understand. And I, I, I during this period, uh, I made a decision in December to buy some Goldman Sachs shares. This did not change the. Um, eligibility at all because you, you just own more 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 gold here's the problem you as as a member of the board of governors you're making decisions on 
on matters that directly affect Goldman Sachs. And, and, and your former shareholder, current shareholder, and then you buy 37,000 more shares yeah. of, of, of that company that you're, you're overseeing. Yeah. Th that, th therein lies the problem. Let me ask you, I, I notice in dealing with Treasury and the Fed that there are a lot of Goldman Sachs employees all over the place here. Right. Is, th is there any type of program where uh, Goldman encourages their employees yeah. to, to sort of salt the, uh, the, the, the regulators offices that they, they are regulated by? Certainly none whatsoever in the sense of, gee, this is some kind of a firm strategy. That I yeah. can tell you. What there has been over the years is a certain tradition that you, you, you work here, you try to do well for yourself and your family, and then you give back and you do public service. For many years, this was regarded as a, um, uh, as a very constructive and positive thing. I can see Recently, that. Yeah. It's gone the other way, and people are, are thinking, is there some ulterior motive? Well, well when push comes my to shove. Time. Uh, reclaiming it, my time. Uh, yeah, you, oh, know, okay. it was, you know, initially it was <laughs> a minute. You, you've you been know? very generous, Mr. Chairman. Thank I'd you. ask I unanimous consent that the chairman have an additional minute added. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, let me just say that um, we're going we're gonna to close out. Um, but just before we close, Mr. Friedman, let me just ask you, um, you still sit on the board of, uh, uh, of Goldman Sachs, right? Yes, sir. Uh, and the CEO of Goldman Sachs has uh, said that he didn't need the billions he received in, in counterparty payment from AIG. He said it, he, didn't, he didn't really need it. If that's the case, why doesn't Goldman, Goldman Sachs give back the money? Mr. Friedman, my advice to Goldman Sachs is, just come clean and say you need the money and you appreciate the fact that the American taxpayers were so generous. Why not? Yeah. You were talking, sir, about a, um, about a, uh, a financial transaction where the Goldman Sachs people were in a commercial transaction with AIG. That's correct. And they had, um, they had entered into it at a time when AIG was a AAA company, and they were doing it, acting as intermediaries for Goldman Sachs clients. Uh, they had um, worked very carefully in their risk management to protect themselves against um, a deterioration in the value of these um, CDOs or in a deterioration of the value of AIG, and they felt that they were that they were um, fully hedged and had protected their shareholders' interests. Uh, I I I do not think that there was there is any feeling there that they did anything other than what a market participant would do in the normal course. You're saying they did not need it. Is well, that what you're saying? What what I what I would say was what I would say was this. Um, Goldman Sachs has consistently said they, they, there was something like $20 billion, round numbers for illustrative purposes, of instruments that they sought insurance on. There was a deterioration in the value of that, let's say illustratively roughly half. They felt that AIG, from whom they had purchased this credit insurance, owed them $10 billion. They had $7.5 billion of collateral. That left a shortfall of two and a half. They had um, purchased insurance on AIG's survival from other major institutions and had collateral and netting arrangements with these other institutions. So what they've consistently said is that their exposure, their direct exposure, and they've used that word direct exposure to AIG was not material. Now, I, I, I am, I'm not going to say that, and, and this may be the point that the SIGTARP made, but I'm not going to say that in the event of a financial Armageddon, all bets weren't off, but they are the stewards for the money of their shareholders. Right. And that's, that's, the, that's the... Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, just a couple of quick UCs. Uh, I'd ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to submit both their opening statements and any follow-up questions on any, to any of our witnesses. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that the letters earlier uh, submitted uh, 
that if the uh, chair would re uh, eliminate his reserve at this time, uh, these are letters that you were copied to a long time ago. Right. Hopefully. Definitely. Um, still reserving the right to object, but uh, because uh, some of them I'm not sure I've seen, so I want to make certain that we see them. I, I really don't really see a problem, but just in case there is a problem, I want to reserve the right. Okay. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll withdraw my UC on that and uh, simply submit them as new questions for the record. Perhaps okay. that'd be easier. Without objection. Uh, and then last, the, uh, the UC on, or second last, the UC on the Schedule A. Are you prepared to withdraw your reservation on that at this time? I'm prepared to withdraw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And last, uh, earlier you had said that you would uh, compel witnesses to answer. It is a custom of the committee that it be seven days. Could I have unanimous consent that seven days after their receipt, uh, they be expected to respond to our questions? Without objection. I'm thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for holding this incredibly successful hearing. I think this is probably our finest bipartisan hour. I think the witnesses, whether they like the questions or not, would certainly agree it was bipartisan. I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, thank uh, all of our witnesses uh, for being here today. And of course, uh, we really appreciate the fact that you're taking the time to come. And, uh, and without objections, I enter this binder into the committee record. But before we adjourn, let me state that if the AIG bailout and the government's involvement in it teaches us anything, it shows that deals with the taxpayers' dollars that are made in secret results in distrust and deep, deep, deep disappointment. When taxpayers' dollars are involved, transparency must be first and the last focus of the government. Again, let me thank you very, very much for your Mr. testimony. Mr. Chairman. Yield to the gentleman from- Could uh, I, with your leave, just- mention one email in particular that I think highlights what you just said. In, in, let me just say to you, um, put it in writing. All right. He will answer it, and we will move forward. Thank you right. very much.